On the Run, Book Two of the America Falls series. Written by Scott Medbury. Narrated by Adam Barr. Part One Get Out. One. Sonny pulled the truck to a jerking halt in the middle of the road and slumped over the wheel. Oh, shit, Luke said, a hand on Sonny's shoulder. Isaac, can you drive? I haven't really driven. I don't know if I could drive this, I said, hiding my surprise that Luke, usually so self-confident, was perhaps afraid of driving. I only learned to drive my foster parents' car after the flu. You'll have to. Sonny said, weakly, It's Otto. He struggled to sit up straight and then put the shifter into park before leaning drunkenly over Luke. Isaac, go, said my friend, a hint of panic in his voice. He shuffled across the seat toward me and eased Sonny out of the driver's seat. As soon as he was away from the door, I saw the bullet hole in it. It had obviously been fired as we fled and from the dark stain on his jacket, had hit Sonny in the side. As much as I didn't want to drive the truck, I wasn't going to argue while the guy who had rescued us from the Chinese army was sitting there with a gunshot wound. I opened my door and jumped out, slamming it behind me before running around the front of the truck and ripping open the driver's side door. The seat where Sonny had been sitting was splattered with blood. I climbed in and closed the door. Sonny was next to me, resting against Luke. Hold pressure on it here, Sonny told Luke in a matter-of-fact way. I've lost enough blood to feel lightheaded, but I think if we can stem the bleeding, I'll be okay. It seems to have passed all the way through, but I don't think it's hit anything vital. He closed his eyes. Drive, Luke roared at me. I put the truck into drive and started down the street. Thank God it was an automatic. I was afraid to drive too fast because of the ice, but I found that the truck wasn't really any more difficult to drive than Eleanor's Honda. I thought about continuing the evasive route that Sonny had been following, but I was worried it would take too much time. I certainly didn't want him to bleed to death while I was meandering around Worcester. With that in mind, I decided to head straight back to the academy as soon as I came to a cross street I recognized. It took us a good twenty minutes before we finally pulled the truck into the alley near the side door. Ben and Brooke were standing by the door waiting for us when we arrived, along with Karen. My heart sank as I remembered Arthur. Although he was pretty out of it, Sonny came to when we pulled him as gently as possible from the truck. We were surrounded by the rest of our group as we laid him on a pile of folded-up practice mats just inside the door. Looking around at the concerned faces, I saw Karen trying to catch my eye. I wouldn't meet her intense gaze, though. Instead, I looked quickly down at Sonny before she could ask the inevitable question. Thankfully, none of the others seemed to notice Arthur's absence. Yet. In a pained voice, Sonny ordered John to go and get the bottle of vodka he kept in the bottom drawer of his desk and the superglue in the drawer above it. I had no idea what he planned to do, and in truth... I am somewhat ashamed to admit I was spending as much time finding ways to avoid looking at Karen as I did worrying about Sonny. I took it for granted, I think, that Sonny would be okay. Help me hold him down, Luke said, giving me a tap on the shoulder. Everyone else, just stand back a little, please. When we clean the wound, it's going to hurt like hell. All right, I'll get his shoulders, I replied, less distracted now as I shuffled around. Help me sit up, Sonny grunted. Give me some of that to drink before you pour it on the wound. It'll help dull the pain, you know? Sure. I helped Sonny lift his head and shoulders and allowed him to prop himself up against me. He grimaced in pain. You'll be okay, I said to him as he took the bottle from Luke. After we patch up the holes, you can get some rest. You'll be as good as new in no time. Sonny's body tensed and shuddered as he swallowed a couple of good-sized gulps of the vodka. Of course, I had no idea if he would be okay, and wondered if my words sounded as hollow to him as they did to me. Let's get this over with, he said through gritted teeth and handed the bottle back to Luke. 
Pour it on. Sonny's cry echoed throughout the academy. Luke applied superglue to the sterilized and surprisingly neat wounds, entry and exit, and sealed them closed. I had no idea superglue could be used that way, but as he worked, Luke told us superglue was originally created for just these sorts of situations. Strangely enough, he also said tampons had been created during World War I, originally designed as wound bandages because of their ability to soak up copious amounts of blood. They hadn't become a feminine hygiene product until later, after the war, when there was a huge surplus. His educational banter seemed to calm everyone, and once again, I was grateful I hadn't set out alone all those days ago. You'll probably have hellacious scars, he said to Sonny, as he blew on the exit wound to dry the glue quicker. But there shouldn't be much else in the way of complications, unless the bullet hits something important on its way through. Do you want us to move you someplace more comfortable? I asked Sonny. I think I'm good here for now, he slurred, waving his hand weakly in my direction. Have somebody bring me a blanket and make sure the supplies get loaded on the truck ASAP. He winced as he pushed himself into a more comfortable position on top of the mats. Luke, give me what's left of that bottle. It'll help me go to sleep faster. I didn't know if that was a good idea, given our situation, but I held my tongue. Worst case, between us we could load an unconscious Sonny into the truck without too much of a struggle. Here you go, man, Luke said, handing him the quarter-full bottle of vodka. Knock yourself out. I looked at Luke, wondering if he'd been trying to make a joke, but he looked serious enough. Now that Sonny was out of action, I took charge again. Time was all important. We only had a small window in which to make our escape. Okay, Ben, why don't you, Brooke, and Allie start loading up some food while John and Samara gather blankets and bedding? Luke, you and Mark set up a mat for Sonny in the back of the truck. Shouldn't we wait till he's recovered? Mark asked. Isn't the plan for him to drive? So in case their soldiers see us, we'll have a Chinese man driving? Well, he's in no shape to drive, as you saw, and we can't afford to wait. Looks like I'm going to be the one driving. We just have to hope the Chinese army doesn't get a good look at me and I don't crash on the first corner. No one laughed at my attempted humor. I looked around at every single one of them my eyes lingering on Karen for a moment before I moved on. If what Sonny's contact told him is correct, we need to get out of here by tomorrow. And with the tiger stirred up, time is even more vital, whether Sonny's in condition to drive or not. I paused for a moment longer and then told them about the conversation I overheard the night before. So, what do you want me to do? Indigo said. You gave everybody else jobs, but not me. I was hoping you would stay here and watch over Sonny, I said, turning to look at her. Make sure he stays warm and comfortable. All right, I guess I can handle that, she replied. Thanks, I said, before turning my gaze back to Karen. I felt a lump in my throat and sick to my stomach, but I knew what I had to do. Karen, can I talk to you for a sec up in Sonny's office? Privately. It's Arthur, isn't it? Just tell me what happened. He's dead, isn't he? She blurted. With the subject broached, the questions came fast and furious from her mouth, and the others in the room began to disperse, discomfort clear on their faces. Please, Karen, let's just talk in the office. Tears welled in her eyes, and her shoulders slumped in resignation. We didn't talk as we took the long walk from the alley door to Sonny's office at the other end of the building. How am I going to tell her? Was the question running through my head. I knew, of course. I was going to have to tell her the truth. How I was going to tell it to her. That was a different story altogether. What I was really asking myself was what form of the truth was I going to tell her? The question of exactly how much responsibility I should take for Arthur's death was also lurking in the shadowed corners of my mind. 
when we got to Sonny's office. I held the door for her and followed her in, closing it gently behind me. What happened? Her voice trembled slightly, and a solitary tear ran down her cheek. As used to losing people as we had become, the pain was never any less severe. There was a long silence as she wiped the tear away and looked at the floor, trying to contain her grief. Karen, I, I'm sorry. So, so sorry, I said softly. He had just saved my life, and he was fighting to the very end. But one of the tigers snuck up on us and shot him from a distance. It killed him instantly. What happened to the tiger who shot him? Her voice still trembled, but now I was having trouble distinguishing whether it was from grief or rage. Dead, I said. I killed him. How? I don't think. How? I shot him in the head. Good, she said simply, and walked out. Two. The word spread about Arthur's death, and considering the tears and shock, especially of those in Sonny's original group, everyone did an excellent job getting all the supplies stowed away. It took about two hours to get the truck loaded, and we left plenty of room for those that would be riding back there. When we had finished loading the truck, I called everybody in for a meeting in the main practice room. Sonny was sleeping, but seemed to be okay. So I asked Indigo to join us as well. I looked at each of them. John, Karen, Allie, Samara, Mark, Luke, Ben, Brooke, and Indigo. I thought of Arthur and wondered if we would lose any more of them on our trip north to the sanctuary promised by the coded message. I knew it was very likely. I wanted to talk to you all about leadership, I said. As long as Sonny is down, I think it would be a good idea for us to elect a new leader, someone who can make decisions for the entire group, especially if and when the shit hits the fan. Well, you seem to have put yourself in charge, what with calling this meeting and all and, and telling us what to do when we were loading the truck, Mark said. It was said in a matter-of-fact way, not meanly, but I felt my face flush anyway. When he finished speaking, a confusing babble of voices rose as everybody started talking all at once. Guys, guys, Luke said, raising his hands. One at a time. What's wrong with democracy? John asked. I think we should all get a vote before we do anything as a group. Normally I'd agree with you, I replied. But there may come a time, sooner or later, when we'll have to make a decision fast and there won't be time for a vote. That's why I want to take a vote now. So when the time comes, we can all agree on whose lead to follow. Why don't you be the leader, Isaac? Brooke asked. I mean, after all, you're going to be the one doing the driving. It would be logical for you to be the one to make any quick decisions while we're traveling. No, I won't just take the lead. I'll accept responsibility if I'm voted leader, but I'm not going to just claim the position, I said. In truth... The very thought of being leader scared me. I wasn't certain I was the right man for the job, and being responsible for the well-being of a group of ten was not something I was totally comfortable with. Why don't we just wait until Sonny wakes up? If he's too weak to lead us, maybe he has a preference for who should lead us in his place, Allie said. After all, before you guys showed up, Arthur was his second in command. Arthur's not here, Karen said her voice retaining an edge of the cold rage I had heard earlier. And for all we know, Sonny may never wake up either. And even if he does, we have no idea how out of it he's going to be. Isaac's right. I say we vote on a new leader now. Sonny's going to be okay, right? Samara asked with a slight quaver in her voice. I realized she had not yet contemplated the possibility that our makeshift medical job might not prove up to the task of saving him. Sure he will, Mark said, putting a comforting arm around her shoulders, casting a wicked glare in Karen's direction. 
We'll have to wait and see, I said. But I'm almost sure he will be fine. Right, Luke? Yeah, said Luke. I don't know how the bullet managed to go through him without hitting anything vital, but I'm pretty sure it did. There was no major bleeding, and if it had hit bone, I'm pretty sure he would have been in a lot more pain than he was. I'd say he has a decent shot of recovering. Right. So the main reason I don't want to wait for him is because I'm worried one of these situations might pop up before he wakes up or is thinking straight enough to decide for us. Let's vote then, Ben said. How are we going to do it? By secret ballot? Raise of hand? Eyes or nays? How about this, Luke said. I nominate Isaac. Anybody who wants him to be interim leader, raise your hand. Luke put his own hand up, followed quickly by Ben and Brooke. The rest looked around at each other for a moment before Karen's hand went up to join in. Indigo was watching me. I see you haven't voted for yourself, she said. Is that because of modesty or fear? A bit of both. I answered truthfully. But I guess if people are willing to follow me, I should be willing to lead. I raised my hand. I think you'll make an excellent leader, Indigo said, raising her hand as well. That was a majority, six out of ten. Fine, Isaac can be the temporary leader until Sonny is up and healthy again, John said, shaking his head and putting up his hand. I still think this is bogus, Allie muttered, but raised her hand anyway. Looks like it's official. You're the boss, boss, Luke said, giving me a broad smile. I caught myself wondering if he had nominated me so quick to make sure nobody would put him in the mix as well. Luke was universally well-liked by the people of the Academy, as well as by the twins and myself. Fair enough. Thanks, guys. Well, my first suggestion is that we try to get some rest, I said. Sonny was planning on leaving about noon tomorrow, but I think we should get started earlier than that. I'm going to go back and check on Sonny, Indigo said. Now that the leadership issue is settled, I think the meeting is pretty much over, right? Yep, I said. I'll go with you. I ignored Luke's knowing snigger as I ran to catch up with Indigo as she headed for the exit. I did want to check on Sonny, but I was also eager to spend more time with Indigo. I figured our wounded leader would sleep most of the night after his trauma and the vodka, so we would probably get the chance to talk a lot more. I was embarrassed later, when Luke told me the only person who thought I was doing a good job of hiding the crush I had on Indigo was me. If Indigo knew she did a good job of playing it cool, she was perfectly nice to me, which only made me like her more, and never gave any indication I was bothering her. I don't know if the feelings I had for her would grow into anything more than a crush, but at that time, I was kind of infatuated, and the very fact that she was giving me the time of day made me feel on top of the world, despite all that had happened in the last few hours. Sonny was still asleep, as I figured he would be, and we spent the next couple of hours in the hall making small talk while we watched over him. We learned more about each other's lives prior to the flu, and it wasn't long before she knew more about me than Luke, Brooke, and Ben combined did. Thankfully, she seemed okay with what she heard. I really don't know how I would have handled being rebuffed at that point. Eventually, we decided Sonny was just going to keep sleeping, Indigo said she wanted to go to her room to get some sleep, so I went off to get some as well. Hey, wake up, man. Somebody shook me, and I opened my eyes to see Luke looking down at me. Sonny's awake, and he wants to talk to you. What time is it? I asked, sitting up and glancing around. It was still dark outside. Just after six or so. Okay. I pulled myself out of the sleeping bag and quickly rolled it up so it would be easier to move to the truck when we left. Did Sonny say what he wants? Not to me, Luke replied with a shrug. Maybe he found out you're in charge now and wants to give you some advice. Or maybe he wants to tell me to put someone else in charge, I said. Too late for that, man. We already voted. I could abdicate, I said. You won't, he said. 
We both know having you as leader is for the best. Do we? What about you? You seem to know how to handle this stuff pretty well. I'm not as smart as you are, Luke said. I don't get the gut instinct you do, which has done us okay so far. Plus, in any given situation, I tend to latch onto the first option my mind hits and follow it without thinking it through all the way. In short, I'd be a pretty decisive leader. We're probably not the best. I'd probably get a rush of blood and lead us into a disaster. Wow, sounds like you've thought this through. Yep, he nodded. I'll go see what Sonny wants. I grunted while I stretched my muscles and then headed toward the hall where we had left Sonny the night before. I thought about stopping to check on Indigo on my way, but decided letting her sleep a bit longer would probably be appreciated, not to mention less stalker-like. I found Sonny sitting up and alert, although clearly weak, with Allie by his side. Isaac, good job last night, Sonny said as I walked up. I know it's not ideal, but you'll have to drive when we leave. I'm not up to it. Yeah, I figured as much. Are you feeling better? To be honest, it hurts like hell. But I may be up to driving the second half of the trip to New Hampshire. Listen, I have a plan to help prevent this, he pointed to his bandaged wound, from happening to you. I nodded and squatted next to him. What is it? The reams of printer paper I had them get from the office building across the street, he said. Take the interior panels of the doors off, stack the reams of paper inside, and then put the panels back on. I think I saw a TV show where they did that, but with phone books. Will it really work? If we only have to face small arms fire, it should work well enough, but if we get hit with anything like anti-armor weapons... He glanced at Allie, who was listening attentively. Well, let's just hope we don't have to face anything heavier. You won't be able to roll the windows down once you get the paper in there, but it's so cold I don't suppose that's a problem. Yeah, I don't think it'll be a problem for anyone, I said. I'll get right on it. By the way, I've been wondering about the toner cartridges as well. Why did you have them collect so many? Up in the attic, in the base of the samurai sword stand, you'll find 15 or 16 old blasting caps, the kind with fuses that can be lit with a match or lighter. By themselves, they can't do much damage. But I figured if we taped each one to a toner cartridge, we could make some fairly effective ink bombs. Detonate one of them on a pursuing vehicle's windshield, and the driver would be in trouble. Where did you get the blasting caps? Uh, never mind. It doesn't really matter. I'll have Luke grab some tape and the toners and begin making the bombs while I see to the truck doors. By the way, I know you planned on leaving around noon, but I'm thinking we might want to be out of here a bit earlier than that. Any time you're ready to go, Sonny said. Allie told me about the vote, and I approve. You're leader now for as long as necessary. Just until you get back up and on your feet. We'll see, he said, patting me on the shoulder. Maybe you'll turn out to have a natural talent for leadership. Surprisingly, a fog had blanketed the city while I was sleeping, and the alley and streets around it were cloaked in a thick, white mist, so heavy even the far end of the alley where it opened into the street was difficult to make out. This could be handy, I thought. The fog could help cover our escape. It took me about an hour, maybe a little longer, to finish armoring the doors of the truck. By then, Luke and John were nearly finished making the ink bombs, I began to think we might be out of there as early as 9 a.m. As I was heading back in the side door to grab my sleeping bag and the rest of my stuff, I heard a loud banging. It came from the front of the building, and with adrenaline racing through my system, I dumped the gear and ran into the hallway as Ben came hustling in from the reception area. Isaac, it's the Tigers, he said breathlessly. I peeked through the window, and there are four of them at the door, all armed. What should we do? I guess we should see what they want, I replied, a cold dread gripping my belly. Do me a favor and go get Luke and John. Tell them what's happening and to meet me by the front door. As Ben hurried off, 
I pulled out my revolver and made sure it was fully loaded before slipping it back into my belt. I then picked up the Chinese assault rifle standing against the wall and began walking to the academy's front door. I stayed out of view from the street by ducking down as I passed by windows. The building's front door was much like those of many schools I had been to, solid double doors with windows of obscured reinforced glass taking up the top half. The doors had push bars on the inside and handles for pulling on the outside, but were currently locked and chained. It was quiet now, and I couldn't make out anybody through the door's windows. I approached silently with the rifle's safety off and flattened myself against the wall to the right of the doors, straining to hear anything to tell me they were still there. I jumped as five loud raps shook the door on its hinges. I know you're in there, Sonny. You and your gang of little virus-proof kids. Come on out. We just want to talk. I've got some questions for you. I recognized Chen's voice immediately. It had the same arrogant, almost sing-song quality to it that I'd witnessed in the car park. My brother Jack got shot. You remember Jack, don't you, Sonny? My little brother. And then when I tracked down the murdering bastards who killed him, a couple more of my boys got wasted, and those murdering dogs got away in a truck. And guess what? That fucking truck is right in the alley next to your building. Sonny knows these guys better than I thought. Or they know him. Chen continued before I could ruminate on this realization any further. One of the guys we killed was wearing your colors, Sonny. I know you have the Lao Wai who killed Jack in there. Just hand him over and we can put all this behind us. I waited for him to finish, and then addressed the door calmly. Sonny isn't available right now, I said. I'll be happy to relay your message and concerns. What? You think this is some kind of fucking joke? You tell Sonny to get out here now. I don't care if he walked away from us four years ago. Once you're a red tiger, you're a tiger for life. So that was how Sonny knew so much about them. Again, I'll pass it along. More swearing, and then the voices quietened. I saw Luke and John come into the hallway and wave them back out of sight. Leaving my position by the door, I hugged the wall and stealthily made my way to them. We could have a problem here, guys, I said quietly. Go check the truck in the alley, very carefully, to see if they're watching it. If it's clear, get everybody loaded up as quickly as possible. Grab my stuff if you can. Are all the bombs done? We still got like three to do, Luke said. All right, make sure some of them are packed up in the cab. Luke, you'll be riding up front with me, I said. We can finish making the last few on the road. What are you going to do? John asked. Stay and watch the door, of course. I replied. Come right back if the truck's being watched. Otherwise, get everybody loaded ASAP, then send someone back to get me. Okay, we're on it, John said. I watched as he and Luke turned and hurried back down the hall. Turning back to the door, I knelt and brought the assault rifle up to my shoulder and waited. A couple of minutes passed before he rapped on the door again. Last chance, Sonny! This time I didn't answer. I heard their voices, but couldn't make out any of the actual words, although I got the impression that Chen was quickly running out of patience. Another loud bang and the door's safety glass shattered, spraying the floor in front of me with glass. The wire reinforcement bowed inwards and held for two more hard blows from an aluminum baseball bat before falling through on the fourth blow. The end of the bat was thrust through the window and ran around the edges to knock off any remaining shards of glass. An arm came through, reaching down for the push bar to open the door. I squeezed the trigger. My selector was set correctly this time, and my aim was better. The assault rifle fired three successive shots, all hitting the wall beside the door as a warning. The arm disappeared immediately, and a second later, a barrage of small arms fire began peppering the door. I ducked behind a wall as the bullets pinged off the walls of the hallway. They coming in? Luke called from around the corner at the end of the hall. Soon, I think. The hail of bullets petered out and then stopped completely. I peeked back around the corner at the door, which now looked like Swiss cheese. 
There was no movement. Is everybody loaded and ready? Luke put his head around the corner and nodded before holding out a toner cartridge with a blasting cap taped to it. The fuse was half a foot long. I say we light this bad boy and slide it down the hall before they break in, Luke said. I bet it'll give him a hell of a surprise. I saw another shadow at the window. They obviously assumed whoever was on the other side was dead or had run off. The arm came through the window again, scrabbling blindly for the bar that would open it. Do it, I mouthed and watched as he lit the fuse with the lighter and slid the toner cartridge down the hall toward the door. It whizzed by me and came to rest in the broken glass a few feet in front of the doors, the lit fuse sputtering like those on one of the bombs from a Looney Tunes cartoon. I left my position and ran down the hall past Luke. Come on, I yelled. He followed right on my heels. We were about halfway to the side door when we heard the ink bomb go off behind us with a loud bang. We had no way of knowing if it had hurt or even slowed down any of the tigers, but the sound of the explosion gave my heart a quick jolt of excitement. I felt a strange elation and suddenly understood the term adrenaline junkie. Three. The cloying fog still lay thickly about the alley as Luke and I hurried to the truck. Sonny confirmed that there had been no sign of the tigers. It surprised me. Obviously, they knew the truck was here. Chen had specifically mentioned it. Maybe he didn't expect Sonny to run. Whatever the reason, it didn't matter. It just made our life a little easier for a minute or two. Luke and I checked the back to make sure everybody was inside and ready. They had done a good job of packing. Boxes of gear had been stacked up and strapped against the side walls. It would offer little protection in the event of an all-out attack, but might protect against a stray bullet here and there. Someone had the good sense to hang ropes from the metal meshing that lined the roof of the cargo bay, and Sonny was directing everybody to wrap the ropes around their wrists and grip them to offer some stability against the movement of the truck. I gave him the thumbs up before we pulled down the door and secured it. Luke and I rushed to the cab where Indigo was already waiting for us. Being a local, she had volunteered to navigate us out of the city in place of the injured Sonny. She moved into the middle, and Luke and I climbed in on either side of her. She looked nervous, gripping the revolver I had given her tightly, as if she was ready to use it at any second. I haven't spotted anyone, she said, indicating the end of the alleyway in the distance. But that might be because of the fog. You better hurry. I started the truck with the intention of letting it warm up for a few minutes, but my hand was forced when a figure materialized out of the fog in the alley. He took one look and then ran out of sight, presumably to go and tell Chen of our impending escape. I gunned the engine and the truck lurched forward. I'm embarrassed to say I took out a few garbage bins along the way and at one point the wing mirror on the passenger side scraped along the brick wall as we picked up speed and barreled down the alley. I didn't know whether there would be tigers waiting for us at the end of the alley or not, but I knew I wouldn't be stopping if they were stupid enough to try and block our escape by standing in the way. I slowed only slightly as we approached the mouth of the alley. Turning right is the quickest way to get to a freeway, Indigo said, her voice tight with tension. I know, but that'll take us right past the front door, I replied. They'll shoot at us for sure, and from that range they won't miss. Left, then, and around the block, she suggested. I nodded and took my foot off the brake pedal. The truck was speeding up again when a figure appeared out of the fog to the right. It was Chen. His right hand and the sleeve of his jacket were covered in black ink. I didn't have time to gloat because that same ink-covered hand was holding a handgun, which he was calmly raising toward us. My eyes met his, and I saw him bare his teeth as he began firing at the truck. I flinched, trying to make myself as small a target as possible while Luke and Indigo ducked under the dashboard. He was either a bad shot, or he was trying to disable the truck rather than kill us. The passenger side window was shattered by one of the rounds, and others thudded into the front and doors of the truck. I gritted my teeth and drove the truck straight at him. He jumped out of the way just before I struck him and I swung left, taking the corner way too fast. Indigo and Luke yelled like they were on a roller coaster as the truck tilted dangerously and then righted itself before I accelerated down the street and away from the academy and the tigers. By the time I checked the rearview mirror, 
Chen was lost in the fog behind us. Everybody up here all right? I asked. Yeah, Luke said, brushing broken glass off his lap and onto the floor. Looks like the printer paper armor worked great. Indigo? Yes, I'm all right, she said, her voice solemn. Without a window, this is going to be a pretty cold ride. Turn the heat up. It might help some. Luke, help me keep a watch behind us. I'm going to drive around randomly for a while in case we are being chased. No problem, man, Luke said, his eyes glued to the passenger side mirror. He reached out and adjusted it so he could see out of it better, making it useless to me as a driving aid. We hurtled through the fog, although perhaps the term hurtled is a little ambitious. On a brumous day like that one, doing 30 miles an hour was pushing it. Brumous? Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite words. It's one I learned when I was reading dictionaries and thesauruses for fun, back when I was a kid. Nerdy, huh? Well, blame my mom. She was an English teacher. Anyway, it means of gray skies and winter days filled with heavy clouds or fog. Cold, sunless weather, in other words. Throw in the snow and ice, and the day we left the academy sure fits that definition. In fact, it could well be the most brumous of all the brumous days I've ever experienced. After making random rights and lefts for ten or twelve blocks, there was still no sign of pursuit, and I was becoming thoroughly lost. The truck CB had sputtered a few times, but it appeared the Chinese were not talking too much that morning either, probably waiting for the fog to burn off, I guessed. Finally, I stopped the truck at an intersection. I think that's enough weaving to throw them off the scent. Which way from here, Indigo? She took a few moments to take in our surroundings. Um, if you make a U-turn and go back to the last intersection, turn left there and it'll put you on Park Avenue. That should take us all the way north, out of the city, before it meets up with I-190. Sounds good, I said, putting the truck in drive and pulling forward and to the right. A U-turn was impossible, so I stopped again and put it in reverse, doing a three-point turn in the middle of the intersection. Let's get this party started. To be honest, I was glad Indigo was the one who sat in front to give directions. Just having her sitting near me up in the cab made me feel good inside. You know, warm and fuzzy, even though it was damn cold with Luke's window busted out. I was surprised to even be thinking about girls, considering how much danger we were in. We found Park Avenue easily enough, exactly where Indigo said it would be, and I turned in the direction she indicated. The further north we went, the thicker the fog became, to the point where I could barely make out the buildings along the street. I had to slow down considerably. I didn't want to collide with abandoned cars or any other obstacles. The visibility was so poor that I wouldn't be able to stop in time, even going as slow as 25 miles an hour. While we kept our eyes peeled for any movement or signs of pursuit, we chatted as the truck crawled northward on Park. My earlier assessment of Indigo was only reinforced by our conversation. She was easily the most amazing person I had ever met. I must admit to being a bit jealous that day, though, because it became apparent that Indigo understood a lot more of Luke's video game references than I did. It was also the first time I recall Luke talking about his sister, Rose. When his parents divorced four years ago, Rose was five, and the court split custody. Luke had stayed with his father, while Rose had gone with their mother to Chicago. Luke even mentioned going to Chicago to find Rose, talking about it like some sort of grand quest in his future. I personally had my doubts about the feasibility of such an undertaking, but could totally understand his urge to try. Talking about her made me think of my family again and I quickly buried the painful emotions that came with that memory. It was lucky I had decided to take the way out of the city at a crawl. Three separate times in the first six or eight blocks of travel along Park Avenue, we had to weave around vehicles in the road. If we had tried to leave at high speed in the thick fog, we would almost certainly have collided with one of them. I thought about the highway-turned-parking lot back at Fort Carter, and I wondered if we would encounter a similar mess when we finally found the freeway entrance from Worcester. I didn't think so. 
The Chinese appeared to be much more active in this state and would almost certainly have begun clearing the freeways for their own purposes. Just as we heard they had been clearing the bodies from Warwick using American children as slave labor. The silence and the emptiness of the drive through the city was surreal. I was finally beginning to feel a little bit better about the prospects of getting out of there safely when we heard the muffled roar of motorcycles echoing over the sound of the truck. Crap, said Luke. I think the tigers are on our tail again, Indigo said. A street gang who rides motorcycles, Luke said, his voice incredulous. Come on. If it is, we could be in trouble, I said, looking into my side mirror to see if I could make out any shapes in the thick fog behind us. I knew it was useless. They'd be almost on top of us before we saw them. I'm worried about the guys in the back if they come up behind us. While the supplies packed along the outer walls would provide some protection for gunfire hitting the sides of the truck, for obvious reasons there was nothing against the back door of the truck. All that stood between the passengers and potential bullets coming from behind was a rolling door that had not been designed to stop them. You could pull off at the next intersection and we could wait for them to pass, Luke said. There's no guarantee it's the Tigers anyway. How could they realistically be tracking us down in this fog? Maybe it's someone else. It's them, I said. He didn't argue. I don't want to be a sitting duck on the side of the road when they find us. The least we can do is give them a moving target. I think Luke is right, Indigo interjected. Not about it being someone else. It's the Tigers for sure. But I think we should take a side street and let them pass. We shouldn't wait too long, though. The fog will hide us for a while, but I think it would be a good idea if we were well out of the city by the time it burns off. I looked at both of them. You sure? They both nodded, and I slowed the truck and turned right at the next intersection. We drove a block before pulling the truck to the side of the street. Did anyone notice the name of the street we're on? Asked Indigo. I lost my bearings a little in the fog. We hadn't. Should I shut the truck off? I asked. I was worried the rumbling of the engine would carry in the fog, just as the roar of the motorcycles did. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and shut it down for a few minutes, Isaac? I'm going to jump out and find out what road we're on. Okay, but be careful. Luke hopped out of the truck and jogged into the fog. A couple of minutes later, he was back at the passenger side door, and we heard the motorcycles passing the intersection where we had turned. They had only been about a minute and a half behind us, and I was glad I'd gone with the majority and stopped. Luke climbed back into the cab. We're on Foster Street. Okay, good. I thought we were here, but the fog makes it look so different, Indigo said. If we go another block and then turn left, we should be on a street that leads back onto Park. I like the sound of that, Luke said. We don't have to sit here and wait. I'd rather get moving again right away. That's the sort of enthusiasm I like to hear, I said, switching the truck back on as the sound of our pursuers faded into the distance. Enthusiasm nothing, Indigo giggled. I think Luke realized the heater doesn't work when the truck's not running. Well, there is that too, Luke said with a grin. This road curls around, so in about another mile and a half, it will merge onto Park Avenue said Indigo. Okay, sounds good. And it did, until we factored in the fog and the slow driving speed. At least we didn't have to try and outrun motorcycles. This kind of reminds me of the setup for an old PC game, Luke said, his eyes peering intently ahead through the thick fog blanketing us. And by old, I mean real old. I found it in a box of my dad's old games and had to run this emulator thing to get it to work on our computer. It started out with a group of people getting lost in a thick fog like this and getting transported to a magical world. We should be so lucky, I said, as I steered around a minivan sitting directly in the middle of the street. I don't know, man, Luke replied. That magical world was full of dragons and vampires and other nasty shit. I don't know how long we'd last there. That's a tough choice, Indigo said. Dragons and vampires... Or tigers and enemy soldiers. They sound just as bad as each other, if you ask me. 
Yeah, I'd probably take a vampire over Chen. He kind of looks like he wants to rip my throat out anyway, I said. Hmm, said Luke. Maybe he's in the fog, waiting to jump on the truck and pull you out through the window. It was said lightly, but I felt the hair on the back of my neck rise. The empty, fog-shrouded streets were creepy, and my unease was compounded by Luke's very descriptive remark. I think he sensed my discomfort. Sorry, all this fog just reminded me of the game, that's all. No worries. Was it a good game? I asked. It was pretty good, considering it was ancient and the graphics were pretty crap. It seemed my pensive mood was contagious and all of us were silent as we crawled two more blocks. There was a question in my mind, but I wasn't going to raise it in our current situation. The question of why we hadn't seen any dead bodies in the streets, except for a handful in snow-covered cars. Probably because the virus, the Pyongyang flu, was pretty slow-acting on an individual basis. If Alan and Eleanor were any guide, the infected adults had gotten ill up to 24 hours or so before they died. If so, it figured most of them would have died indoors, tucked up in bed as their children tried to care for them. And the children? One had to assume that the younger ones were probably still locked inside with their dead parents, and the older ones, like us, were holed up waiting for help or wandering around trying to make their way in this new world. That or they were already slaves to the Chinese. A fresh wave of hatred for the Chinese government washed over me. Hatred for what they had done to the people of America, all so that they could have room for their ever-increasing population. It wasn't about race. China might have operated like a capitalist society over the last 20 years, but it was, without a doubt, a ruthless totalitarian regime. And as Huian had intimated, no one had a choice once the leaders had decided to attack America. I made a silent promise to make them pay whenever and wherever I could. I noticed a bright spot overhead. The sun was wrestling the weather for dominance of the day, and it appeared it would be just a matter of time before the thick, cloying mist began to dissipate. Will we make it out of Worcester before that, I wondered. There were some good things about it, I guess, Luke said, breaking the silence. It took me a moment to realize he was talking about the game again. If you could get past the antiquated graphics, some of the quests and dialogue options were pretty fun. Tell us about it. I thought Luke's prattling might be a good way to relieve some of the increasing tension in the cab of the truck. Indigo was sitting stiffly in her seat, her hand gripping the dash, obviously on edge. As best as I can recall, you created some people to be your adventurers, and when the game started, you were guardsmen of a kingdom sent to investigate a mysterious fog. Guardsmen in a kingdom? I thought you said the fog transported you to a magical land in the game, I said. I did, but you sort of started in one as well. The mist moved you to a different magical land, because when the fog lifts... You're in a desert city with Egyptian-style monuments, rather than the European-style medieval setting the game started out with. Ah, I see, I said. In truth, I wasn't really paying much attention. I was focused on driving through the fog, but the sound of his voice was comforting. Well, you start out by a hut, where this old gypsy woman gives you some clues about where to start your quest to defeat the evil ruler of the desert land, he said. As you go, you fight monsters and gain levels, making your characters more powerful until you finally throw down the ruler, who is the ancient undead mummy of the last pharaoh or something. Along the way, you have to answer a sphinx's riddle, rescue some people, and explore the catacombs beneath the temple. Sounds exciting, I replied. What was the name of the game? Damned if I remember. So it was more of an RPG-style game? Indigo asked. Most of the games you talk about are fighting games or shooters. I didn't know you liked role-playing games. I'm an equal opportunity gamer, Luke responded with a smile. About the only games I actively avoid are dancing games. Why? You'd be great at dance-off evolution, Indigo said with a smile of her own. I couldn't tell if she was teasing him or not, but their playful banter suddenly made me even tenser than I was. 
Was I actually jealous of Luke because Indigo was teasing him and not me? You've obviously never seen me try to dance, Luke said. Anyway, that's about all there was to the game. It wasn't very layered, so it didn't take me long to beat it, just a couple of days of playing over spring break a couple of years ago. I think this is Park Avenue coming up, Indigo said, thankfully changing the topic. The one crossing this street at an angle. Get ready to make a sharp right turn. I see it, I replied, peering through the soupy mist, seeing the vague outline of an intersection. I stepped harder on the gas and the truck lurched forward as we rounded the corner. It was then Indigo sucked in a sharp breath. I slammed on the brakes and the truck screeched to a halt. Blocking the way ahead was an abandoned truck and in the remaining lane, two deliberately placed motorcycles. Shit, said Luke under his breath. An instant later, the staccato stutter of a submachine gun erupted to our left. Four. We instinctively ducked down as my window shattered and bullets began peppering my door with loud pings. While a few stray bullets made their way into the cab, the paper reinforcement in the door seemed to hold up, and we rode out the storm of bullets until they slowed and then finally ceased. I risked a quick peek and saw two tigers I didn't recognize walking towards us as they reloaded what looked to my untrained eye like machine pistols. We only had seconds before they began firing again. Light me one of those bombs, quick, I said to Luke. He did as I asked, with no questions, and as soon as it was in my hand, I hurled it out through the driver's window. It clattered to a hissing and sputtering stop a few feet in front of the gunman. They both stared down at it in surprise for a split second, before the furthest away of the two turned and ran. His buddy was not so quick, perhaps still deciding what it was when it went off. The explosion was much louder than I expected, and he dropped to his knees, screaming and holding his face. I hit the gas and we sped off, even as his buddy rushed over to him and began to help him to his feet. I drove straight at the bikes, the truck rolling over them with a lurching crunch of twisting metal and breaking glass. I sped off down the street, driving way too fast considering the low visibility conditions, and just hoped there was nothing in our way. We heard the faint rattle of machine gun fire behind us, but I don't think they even hit us this time. Well done, dude, Luke said. Is everyone okay? Yeah, I'm not hit, said Indigo. I'm good, I said. Then almost on cue, we heard the dull roar of motorcycles over the rush of wind through my windows. Damn it, yelled Indigo. Adrenaline was still coursing through my veins from our recent encounter, and from the way Luke and Indigo gripped the dashboard as I sped up, I knew they felt it too. The next few minutes were crucial. There would be no negotiating with the Tigers if they managed to disable the truck. They're behind us, Luke said unnecessarily, looking into his side mirror, the only one we had left. How many of them? Ah, crap, Indigo said, leaning towards Luke's side to see for herself, then back at me. All of them. Yeah, there are at least six, Luke said, racking the slide of the crossbow, a weapon that in current circumstances seemed woefully inadequate. And that's just the ones close enough to see through the fog. He swung around so that he was kneeling in the seat facing backwards and leaned out through his window. He tried to brace himself and aim the crossbow at our pursuers, but gave up after a few seconds. I never realized how hard it was to shoot backwards from a moving vehicle. I'll just waste arrows if I try and fire on them, he said, pulling back inside. We could throw some more bombs behind us, Indigo suggested. Worth a shot, Luke said, grabbing one of the ink bombs from under the seat and pulling his lighter back out of his pocket. How long do you think I should cook it? I don't know, I said, but don't let it go off in here or we're screwed. It's hard enough to see as it is. I'll do my best. He lit the fuse and waited until it had half burned down, then tossed it through the window. Damn it, he said after a few seconds. They were past it by the time it blew. Try again, Indigo encouraged. She already had another ink bomb out and ready for him. I know you'll get it right this time. It came again, that jealous twinge. She wasn't teasing him, just encouraging him, but it still made me nod up a little. Really? 
You're doing this now, Isaac? I thought. Get over yourself. How close are they? I yelled over the noise of the wind rushing through the cabin. About a truck length back, Luke replied. Maybe let it burn down to a quarter of an inch this time, I said, thinking about how much time it had taken to blow with a half inch of fuse left when I'd thrown it at the gunman. Yeah, drop it out your window, said Indigo. Let them come to it. Okay, he said, as he lit the second fuse. He let it burn down almost all the way before dropping it and putting his head out to watch the results. This time, the bang was loud enough to hear in the truck and was accompanied by the sound of screeching tires and scraping metal. Oh, yeah, he roared, pulling back inside, positively beaming ear to ear. One of the bikes went into a slide and two others hit it. The rest slowed down and fell back into the fog. I kept the gas pedal down as far as I dared, only having to swerve once to avoid a car in the middle of the road, barely missing it as it appeared unexpectedly out of the fog. We could still hear the motorcycles following us, but they remained hidden in the roiling white emptiness behind the truck. How far is it to the freeway? I asked Indigo. About two miles. Oh my, you're bleeding, Isaac, she said. What? You're bleeding from your cheek. She watched as I reached up to my cheek and felt nothing. Your other cheek. I reached over to my other cheek. I felt a cold crust under my fingers, and I realized the wind whipping through my broken window must have frozen the blood on my face. I felt a ragged line above the frozen blood, and almost instantly my cheek started aching. The adrenaline had let me forge ahead without even realizing I was hurt, but now that I knew, I sure as hell felt it. I hope it's not too bad. I said. It looks like some flying glass cut you, probably when the window was shot in, Indigo said. I'll look it over for you when we get a chance to stop for a while. You could end up with a badass scar there, Chief, Luke said, looking across the cab at my wound. He almost sounded envious. I don't really want a scar on my face, badass or otherwise, I said. Man, I am kind of surprised to hear you say that. I thought you'd be into the scarred hero type look. Don't worry, Isaac. I think scars are sexy, Indigo said, and I felt my cheeks burn hot enough to melt the frozen blood of my wound. Maybe having a scar on my face wouldn't be so bad after all. Now slow down. We're almost to the freeway on-ramp. Five. We had not been on the freeway long when the fog began to thin out, and before we knew it, we were driving through a crystal clear and frigid New England day. Luke reported that the motorcycles were still following us, but had dropped back quite a ways. I hope those persistent bastards don't chase us all the way to the safe haven, Luke said, his eyes locked on the mirror. We definitely won't lead them there, I replied. Hopefully they give up before we have to do anything drastic. We rode in silence for a few minutes, our light mood at the temporary reprieve from our pursuers suddenly dampened by what we were witnessing. The freeway was clear of vehicles, but not through any stroke of luck. There must have been an almighty gridlock at one point as people tried to escape the city, but now the vehicles were piled and heaped to the sides of the road, as though a petulant child had swept his toy cars off a track in a fit of rage. That wasn't the worst. There were bodies, too. Some hanging out of cars, some half buried in the snowdrifts that were building on the wrecks. I glanced at Indigo and saw tears in her eyes as she took in the horrible sight. Bitter tears stung my own eyes. I didn't try to comfort her. We would probably see plenty worse than this before we reached the safe haven. The Chinese had cleared the freeway and one had to assume they were doing the same to all the major roads between cities to ease their takeover and repopulation of the conquered continent. It only made sense. Luke looked into his mirror. They're still stalking us. I'm just glad their little convoy of motorbikes hasn't brought the Chinese down on us, he said. Yet, I said pointedly. Yeah, yet. That reminds me. I haven't heard... Oh, crap. I glanced at him and then down at the CB radio on the dashboard, and my stomach did a flip-flop. 
One of the bullets that had come through my window had torn through the side of it. We've been driving deaf for at least a half hour now. The whole damn Chinese army could be waiting around the next bend for all we know. Oh well, said Luke. It's not like we have anybody who speaks Chinese up here anyway. Brooke is in back. Indigo gave him a look. Hey now, uh, sorry, I didn't mean... I wasn't complaining. He looked mortified that she might think he was taking a swipe at her, and I found myself taking a perverse enjoyment out of his discomfort. I hope the others are okay, Indigo said, and I remembered the sound of the nine-millimeter bullet slapping into the side of the cargo area. We can't stop to check on them as long as the tigers are stalking us, I said. Luke, grab your atlas. See if there is a way we can lose them up ahead. We'll do, he said, no doubt happy the awkward moment had passed. He reached under his seat where he seemed to have stored everything but a kitchen sink. A few seconds later, he was opening his atlas to Massachusetts. Indigo, we got on here, right? He asked, pointing to a spot on the map. Yeah, that's the place, she said. I think I see a way, Luke said. Take the next exit and turn left off the end of the ramp. That should put us on Highway 12, and we can follow that up to the 140 and then take the 140 back to I-190. I've been that way before, Indigo said. It won't take us too far out of the way. All right, then. Maybe we can lose them on the way. I saw the exit coming up and slowed to take it, and as I did, the motorbikes closed some of the distance between us. Glancing back over my shoulder, I saw about eight bikes, some of them with two tigers on. We were still well outnumbered, as ten or twelve Chinese gangbangers were not something we were equipped to fight it out with, not even if everybody in the back was in good shape and ready to rumble. We just didn't have the firepower. The tigers would easily outgun us. My attention snapped back onto the ramp ahead of me, and I pulled us off of the freeway. The off-ramp was forested on either side, but almost as soon as we turned onto Highway 12, we passed an Ace Hardware and a grocery store. I would have liked to have stopped and looked for more supplies in both places, but with the tigers on our asses, it wasn't an option. Continuing up the highway, we passed a CVS pharmacy, and after that a couple of strip malls and an RV dealership as we left the outskirts of town. Worcester was finally in our rearview mirror. But unfortunately, so were the tigers. With the fog lifted, I could open it up a little more, but I didn't get above fifty or so. That seemed to be the speed at which the truck began to protest by shaking and whining. I knew there was no way that a rental truck was going to outrun the tigers' motorcycles. Not for long, anyway. We need to get far enough ahead so we can find a place where there's a corner to hide the truck, Hopefully they'll zoom on by and we can go the other way, I said. I don't know if that's going to cut it, Luke said, looking back. These guys are hardcore, and they're not letting us out of their line of vision. I can't believe that wasting a couple of them pissed off enough to risk the Chinese. Yeah, about that, I said. You remember the guy I killed in the alley, back when we saved Indigo? Seriously, dude? You're asking if I remember the guy you gunned down in front of me? Yeah, well, he was... What? Luke and Indigo asked at the same time. The younger brother of Chen, the leader of the Tigers, I said, not looking at them and keeping my eyes on the road. Really? Luke asked. What did I tell you? I said. If it wasn't for bad luck... Well, I don't care who he was. I'm glad you did it. You guys are my knights in shining armor, even if your shining armor is a stained parka, she said to me, and then to Luke, and your sword, a crossbow. So are they going to hunt us to the ends of the earth now, or what? Luke asked. I hope not, I replied. But back at the parking garage, I came face to face with him, and he looked mad. No, more than mad. He looks psycho. I'm pretty sure he will keep coming after us until one of us is dead. Either him or me. Since we've turned off, have we gained any ground? No. In fact, they've started creeping closer again. 
The road swerved to the right, and I could see we were coming up to a long bridge over a stretch of water. Just on the other side of this bridge, you want to turn left. It'll take us back toward the freeway. That's a big lake, I said when the trees to the side thinned out as we approached the bridge. I realized I could only see part of the lake as it stretched to my left. There were places where it bent around, forming large coves. That's the Wachusett Reservoir, Indigo said. My uncle used to bring me and my cousin fishing here sometimes when we were little. There was a sign that proclaimed the bridge prone to ice in the winter, but I ignored it and kept up my speed as we hit it. I could hear the motorcycles again and the roar of their engines were getting louder. It occurred to me they meant to take us while we were crossing the lake. I got my revolver ready and lay it on my lap in case any of them pulled alongside and saw Luke was likewise preparing his crossbow for action. They're coming, Luke said, looking in his mirror. I nodded grimly. The roar of bikes told me that they were getting very close now. Oh, no, moaned Indigo as we crested the bridge and started descending to the other side. In front of us was our worst nightmare, a roadblock manned by Chinese soldiers at the other end of the bridge. Six. Wooden barricades were placed across the end of the bridge, and an armored vehicle, topped by a wicked-looking cannon, and four Humvees were parked behind them. Standing at the barrier, watching us come toward them, were at least eight Chinese soldiers, and I could see more behind the vehicles. We were trapped between the tigers and the Chinese army, with no way out. You gotta be shitting me, Luke said. Figures, doesn't it? I said, through gritted teeth. What are we going to do? Indigo asked. Die, probably, I said, unable to hide the despair in my voice. I'm not stopping. They'll have to kill us. That's the only way they're stopping this truck. Yep. This reminds me of that old country song about the convoy, Luke said. I had no idea what he was talking about and wondered how, just seconds from death, Luke could be spouting crap about songs probably written before either of us was born. Maybe it was a coping mechanism? Mine was anger. I stomped the gas pedal hard into the floor. You guys might want to get down as low as possible, I said. The engine block should give you some protection. The Chinese soldiers in front of us suddenly realized they were in imminent danger and began scrambling to ready their weapons and take cover behind their vehicles. We were maybe a hundred yards from the barricades when the Tigers opened up with submachine guns and pistols behind us. I heard a few hit the truck, but most seemed to be missing, probably because shooting and riding a motorcycle at the same time isn't easy. The effect on the Chinese, though, was amazing. They seemed to think the Tigers were shooting at them and responded accordingly. The last hundred yards to the barricades seemed to take forever to cross. If you ask me later... I would have sworn it took at least five minutes, but I know, given how fast I was driving, it had to have happened in no more than a few seconds. It's funny how time can seem so elastic when the proverbial shit is hitting the fan. Indigo put her hand on my thigh, but I hardly noticed. We all hunkered down, Luke and Indigo below the level of the dashboard, and me with just my eyes and forehead peeking over so that I could see where I was driving. A few shots hit the windshield, high on the passenger side, and I felt a couple hitting the cargo box where it rose above the cab, but for the most part, the Chinese fire seemed to be concentrating on the motorcycles behind us. If they think we are a Chinese military truck, we might still get out of this, the hopeful thought shot through my head. The soldiers manning the barricade were not like the ones we'd been captured by. They wore simple gray-green trench coats rather than the urban camouflage with padded armor points, and they carried old-style rifles. I later learned they were conscripts and had no choice about whether they wanted to be in the army or not, and that the Chinese army was mostly made up of soldiers just like them. The armored personnel carrier actually looked like a small tank to me, and to my horror, as I examined it, the turret started to turn in our direction. I saw it inching around in slow motion, and I wondered if we'd make it to the barricades before it fired. We did barely. 
We crashed through the wooden barrier, and Chinese soldiers leapt out of our way as we careened through. The armored personnel carrier started firing at the motorcycles behind us. I realized that rather than a cannon, the gun on the turret was more like a giant machine gun, and right now it was spitting hot metal death at the tigers on our tail. The truck was heading straight for a Humvee, and I slammed on the brakes and turned the wheel hard to my left. We skidded sideways, sweeping up three Chinese soldiers who hadn't jumped out of the way quickly enough. They were crunched between us as I sideswiped the personnel carrier, causing both vehicles to shudder. The truck slewed back to the right and stopped in the center of the intersection with a screech of tires. Still alive. Are you okay? I asked the other two. Indigo nodded, and a shaken Luke risked a glance through his window as I took stock of our situation. Damn, the tigers are getting massacred, man, he said. We should get the hell out of here while the Chinese are distracted. I peeked over my shoulder and out of the window. Luke was right. The tigers were being slaughtered, but not all of them. Well back on the bridge, far enough that the fire of the soldiers' machine guns was ineffectual, an all-too-familiar figure straddled his bike. Chen, with the last two of his crew on their bikes flanking him, stood sentinel and looked down upon the destruction of the Red Tigers. I knew it was impossible, but I felt like Chen was staring right at me, and I shivered. Finally, as the turret on the armored vehicle began to whir and slowly raise its muzzle toward them, the remaining Chen and his men gunned their bikes and spun around, racing from the scene. I snapped out of my trance. It was only then that I noticed movement to my left. I think it might be too late, I said, glancing out my window. A group of six Chinese soldiers were approaching from the rear of the truck on my side waving their hands and shouting, although their words were lost in the roar of the gunfire going on around us. Indigo, hand me the rifle behind you, I said, sorry that her hand would be leaving my thigh. I slid the revolver back into my parka pocket. Three soldiers, two with rifles and one armed only with a sidearm, approached the cab of the truck, while the other three stayed by the back corner. I ducked down as they approached. The soldier with the handgun... I think he might have been an officer of some sort, shouted something in Chinese just outside the driver's side door. I tensed as the door handle twitched and was yanked open. There was a look of surprise on his face when he saw me scrunch down there with the assault rifle aimed straight at him. At least I tell myself there was when I think back. In reality, everything happened too fast for me to notice. At this range, I couldn't miss and my chest shot went straight through the officer's body and into the soldier behind him. Both crumpled to the ground. The third soldier began to bring his own assault rifle up as I swung my weapon towards him. I wasn't going to be quick enough. I heard a soft spitting sound next to my head, and the soldier, wearing his own look of surprise, dropped one hand from his rifle and scrabbled in a futile attempt to remove the crossbow arrow embedded in his larynx. He dropped to his knees and slowly fell forward squeezing his trigger as he fell. One bullet pinged into the metal of the dash right by my head, another into the floor, and the last of the three round bursts triggered by his death spasm slapped harmlessly into the roadway beneath the cab. Reeling, I saw Luke rack another short arrow into the crossbow. I shook my head to clear it, and leaned out of the door to see one of the soldiers by the back of the truck aiming his rifle my way. There were three flashes and the open door jerked behind me. I brought my own rifle around and returned fire. One of the three rounds found its mark and the soldier fell, grabbing at his thigh. Behind me there was another spitting sound, and I heard a body hit the asphalt. Luke pulled back from his window. Go! he yelled. I slammed the driver's side door and tried to restart the truck. It had stalled when we'd skidded to a stop. Despite my sense of impending doom, the truck turned over on the second try, and I slammed my foot on the gas and turned left. We shot down the road that would take us back to the freeway, leaving the firefight behind. Part 2. Decisions. 7. I couldn't hear it, but Indigo told me afterward the gunfire on the bridge had started to die down, so we probably got out of there at just the right time. The truck wobbled just as we were losing sight of the Chinese checkpoint. 
It felt as if a gust of wind had caught the side of the cargo box, but then we were clear. My head hurt from the roar of the gunfire and constant adrenaline, but I knew the others were feeling it just as much as I was. We need to stop and check everybody in the back is okay, Indigo yelled over the cold wind howling through the broken windows. I kept my foot planted on the accelerator. We will, just not yet. Stopping this close to the checkpoint didn't seem like a good idea. We need to do it soon, she insisted. I nodded. I drove 15 minutes at full speed, which actually didn't seem very fast in the damaged truck, but at least there had been no signs of pursuit. There's the on-ramp, said Indigo, pointing into the distance. Still no one on our tail? I asked Luke. No. There was a boarded-up old gas station with a large garage behind it a quarter of a mile before the on-ramp. I slowed the truck. We'll stop here, I said. I turned into the driveway without further consultation, but I hadn't slowed enough, and the truck pitched dangerously. For just a brief second, I thought it might roll onto its side. Indigo gave a short squeal as she slid hard into Luke, squashing him against the door. I braked with a jolt, and we were all propelled forward in our seats. Dude, what the hell? yelled Luke. Sorry, I said, looking sheepishly at them. I put my foot carefully on the gas again, and eased the truck around behind the gas station to the garage behind it. The doors of the bigger building were open, and it was pretty much empty apart from a few old barrels and assorted machinery. I drove the truck inside and pulled up. Luke and Indigo and I looked at each other. Their faces mirrored what I felt. Relief mixed with worry about our passengers. Come on. We jumped out and ran to the back of the truck. Indigo went to the cargo door of the truck as Luke and I shut the big doors of the garage, concealing the truck from prying eyes. Turning, I got my first look at the cargo box of the truck, and my stomach lurched. The back door of the truck, remarkably, only had a few holes in it, but the sides were pretty chewed up. Did the packed food and gear protect them? I wondered doubtfully to myself. There was a line of five holes near the back on the driver's side. They were much larger than the other bullet holes, as were the matching set of exit holes on the passenger side. I remembered the truck shuddering as we were escaping the checkpoint, and my mind flashed to the turret-mounted weapon on the personnel carrier. Luke told me that the weapon it had mounted was most likely a 25 mm autocannon, firing armor-piercing rounds. Luckily, the sides of our truck would have been like paper to those puppies as they passed right through it. We were very lucky to have made it out of there with the truck intact. Luke and I moved quickly to join Indigo at the back of the truck. Luke banged on the door with his fist. Is everybody all right in there? He called. I'm going to open it up. There was no response, not that we could hear anyway, and I moved to stand next to him as he readied himself to push up the roller door. He looked pale. I didn't blame him. I was even more afraid of what we might find when we opened the door now that I'd seen the damage to the truck. Luke undid the latch and pulled the door up. It clattered noisily upward and revealed the cargo bay of the truck. It was a mess. Supplies had tipped around and now lay strewn across the floor. Our people looked dazed as they struggled to move boxes and rise off the floor. Everyone I could see was shielding their eyes in the sudden light. Some were moaning and I could see everybody except Karen, John, Mark, and Brooke. The ride must have been hell on four wheels for those in the back. What with crashing through the barrier and into the armored personnel carrier, not to mention auto cannon fire ripping through it. Are you all okay? I asked, looking around and desperately trying to spot the missing. Most of us are just a bit bruised and battered, Sonny said. I think. He winced as he shoved the box containing extra bedding off of his legs. Sonny still looked weak, but miraculously, much better than he had been the last time I'd seen him early that morning. Where's Brooke? Ben's voice caused me to glance in his direction. She was standing right next to me. Let's get this stuff moved and look for anybody who is missing, I said. Just pile it all out and to the side of the truck. We can repack it later. 
I motioned for Luke to join me, and we climbed up into the back of the truck to help people out. Ben stayed inside to help while the others limped down from the truck. Ben found Brooke quickly. Her hand emerged from a pile of debris, and she waved quite calmly, leading him to her. She was fine, apart from a twisted ankle and a sore knee. Relieved, I continued pulling stuff away from the front left corner of the truck and came across another hand. It was a girl's hand, pale and limp. As I pulled away tins and boxes, I saw blood. Lots of it. I knew Karen was dead when I gently revealed her face. Thankfully, her eyes were closed. I felt sure they would have stared at me accusingly if they had been open. There was a bullet wound in her chest, and it was obvious she had been killed instantly. I finished uncovering her, tears of rage stinging my eyes, and then turned to help Luke. We had to make the living a priority, and it was possible that Mark and John were still alive. They were. I think Mark had been hit by a round from the personnel carrier's cannon. He was gravely injured, and his left arm was barely hanging on by a few threads of tendon and skin. He was unconscious, but the bleeding wasn't as bad as I would have thought. Both Luke and Sonny explained that the autocannon probably had tracer rounds mixed in, which may have partially cauterized Mark's wound on its way through. John had not been hit by gunfire, but was in a bad way as well. The falling supplies had crashed right on top of him and his leg was caught under a large bin of canned food. It was clear the shin bone in his right leg was broken. I'm no doctor. But even I know that a person's leg is not supposed to have an extra bend between the knee and the ankle. We laid John and Mark out on a training mat that we pulled from the truck. Brooke and Samara attended to them, while Luke and I climbed into the truck and covered Karen with a sheet we had found in the garage. We gently lifted her up and out of the truck, and I heard the other girls crying as they watched us carrying her. Sonny walked with us as we carried Karen out through the side door of the garage and to a small stand of trees behind the gas station. When we got to the trees, we paused. There, Sonny said, nodding his head toward an oak tree on our left. The earth had eroded away from the base of the trunk, leaving a cavity underneath framed by exposed roots. That'll make a good resting place for poor Karen. I nodded not trusting myself to speak. We carried her over and placed her inside. It was tight, and it took us a long time to maneuver her into the cavity, but we finally managed to arrange her body in a halfway respectable fashion. When we were done, both Luke and I sat back on our heels, catching our breath. She's with Arthur again, Sonny said. Hopefully, both of them will be happier for it. I grunted a non-committal reply. My doubts about the existence of God had also led me to question the notion of an afterlife. Death is strange in this new world. Before the flu, we had such a fear of it. It was always hidden and behind the scenes. We talked about it only in neutral terms. He passed away, or she had gone to a better place. We sent our dead away to be prettied up, made to look better than they had when they were alive, just so when the funeral came around, everybody could remember a perfect image of their loved one. Then we locked them away in a box underground, or burned them to a small pile of ashes and hid them away, where they would be forgotten most of the time, only to be remembered on rare occasions or special dates. But now, in this new world, death is ever-present, and it is everywhere. The reminders of death are impossible to avoid, just like death itself. The thing that surprises me is how quickly we all became used to it. Even then, while Sonny, Luke, and I laid Karen to rest beneath the oak tree, I knew I had become numb to the idea of death. It was simply a fact of life and would continue to be so. I had no illusions that it would ever be otherwise again, at least not for a long time and I was suddenly angry again. I didn't want to be used to death, didn't want to get to the point where it meant nothing. 
We should go back to the others, Sonny said. No, wait. Can you go and get the others, Luke? I think we should stop to say a few words for Karen. The day was still gray, and the temperature seemed to be hovering just above freezing. Even though there was no sign of the thick fog which had made the morning's drive such a chore, the clouds looked ready to begin dumping more snow on us at any moment. Within a few minutes, we were all gathered around the makeshift grave. The girls were weeping before I even began to speak. We're here to say goodbye to Karen and also Arthur, who we weren't able to bring with us. They were both great. And I can say personally, and I think also on behalf of Brooke, Ben, and Luke, that they both made us feel welcome at the Academy. I don't know what waits for them on their final journey, but I hope they find peace wherever it is. That's all, I guess. Thanks. We started to shuffle away, and I saw Indigo suddenly dash off toward a patch of scrappy-looking yellow flowers that were growing through the cracked pavement. I waited while the others went into the garage. She retrieved a handful and went back to Karen's resting place, gently placing them on the blanket. She gave me a sad smile as she stood and came toward me. We didn't say anything. Both of us knew there was nothing to say. We walked a few feet in silence, and then her hand found mine. My heart nearly stopped, but I told myself it was just one human comforting another, even as I hoped it was a sign of something more. After the injured and dead had been removed from the truck, we re-entered the garage, pulled the doors closed, and started repacking it again. When we were nearly done, I walked out through a side door a little way into the overgrown yard and examined the gray sky, listening for the sounds of helicopters or vehicles. Sonny emerged from the garage, joining me. He was looking better, and I marveled at his powers of recovery. It had been less than 24 hours since he'd been shot. That could be trouble, I said to Sonny, looking at the overcast sky. If it snows and the Chinese army is looking for us, it'll be easy to follow our trail in fresh snow. Yeah, it could create a problem, Sonny replied. And they will be after us for sure. But there's no reason to worry about it. We've got enough things to worry about that we can control, or at least influence. Weather isn't one of them. Nor are the Chinese. I guess that makes sense, I said. We headed back into the garage in silence, lost in our thoughts. I can't speak for Sonny, but I was thinking about what he'd said, about only worrying over the things we could control, and my mind had gone straight to the problem of who would be coming with us. Mark was in a bad way, and it wasn't a stretch to think we might be bringing him out to lie next to Karen before the day was through. He was still unconscious when we got back inside, but Samara reported his heartbeat was strong. Still, he was in no condition to travel. Nor was John. I knew I was soon going to have to make a decision, one way or another. It was one I didn't want to make. The thought of leaving anyone behind killed me. I had all afternoon to think it over, so I decided I would put it off as long as possible. Why was it my decision anyway? Yes, I had been voted leader, but how long did I have to be the one making all the decisions? Sonny was back on his feet now, albeit sore and limited physically, but it seemed even he was deferring to me. I decided not to think too deeply about it, but I wasn't sure I wanted to continue making the big decisions. We got everything back in place and shifted it around a bit, so maybe it'll be harder to shake loose next time, boss, Luke said, coming up to me. Inigo brushed all the broken glass out of the cab, too. Good, I replied. I'm hoping Sonny can drive so I can ride in the back for a while. You and me both, bro, Luke said, following me to the main doors. I pulled them open just an inch or so and peered at the gas station through the narrow gap. Glancing at him, I could see he looked just as exhausted as I felt. 
It was the stress and the constant stream of adrenaline, I think, leaving us feeling drained. He also looked dirty and scrappy, his patchy, ginger-colored adolescent beard adding to the look. Man, you need a shave and a shower, I joked. Stuff that. When we leave this place, I plan on curling up in a sleeping bag on a mat in the back of the truck and sleeping. Just sleeping. And you ought to talk, by the way. My hands went to my own face and felt the light fuzz of my own boy beard before lightly running my fingers over the wound on my cheek. It had crusted over and thankfully didn't hurt, apart from a faint throb. I must have looked a sight. But what can I say? Priorities tend to change when you're in the middle of an apocalypse running for your life. You can get some sleep now if you want, I told him. I was going to see if you wanted to come with me and check out the gas station for any supplies, but I can take Ben or Indigo with me instead. I doubt we'll find much there, he said, eyeing the station. That place looks like it has been closed since long before the current mist started. But I'll go with you. Ben is busy worrying about his sister's ankle, and Indigo is already sleeping in the back of the truck. All right, you and me then, I said, rising to my feet. I patted the pocket with the revolver in it, feeling its welcome weight. You might want to grab a gun, just in case. Nah, I've sworn off firearms. I'll get my crossbow. Be right back, he said, and headed to the truck. I fought the urge to argue with him. Knowing if it came to a confrontation with military, the crossbow would be of limited value. He returned a moment later, holding the weapon loosely in his hand. The way he carried it called up images in my mind of old-time movies like Robin Hood, except in those that always seemed to be the bad guys who had the crossbows. This time, they would be carrying semi-automatics. Let's go, man, Luke said, pushing the door open and breezing past me with a self-confident air about him. I shook my head and smiled to myself. My friend would have fit right in with a group of medieval outlaws. I pulled the door closed and followed him across the gravel expanse between the garage and the station, maybe ten yards across at most. With every step, I worried a Chinese patrol would come rolling down the road. 8. We made it to the back of the cinder block building without incident. The window was boarded over, and the door was locked with a chain and padlock. Let's try the front, said Luke. There was another door about halfway down the side wall, this one unchained, with a faded picture of male and female stick figures stenciled on the outside. It was locked too, but Luke put his shoulder against it, and with a hard bump, it popped right open. Inside was a simple bathroom, with a single toilet and a cracked porcelain sink beneath a grimy stainless steel mirror. There was no door leading further into the station. I always hated gas stations where the bathrooms were on the outside. They were always filthy like this, Luke said, turning away with his face etched with disgust. But you know what I hated more than that? What? I asked as we continued along the wall to the front. When fast food restaurants did the same thing. You remember the Hefty Burger back in Fort Carter? They were set up that way. Yeah, I said with a nod of my head. A real pain in the ass. If only things like that were all we had to worry about. The glass doors at the front were also chained and clasped with a padlock. We need something to cut the padlock, I said, grasping the chains. Yep, Luke said. Sonny brought some bolt cutters. I helped him pack them up. Be back in a flash. He ran off toward the garage before I could answer. I heard the faint hum of a helicopter in the distance, back in the direction of the bridge where we had encountered the Chinese. But I couldn't see it, and it didn't seem to get any closer. Still, I was glad I thought of checking for the bolt cutters rather than trying to shoot the lock, which was the first idea that popped into my head. If they were searching for us in this direction and were close enough... A gunshot might lead them right to us. When Luke returned with the heavy bolt cutters, he cut through the padlock and I yanked the chain out from between the pull handles. Other than the padlock and chain, the front door was unlocked. I took another glance up and down the road in both directions. It was still clear, 
but I wondered how much longer before we saw some sign of the Chinese. I pulled the door open and we slipped inside. It was dark. The boarded over windows only allowed narrow cracks of light to seep in around the edges. Luke pulled a small LED flashlight from his coat pocket and tossed it to me before pulling another out for himself. I hope we're not draining the batteries down for nothing, he said, shining his little light along the counter to the right of the door. What size do they take? I asked him. What? What size batteries do they use? Double A, I think, he replied. Why? Here. I reached down and picked up the unopened pack of double A batteries by my foot and tossed it over to him. Now we don't have to worry about it. How long do you think these have been lying there? He asked. Don't know. At least a year, maybe longer, I said as I shone my flashlight around the station's interior. The place had been abandoned, but you could tell that when it closed down, the owner hadn't quite gotten everything out. Various convenience store-style sundries still sat on their racks. Most of the bags of chips and nuts had been gnawed into by rats or mice. Hey, look, they have a fishing section, Luke said, walking over to where lures and bobbers were hanging. He grabbed a couple of rolls of fine fishing line and several packs of small hooks, shoving them all in his pocket. What are those for? I asked. Medical supplies, he responded. I grabbed barbless hooks. Those in the line together will allow us to stitch people up if we need to. Good idea, I said, while grabbing a few small bottles of aspirin from the shelf near me. We were low on painkillers of any sort, and I figured something was better than nothing. Mark was going to need them if he ever woke up and John could probably already use some. He'd been awake and in agony when Luke and I had left. Too bad they don't have anything stronger than aspirin here, I said, looking over to see what Luke was doing. Yeah, we'll have to be careful giving those out, though. Aspirin is a blood thinner, so we won't be able to give them to the wounded. I got three unopened cases of soda here, he said. I take back what I said about this place not being worth checking. It's a gold mine. I went behind the counter to see what I could find. There were dozens of packs of cigarettes, and a few full cartons as well, but none of us smoked and this didn't seem like the ideal time to take up the habit, so I ignored them. The till on the register was open and was empty of everything but a handful of pennies, which I left there. Coins were almost as useless as cigarettes. In a cupboard under the register I found a stack of porno magazines, which would have left me giddy six months before, but now we're just junk to be tossed out of the way. Under them, I found something much more valuable to us. A revolver. I whispered a triumphant, Yes. What did you find? Luke asked. I picked up the revolver from under the counter, stood up and placed it on the countertop to show Luke. There you go, man, the mother load, he said, beaming. He picked up the new weapon and examined it as I pulled my own out to compare the two. Awesome. It's a different make to yours, but it's a 38 too, so it'll use the same bullets. You can be the two-gun kid now. Is that from some old West video game? I asked sarcastically. Nope, he's a comic book hero from the 50s and 60s, Luke replied. It was my dad's favorite comic. Replacing my revolver in the pocket of my parka, I checked the cylinder of the handgun I had pulled from under the counter and found it was empty of bullets. I checked it for rust and tested the action to make sure that it worked smoothly. It was fine, and I fished six rounds out of my pocket and loaded it up before slipping it into my belt. I decided to continue my search behind the counter. If this keeps up, I'm going to need to get a gun belt and some holsters, I thought to myself. I approached what appeared to be a fire safe built into the counter a few feet down from the register. The safe was unlocked and open a crack, which led me to believe that, like the money in the till, any cash that had been in there was long gone. Not that it would do us any good anyway. American currency was now worth less than the paper it was printed on. I had no idea what the Chinese even called their money, but I figured it would soon become the currency of North America. Knowing that there might be a chance of something more useful than money in there, I reached down to open it. I caught a flurry of movement in my light beam, and a large squealing rat erupted from the safe, 
I stumbled backward, falling on my backside as I struggled to get away from it. It was as big as a cat, and its squeaks became a hiss as it darted toward my legs. I kicked at it, missing badly, and watched as it darted past me and scurried under the counter. Are you okay, man? Luke asked, glancing over from where he was standing by the empty drink coolers. He had a grin on his face. Yeah. I was blushing, but happy that I hadn't screamed. I never would have lived that down. It was just kind of freaky. I never really liked rats. There was a shelf inside the safe. It contained a few old ledger books, some yellowed papers and scattered coins. I shuffled the papers out of the way and my eyes widened. I had uncovered a box of 38 caliber ammo, hollow points, which I picked up and opened. It was about a third of the way full, so I scooped out the bullets and added them to the ammo already in my pocket. The bottom of the safe was a rat's nest, literally, of bric-a-brac, chewed cardboard, small pieces of wood and plastic, paper, and other unidentifiable stuff. I considered digging through it, looking for anything of value, but then decided that it was not going to be worth my time. Besides, there was no need to destroy the rat's home, if that is what it was. I carefully closed the safe until it was open only a crack, just like I had found it. Luke had wandered away from the coolers and was standing in front of some gauges and buttons set into a panel on the wall. I came out from behind the counter and walked over to join him. The panel was to control the three fuel pumps out in front of the station. I wonder if there's still some gas down in the tanks, Luke said, as I wandered up beside him. I don't know. The gauges say empty, but that could be because there is no power reaching them. That's what had me wondering, Chief, Luke said. Be a shit fight to pump it out without power anyway, I guess. As he finished speaking... We both caught the sound of tires crunching on the frozen gravel in front of the gas station. We clicked off our flashlights at the same time and scurried over to one of the boarded-up windows. Peeking through a crack, we could see a Humvee had pulled into the lot, and we watched as four Chinese soldiers got out of the vehicle. A jolt of adrenaline shot through my system. Three wore the trench coats which marked them as conscripts, while the last was wearing urban camouflage and carried a modern assault rifle, like the one that I had left back in the cab of the truck. I could see the driver was still in the Humvee. Balls. Luke cursed quietly. What if they go and check out the garage? If they do, we need to make sure they can't report in. I whispered back. That means we have to take out the guy in the Hummer first. That's not going to be easy, Luke said. Look again. There are two men still in the Hummer. Damn. I said. Luke was right. I don't know how I missed it the first time, but there were two in the Humvee, the driver and a conscript. The conscript was standing, his upper half coming up through the vehicle's roof as he manned a ring-mounted machine gun. That's going to be hard to sneak up on, Luke said. If he sees us, that thing will tear us a new one. Shit. The camouflage soldier waved two of the conscripts toward the building behind the gas station, and led the other one toward the front door we had just broken into. We were sitting ducks. Things only got worse as we heard the sound of a helicopter in the distance. Luke had his crossbow up, focused on the door. Eyes narrowed. I moved away from the window to crouch behind the end of the counter, a revolver in each hand. This two-gun kid was ready to go out in a blaze of glory if need be. With a bit of luck, we would be able to take out the two coming through the door before we had to worry about the soldiers in the Humvee. I didn't even want to think about the other two. The sound of the chopper got louder, and through the grimy glass of the door as I saw the officer stop and turn. The building began to shake, and it was clear the chopper was landing. We were cooked, well and truly. Luke lowered his crossbow. He waved me back over, and I joined him. He had a better view from his vantage point and we saw the soldiers we had been about to engage, plus the two who had been headed to the garage, come back to watch the helicopter land. The camouflaged officer walked toward the aircraft as dirt and debris started swirling in the yard of the gas station. The chopper sat down about thirty feet behind the Hummer, and the passenger door opened. A woman in a sleek black uniform jumped out with another similarly dressed male. What happened next happened so quickly it's still a blur, even though I witnessed it firsthand. Ducking to avoid the rotors, 
the woman approached the officer from the Humvee. If he saw her take the pistol from the pocket of her black overcoat as he raised his hand in salute, he didn't have a chance to react. She aimed and shot him through the face, then walked forward with purposeful strides and shot the other soldier through the throat as he struggled to bring his weapon up. Her companion began firing at the two who had been about to check the garage. He managed to wing one, who fell to the ground screaming and clutching his thigh. The other turned and ran, but another shot took him in the neck. He collapsed, dead before he hit the ground. Behind the black-clad killers, the driver of the Hummer sat straight up in his seat and began screaming at the soldier manning the machine gun turret. The woman's companion walked calmly to the soldier he had winged and stood over him before coolly shooting him through the eye. I recognized the woman now. It was Huion. I began to yell a warning as the turret on the Humvee swung toward her, but my voice was drowned out by the rapid fire of heavy machine guns. The helicopter's weaponry had been brought to bear on the ground vehicle. The Humvee jumped and quivered as it was torn to pieces by the armor-piercing shells and forced forward against the gas pumps of the abandoned station. The hellfire ended after only about thirty seconds, but there was no movement in the smoking pile of twisted and chewed metal. Huion gave a thumbs up toward the helicopter, and I looked over to it as two men dressed in urban camouflage uniforms opened the side door of the chopper. They unloaded a black motorcycle, then got back in and slid the door closed. Huion's black uniformed companion approached her and they had a brief conversation before he ran back to the chopper and climbed in beside the pilot. The rotors started turning faster again, and the chopper rose into the air, turning a tight arc before heading back in the direction from which it had come. Huion watched it go, and then walked over to the motorcycle and kicked the stand up before pushing it into the shadows at the side of the gas station. She cast a glance back at the garage and then started walking directly toward us. Luke started to raise his crossbow, but I put my hand on his arm and shook my head. He lowered the weapon, but I could tell he was tense after what he had just witnessed. I had the thirty-eights in my pockets with my hands on them when she pulled open the door and stepped into the darkened interior of the gas station. She spotted us immediately and her hand dropped imperceptibly toward the pocket where she had deposited the pistol she had so recently used against her countrymen. She stopped, but made no move to draw it. She looked both of us over in a quick and matter-of-fact way that I found somewhat unnerving. I could see she was assessing what, if any, threat we were to her. Even more unnerving was how she seemed to dismiss us right away. I must speak with Sonny, she said. You follow him? Actually, it's the other way around at the moment, I said. Sonny got hurt, so I'm in charge until he's feeling better. Hurt? What happened to him? She asked. There was no effort to hide the concern her voice held. He was shot when we went to get the truck you left for us, I replied. The bullet didn't hit anything vital, but he lost a lot of blood. But I called the surveillance teams away from there, she said, surprised in her voice. Too bad you couldn't do the same with the Tigers gang, I said. They're the ones who shot him. Damn it. I told him to be careful, she said. I'm Isaac, and this is Luke, I said. Luke, can you run and get Sonny for Miss Huion here? Sure thing, Luke said, looking Huion over much as she had looked us over. I couldn't help but do the same. Although she was unmistakably an adult, she wasn't much taller than me, standing maybe five and a half feet tall and her shoulder-length black hair fell straight from beneath her tight-fitting black cap. Looking at her black uniform, I could see very few insignias except for the epaulettes on her shoulders. Each had a single gold star, the Chinese army designation for the rank equivalent to a major. She was thin, with small breasts, but there was nothing weak-looking about her, and she moved with the easy grace of a cat getting ready to pounce on a mouse. How do you know my name? Her raised eyebrow and the way her eyes drilled into me told me she was reassessing her first impressions. I overheard part of your conversation with Sonny the other night, I said. Why are you here now? As soon as word of the incident at the bridge came across the radio, I thought that it might be Sonny and his followers. She replied, I came to see if I could throw them off your scent again. By killing a whole patrol? I asked sarcastically. 
How did you know that we were here? I'm glad you came, but you must admit, it looks suspicious. I knew you were here, she said with a slight shrug. We intercepted real-time satellite data of the bridge incident and its aftermath. I saw the truck pull into this filling station before our technician corrupted the data and passed it along to the proper department. Who is we? We are the group that tried to stop this whole tragedy from happening in the first place, and having failed in that, we are now working to make amends as best we can. We are the Shadow Cloaked Seven. Seriously? That's what you call yourselves? I asked, one of my eyebrows arching slightly. It sounds better in Mandarin, she replied, with a hint of irritation at my light-hearted taunt. For the barest of moments, I thought I saw her aura of supreme confidence slip a little. Why you? Why are you the leader with Sonny injured? She asked. I think it's because I was the leader of my own little band when we joined up with Sonny and his students, I said. After Sonny went down, we held a vote to see who would be the one to make the decisions when they needed to be made. We knew we wouldn't always have time to form a consensus. I was chosen. Although right now, I wish they'd chosen somebody else. Why is that? Two of our people are injured too badly for us to safely transport. We have to get out of here soon or risk being discovered. No offense to you for helping us, but your little massacre out there only makes things worse. It's just a matter of time before they're missed. We have to move now, and I don't know what to do with Mark and John. You should leave them behind, she replied. It's harsh, but sometimes as a leader you have to make hard decisions. Decisions for the good of the group. Whatever you do, you need to do it as soon as night falls. That's as long as my group will be able to delay action in this quadrant. And believe me, I didn't have a choice about the massacre. It was them or you. There is no way I could have explained calling them off. Leave your two injured people. If they do not fight back when the soldiers find them, they will not be killed. In fact, they will probably have their injuries tended to. I looked at her dubiously. I had a feeling that when the Chinese army arrived and found what was left of the patrol, they would not be kind to survivors. But I had no option but to trust what she said was true. We had no way to care for the critically injured, but the very fact I would have to rely on our enemy ate at me. So they'll be tended to and then shipped off to be slaves? I asked, not concealing the look of disgust on my face. In the short term, yes, she said. But one thing my group is trying to do is to get the government to recognize the freedom and rights of the children of America. It is too late to save the United States, but if we are successful, its descendants will be able to live as free and equal citizens of Greater China. Jesus. Greater China? Seriously? I think the definition of freedom that American kids know is a bit different than what you people offer, I said, bitterly. I saw the hurt in her eyes and I softened my tone. Look, I know that you mean well, but you have to understand, your government murdered our country, killed nearly everyone in it, and there are still kids dying. Babies. What did you think would happen when you killed mothers and fathers? China gave a death sentence to everyone who wasn't old enough to look after themselves. I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm never going to forgive that. I understand you're angry, but we're not all against you. In time, things will get better, but for now, resistance is futile. You have to try and avoid capture and adapt to survive. Things can never go back to the way they were. Huian, what are you doing here? Sonny's voice came from the doorway, and we both looked over. I came to help if I could, she replied, turning from me. I half expected her to run to Sonny, but they looked at each other with almost a sense of mistrust. There's not a lot I can do, but if you tell me your route from here, I can do my best to keep the searchers from zeroing in on you. Well, after that performance, I'd say you just made things a lot worse for us, not better, he said, echoing my sentiment. I'm not telling you where we're going. That might be just as dangerous as staying here. You still don't trust me? She asked, her voice shaking a little. Just. Give me the route for the next fifty miles, then. After that, you should be out of the search radius. 
I honestly don't know who or what to trust anymore, Sonny said, before looking over at me. Isaac, can you give us a few minutes? No problem, I said. I'll go keep an eye on the others. I have some aspirin for John. It might help take the edge off. I had decided I would give him the option of pain relief after explaining the dangers of blood thinning. I know I would want that choice if it were me in that much pain. I squeezed past Sonny where he still stood in the doorway and jogged back to the garage. 9. As much as I hated to admit it, Huion had given me plenty to think about with regards to the fate of John and Mark. She was right. I had to put the group ahead of any one of its members. When looked at from that point of view, I really didn't have a decision to make at all. I just had to figure out how I was going to tell the others we were going to have to leave Mark behind. I knew it was the right, no, the only course of action we could take, but that didn't make me feel any better about it. Maybe I'd ride up front with Sonny when we left, after all. I didn't think that I'd be able to sleep with the regret eating away at me. Being a leader was hard. How's everybody doing? I asked Samara who was still crouched on the mat by the wounded. Mark woke up for a few minutes a while back, she said quietly. He asked for some water and passed out again right after he drank it. I still don't think he knows how bad he's hurt. I can't walk and my leg hurts like hell, John replied for himself. But I'm in better shape than he is. What the hell were they shooting at us? Vehicle-mounted auto cannon, I replied. Luke said they were probably armor-piercing rounds. He shook his head. Here, these might help take the edge off, but they can thin your blood. I pulled out one of the small bottles of aspirin and tossed it to John. Don't take a lot, just in case. I guess we should be glad more of us didn't end up like Mark and Karen. You're lucky to only have a broken leg, although I'm sure you don't feel very lucky right now. I do, actually. We all thought we were toast when we heard that helicopter outside and all the shooting. What the hell happened? He said. I gave him and the others a brief version of the short but nasty clash between Huion and the patrol. John whistled. <sighs> they took out a whole patrol? No wonder she told us to get the hell out of Dodge. While Luke and I had been searching the gas station... Sonny had straightened John's leg as best he could and duct-taped a couple of two-by-fours to each side of the brake, a makeshift splint to keep it straight. It would probably work for now, but the brake had looked really bad, and if he didn't have any other problems, like internal bleeding or infection, I doubted he would ever walk again without a limp. It had looked to me like the type of brake that would require rods and pins to hold the bone together. I decided I'd give him a choice. Stay, so maybe the Chinese would fix his leg, or come with us and remain free, but at the cost of maybe never walking properly again. It was a choice that the unconscious and more gravely injured Mark wouldn't get. John chewed a couple of the aspirin and washed them down with water. I glanced through the open back door of the truck and saw Indigo and Allie were both curled up in sleeping bags on top of the raised mat we had set up for Sonny. They were sleeping soundly, so I decided to leave them for the time being and continued around the truck. Near the front of the truck, I found Ben and Brooke. Brooke was seated on a small wooden crate, one of the many things lying around the garage. Ben was sitting cross-legged on the floor next to her. Brooke looked up and smiled as I approached. How's the ankle? I asked. Oh, it's feeling much better since Ben taped it, she replied. Not going to be running sprints any time soon, but I can walk on it with no problem. I think I just turned it. Not even a sprain. Good to hear, I said, nodding. How about you, Ben? How are you holding up? What's that term you Americans say? Keep on trucking? Well, I'm trucking, Ben said, glancing up at me. We're not bugging out of here until nightfall, I said. I explained quickly what had happened outside. I was surprised by Ben's lack of response. He was clearly emotionally and physically exhausted. 
Why don't you both try and get some rest in the meantime? It looks like Allie and Indigo are already asleep in the back of the truck. I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you two joined them. What about you? Brooke asked. You look like you need rest as much as we do. I plan on trying to get some sleep when we leave, I mumbled, trying not to think about Mark. How would I be able to sleep knowing what had to be done? I had a feeling that even when I got to rest, sleep would be a long time coming. Something's wrong, Ben said. He was looking at me keenly, suddenly more alert now that he sensed the friend's distress. There's something you're not telling us. I felt my shoulders sag as I leaned against the fender of the truck. The metal was dented and scraped from the collision with the Chinese vehicle back at the bridge. I opened my mouth to speak but didn't know how to start. Well, spit it out, Ben said. It's Mark. He's hurt too badly for us to look after him, I said, looking at the dirty concrete floor instead of meeting their eyes. We are going to have to leave him behind, and John too if he wants, in hopes that the Chinese will find them and provide any needed medical treatment. That makes sense to me, said Ben. If Brooke or I were too injured to carry on, that is what I'd want you to do with us. As long as there is life, there is hope, even for a prisoner. Just because it makes sense doesn't make me feel any better about it. I feel like a bastard for even considering it. The Chinese aren't known for their sense of compassion. It could be a death sentence. I shook my head. I don't think Luke will like the plan. Luke's the one who convinced everybody to make you leader, Brooke said. He'll keep following you, even if you make a decision he doesn't agree with. He's not a wanker. I've heard that word before, but I'm not really sure what it means. What word, wanker? Brooke asked, with a giggle. Yeah. Well, at the risk of sounding like I'm an expert, you better let me answer this, sis, interrupted Ben. A wanker is like someone who, you know. He made a vague pulling movement with his hand. I didn't mean it that way, though, said Brooke her face glowing red. It's the same as what you Americans mean when you call a person a jerk. Ah, I got it, I said, smirking. Wanker. I like that word. Who's a wanker? Luke asked, emerging from around the corner of the truck. You, I said. Ben laughed, but Brooke clapped her hand over her mouth. I see, he said, his eyebrow raised. Just kidding. Ben and Brooke were giving me an English lesson. Okay, so they're teaching you the cool words first, then. I smiled and put my hand on his arm. We should talk about Mark, I said, my tone serious. You're probably not going to like this, but he won't be able to come with us. I told him my plan. His face darkened while I spoke, and the deep frown on his face told me I was right about him not liking it but so was Brooke when she had said he would accept my decision nonetheless. In the end, with some dissent, the others in the group also agreed leaving Mark behind was the best for the good of everybody, especially him, although nobody particularly liked the idea. Samara decided to stay too. She wanted to remain behind and watch over him, despite the fact we all tried to talk her out of it. Much to my surprise, a pained John also decided to stay, and allow the Chinese to capture him in hopes of having his leg treated properly. It's too painful, and who knows, if they fix me up, maybe I can gather some information that can be used in the future. I know roughly where I'll be able to find you guys if everything works out. I felt better about leaving Mark, now that John had elected to stay, although I didn't hold out much hope that I would ever see any of them ever again. Indigo and Brooke tried to talk Samara into coming, but she was adamant, and I could tell that it wasn't only for selfless reasons. It was clear she was tired of running. We unpacked some food and water to leave with them while they waited for the Chinese to find them, and I left the other small bottle of aspirin with John as well. I offered to leave them a weapon too, but it was declined. John and Samara felt their chances were better if they were found unarmed. Sonny had come back into the garage about 25 minutes after I left him in the gas station with Huion. 
I heard her go. The high-powered motorcycle was loud, and she was clearly in a hurry. He told us that she'd try to delay the discovery of the missing patrol until the next morning, hopefully giving us plenty of time to get away if we left at nightfall, as we planned. He looked unhappy, and I guessed his feelings for her still ran deep. He said he was feeling up to driving for a while, but it was decided that I'd ride up front with him to spell him if he needed it. Now that the decision about who would stay and go was made, I felt bone-tired, and knowing I had a long night ahead, I finally managed to lie down and fall asleep for a few hours. 10. Luke woke me at sunset. I rose slowly, stretching my sore muscles. The sleep had done me good, but I was still groggy, and there was no way it had been as much sleep as I needed. The stress of the day was wearing on me in ways I had never imagined it could. I don't like stress, but I knew I was in for a lot more of it, at least until we arrived at the safe haven. Here, you look like you need this more than I do, Luke said handing me an energy drink from his stash. I don't know where he kept them. I never saw him pack or unpack them, but he always magically seemed to be able to produce energy drinks as needed. You still going to ride shotgun tonight? Yeah, that's the plan, I said, taking the can from him and cracking it open. Unless somebody else really wants the spot. Not me, he said. I'm going to sleep from here until whenever we stop again. I'm bushed. I don't even think another round with the Chinese would wake my ass up once I go down for the count. As I slammed down half the energy drink, he watched me, suddenly all serious. What? I asked. This thing with Mark and John and Samara, it sucks, man. I want to try to talk everyone out of it, to find a way to bring everybody. Anyway, I know we can't. And I just want you to know, I respect your decision. I know, I said. It does suck, and if I could think of another way, I would grab onto it instantly. But Mark and John need real medical care, way beyond anything we can give. Samara, though, well, you could see it, too. I think she's just tired of running. Anyway, it was their decision. John and Samara, I mean. Mark is the only one we couldn't really help. What about the safe haven we're headed to? Luke asked with a hint of hope in his voice. I found it infectious and almost gave into it myself before cold, harsh reality won out in my mind. Even if we get there and find that the safe haven is real, there's no guarantee that they'll be able to provide the medical help to save Mark or John, for that matter. I shook my head. In this case... I think we just have to accept that the possibility of medical care from the Chinese is better than a gamble that there is actually a safe haven. You think we're on a wild goose chase? No. I'm hopeful it's there and that we'll find it. But I'm pretty sure that at some point in the next few days we're going to be on foot again. It's going to be a hard slog even for those of us that are fit and healthy. I didn't think of that, Luke said. He bowed his head. I don't know if he was quite convinced, but he seemed to accept my reasoning. Come on, let's see how close we are to leaving. I finished the rest of the energy drink and walked to the rear of the truck. The rest of the crew was packing the last of the goods Luke and I had scavenged into the rear of the truck. I found Indigo in the cab of the truck. Riding up front again? I asked her, hopeful. Of course, this is where the action is. She responded with a playful smile. Her hour or so of rest seemed to have done her a world of good, but then I thought she looked good even when she was about to collapse from fatigue. Can you shoot? I asked her. Yeah, a bit, she said with a far-off look. My dad taught me. I took out the revolver I had found in the gas station and handed it to her, along with a handful of extra rounds for it. You keep this. I already have one, I said. Two of them take up too much space in my pockets. Thanks. She looked it over and then held it out and lined up the sight. Where'd you get this one? 
in the gas station when Luke and I went and checked it out. Cool. I'll keep it handy, she said, sliding it into her coat pocket. Is everybody else all ready to head out? Pretty much, I replied. I turned to look toward the back of the truck and saw Sonny rolling the big garage doors open a little. It was dusk and light was fading, but full darkness wouldn't hit for another half hour or so. Samara was sitting with Mark and John on the mat we'd left for them, the food and water piled nearby. The injured boys were covered with some of the extra blankets we had brought. The other passengers were standing around talking quietly, waiting for the word to climb back into the truck. I went over to Luke. I think we're ready to go. He nodded and Sonny joined us. Twenty more minutes should give us full dark. We'll go then. Something was nagging at me, and I decided I would talk to Samara one more time before giving up on her. Excuse me a sec. I walked over to the corner of the garage. Mark was still out of it, laying on his back, dark circles under his eyes, and John was laying with his head on Samara's lap. He wasn't asleep, but looked pretty exhausted. You won't talk me out of staying, Isaac, she said as if reading my thoughts. I've tried, Isaac. She won't listen to reason. John said in a resigned tone. Perhaps sensing my sadness, Samara put her hand on my knee. Please don't take it personally. It's got nothing to do with you. I'm glad they made you leader while Sonny was down. You've been great and did well to get us this far. I'm just sick of hiding and running, and I don't like the idea of leaving two injured friends behind to fend for themselves, but I understand why it had to be this way. Plus, if I'm here, at least they'll have someone to tend to them. Samara paused as if weighing her words carefully. Besides, maybe it won't be so bad with them in charge, you know? In another time and place, I might have argued with her. But I could see that John was right. Samara had persuaded herself it was the best thing to do. I gave her hand a squeeze. Okay, I hope it works out for you. For all of you. Is there anything else I can do before we go? Well, you could watch Mark while I duck out to the little girl's room. Sure. Don't go too far, though. Samara pulled herself from under John's head and left the garage. I put my hand on Mark's forehead. He was burning up. Badly. I had a terrible feeling he wouldn't last the night. Sonny! Allie's despairing shriek caused me to snatch my hand away. I shot to my feet. She was at the rear corner of the truck pointing to the opening of the shed. The doors were not in my line of sight as I ran towards her and joined Sonny and Luke as they raced from the cab. They pulled up quickly when they saw what had startled Allie. So did I. There were three figures, backlit by the last light of dusk. Their faces were in shadow. I didn't need to see them, though. In the middle was the unmistakable figure of the leader of the tigers, Chen. Next to him stood another of his gang members, and the third figure, held tightly by the thug's arm, was Samara. A short blade pressed to her throat. Sonny took a step forward. Stand still, all of you, or the girl gets it in the neck, snapped Chen. I saw the shape of a pistol in his hand. There was not a doubt in my mind. He was desperate and just crazy enough to carry out his threat. What do you want, Chen? Sonny asked over the top of Allie's screaming. Oh, you'll find out, asshole, he spat. First shut that bitch up. Sonny put a hand on Allie's shoulder and pulled her close. Hush now. It'll be okay. Go and sit in the truck till I tell you to come out. Doors, snapped Chen to his sidekick. Samara gasped as the man dragged her to the doors and pulled them closed without loosening his grip. I took another step forward but stopped when Chen's eyes locked on me. That's right. Soon enough, Lao Wai. Somebody put a light on, he said, his eyes fixed on me. I heard movement in the back of the truck, and somehow still working, the light in the cargo bay came on. Chen turned back to Sonny. Well... Here we are again, Sonny. 
I'm not particularly upset you didn't hook up with us when this invasion shit went down. I probably would have had to kill you anyway. No good having two alphas in the pack, if you know what I mean. Anyway, all that is water under the bridge. I'm even willing to forget that you and your baby kung fu gang led us into a trap that got all my men killed. Maybe you did me a favor. A big group like that was bound to get noticed by the Chinese eventually. What I'm not willing to forget, or forgive, is the filthy Lao Wai who killed Jack. Just hand him over, and the rest of you can go wherever you are headed. Based on what I saw that helicopter do, you have friends in high places. No, not negotiable, Sonny said simply. Your brother got what he deserved, Indigo yelled as she jumped fearlessly out of the truck and came around to face Chen. He was going to rape me. Well, well, well. Jack always did have good taste in bitches, he said, flicking his tongue over his top lip. Unafraid and with fire in her eyes, Indigo stepped forward even as I did. Come on! Chen screamed and stepped forward, quickly placing the muzzle of his gun against Indigo's forehead. Indigo froze and so did I. It was me he addressed next, though. Another move like that and I'll put a bullet through her head. I stood there with adrenaline coursing through my body, frustrated and helpless to protect the people I had been charged with caring for. There seemed to be no way out, but then it came to me. The one and only option I had to get us all out of this situation. Please, Chen, said Sonny in a calm voice. We're screwed enough as it is without helping the Chinese by killing ourselves. Please, lower the gun. I was shocked when the leader of the Tigers did just that. He lowered the gun and took a step away from Indigo. I saw her shoulders relax and she stepped back against the truck. You know what, Sonny? You're right. And in honor of the fact we were once tigers together, I'll let all of you go. All except him. He pointed his finger at me like it was a loaded weapon. No, I already told you. It's non-negotiable. Sonny, I said loudly, interrupting him. It's all right. He's right. It's the only way. This won't end until I'm dead. Or he is. The only thing we need to work out is if he's going to shoot me like a coward or fight me like a man. I saw my words have the desired effect. Chen raised his chin defiantly. You want to fight me, Lao Wai? He asked, incredulous. My name is Isaac, I said as I walked forward holding his cocky gaze with my own defiant stare. And yes, I do. I want to fight you. Hand to hand. No weapons. Chen laughed hard. My gaze didn't waver. Finally, he stopped laughing and looked at me, unsmiling as he used the muzzle of the gun to scratch his chin. Jeez, I don't know, Isaac. You speak of cowards, but I seem to remember you shot my brother with a machine gun. He was armed and in the middle of raping a girl. Like a coward. Chen's eyes flashed angrily. He would have shot me too if he'd had the chance. Chen paused to consider the situation. All right, Isaac, he said after a few seconds. Just the satisfaction I get beating you to a bloody pulp before I kill you will make it worthwhile. He looked at his heavyset partner. So, if anyone makes a move while this is on, cut the girl's throat and take out as many of them as you can. Yes, boss. Isaac, you don't have to do this, said Sonny, stepping between us and holding his hands up like a traffic cop. Chen, I'll fight you. Chen looked down at Sonny's blood-soaked T-shirt, then back into his eyes. As much as I'd like to kick your ass for the trouble you've given me, it wouldn't be a fair fight. But if you really want a piece of me, I'm happy to give you a shot. You'll just have to wait your turn. It's all right, Sonny. I know what I'm doing. Conflicted, 
Sonny looked at me for a few seconds, then nodded, stepped up to me, and lowered his head. Any means, he whispered. I nodded, and Sonny went back over to the truck, where the others watched on with apprehension. I looked at Indigo and was strangely pleased by the concern etched on her face. When I looked back to Chen, he handed his gun to Zhao and pulled his T-shirt over his head. He was impressively muscled, not an overblown bodybuilder type, but the kind of ropey, hard muscle that comes from years of martial arts training and fighting. His abdomen looked like it was carved from stone, its only blemish a small scar that looked like it was the result of a knife wound. A tiny seed of doubt sprouted in my mind, but I quickly stomped it underfoot. My short time working with Sonny had revived my kung fu skills, and his insistence on the any means principle made sense in this new, savage world. Basically, he had drilled into me the need to use any means, fair or foul, to disable an opponent, to disregard all sense of fair play, to kill or be killed. I knew this would be my first or last test. I turned my back on Chen and walked away from the truck into the center of the big shed. Chen followed. The garage was getting colder and our breath plumed in the air as we faced off. I took off my jacket but left my t-shirt on. Chen eyed me cockily and I hoped his cockiness might work in my favor. That and the fact that I might have the element of surprise on my side. He had no idea of my skill level and in fact probably assumed I had none at all. I stood on the balls of my feet with my knees slightly bent and held up my fists. Chen snorted and stalked straight at me. I waited until the last possible second, then tilted backwards, eluding his flying fist, and stepped back lightly out of his reach. His eyes widened slightly at my skillful evasion, but his face still told me he was overconfident. Stupidly, he tried the same move again. This time I ducked his fist and rabbit-punched him in the side before quickly moving away again. He winced and rubbed his side. I hadn't inflicted any real damage but now he was taking me seriously. Chen sneered to show me it hadn't hurt, and then raised his fist before coming at me again, this time more carefully. I waited as he slowly closed the gap between us. I wasn't quick enough to evade his next punch, but it only glanced off my chin. Too late I realized it was a feint, and the second punch, the real one, got me in the stomach. Breath whooshed from my mouth and nostrils, and I doubled over as he deftly moved out of my reach. I heard gasps of despair from my group over my heartbeat throbbing in my ear. His retreat was unnecessary, as I was in no condition to counter. Instead of pressing his attack, he took the opportunity to gloat, raising his arms and nodding like a victorious prize fighter. The audience was unappreciative, but his strutting allowed me time to regain my breath. I didn't need to, but I remained doubled over in an attempt to stoke his overconfidence. It worked. Without warning, he stopped his prancing and took two steps before launching a vicious roundhouse kick at my head. I rolled under the kick, not quite fast enough to evade it completely. His heel grazed my cheek, right on the crusted over wound, but didn't halt my momentum. My roll continued and I punched him hard in the groin as I rolled under him. He fell to the floor swearing and holding his jewels. Dazed from the blow to my cheekbone. I climbed to my hands and knees as warm blood flowed down my face. I watched Chen warily as he also struggled to rise. Score, one each, I told myself. I made it to my feet as he struggled to his knees. I waited. Attack him, Isaac! yelled Sonny. Even though it felt wrong, I knew Sonny was right. I had to take advantage of him while he was down. Hadn't he done the same to me? I thought of him putting the gun against Indigo's forehead and channeled the rage. I rushed forward and aimed a kick at his head. Perhaps not quite as incapacitated as I thought, he grabbed my foot mid-air and twisted it viciously. I groaned in pain but allowed myself to fall the way he twisted, avoiding injury. Unfortunately, I fell hard and the side of my head smacked against the cold concrete of the garage floor. I know it sounds cliché, but I saw stars. I struggled again to rise, and to my horror, saw Chen had now made it to his feet. Worse, his eyes screamed murder. I was in pain, the agony of my cheek cutting through the concussed fog in my brain. 
He waited again, seeming to enjoy my drunken struggle to get to my feet. He knew he had me now. As soon as I made it upright, he danced around me just out of my reach. He bounced on the balls of his feet and pushed his head forward as though daring me to hit him. I jabbed at him. My attempted blow was sluggish. I knew the second I launched it that it wouldn't strike him, and the spry, smirking gangster, apparently recovered from the blow to his groin, ducked under it easily and rabbit punched my ribs. His strike sent fresh ripples of pain through me and I teetered a little. Once again, he had skipped out of my reach without pressing his advantage. I didn't fall. I knew if I did, it was over. He came for me again, and I knew this was it. The steely look in his eyes made it clear he was ready to finish things now. I just managed to dodge the first punch, and when the follow-up to my ribs came, I sidestepped it and trapped his arm under my own. He tried to disengage, but I had him pinned. Chen rained blows on the top of my head with his free hand. Luckily, I have a hard head, and I was able to weather the blows. Sonny's words echoed in my mind. Any means. While he was trapped against me, distracted, trying to bash my brains in. I grabbed his jewels through his jeans and twisted them savagely. I know it was a low blow, but this was a fight for my life, literally. He was not going to stop until I was dead. He had already proved he wouldn't show me any mercy. If I was to prevail, I couldn't show him any. Chen screamed, and while he was preoccupied with the agony of his abused nether regions, I encircled his neck with my arm, pulling him into a classic headlock before deliberately falling backwards, letting my weight pull us down. We hit the floor hard, with me taking the brunt of the impact. Winded again, I held on, squeezing my arm tighter around his neck, holding on for dear life, as they say. My dear life. He was on top of me his back against me as he tried to roll us over so he could break away and resume pummeling me. I quickly used my other hand to lock my right arm in place and squeezed harder. He stopped trying to roll and, spluttering for air, began to elbow me in the ribs, frantically trying to make me loosen my grip. He got a few good blows in. I gasped in pain, but I held on, pulling my headlock tighter and tighter, slowly squeezing the fight and life out of him. It's not like in the movies. It took forever for him to stop struggling, and even when he did, I wasn't game to let go. It wasn't until Sonny came over and patted my head and told me I could let go now that I slowly relaxed my hold. Luke was there too and helped me out from under Chen's body. I couldn't look at him. While I had won, I didn't feel victorious. In fact, I felt sick. I took two steps to the wall and unloaded the contents of my stomach. We heard a clatter as the doors to the garage were jerked open. We turned in time to see Zhao running into the night as Samara fell to her knees in relief. The discarded knife, so recently against her throat, was on the floor by her shaking hands. 11. Sonny patted my shoulder. You did what you had to do, Isaac. As you said, it was him or you. I didn't say anything. I walked back to the truck, past the others, even shaking off Indigo's hand when she reached out to me. Ignoring the hurt in her eyes, I continued to the cab and climbed in before sitting with my head in my hands. I ached all over, but nothing hurt like what I was feeling. Killing a man with my bare hands was a million times worse than the feeling I had experienced when I had to shoot one. More real somehow. More raw. In shock, I only vaguely remember everyone saying their final goodbyes to Samara, John, and Mark as I sat in the truck. Indigo told me later, that Samara had bounced back quickly from her ordeal and had told her to thank me. As wrapped up in my own little ball of misery as I was, I barely registered the others getting into the cargo hold of the truck. Finally, Sonny climbed into the driver's seat and handed me my pistol and parka. I put on the parka mechanically and slipped the revolver into my pocket as Indigo, true to her word, climbed in and settled next to me. 
She didn't say anything, just handed me a rag for my cheek and then put her hands in her lap. Looking in the one remaining mirror on the passenger side of the cab, she said to Sonny, You should be able to go straight back. Okay, he said, putting the truck in reverse and gently pressing down on the gas pedal. He made it on the first try and turned the truck around in the gas station's lot, stopping at the exit before glancing at me. The freeway is to the right? I knew he was trying to distract me, and I was grateful. Yeah, left would take us back to the bridge, and we don't want to go there, I said. Beyond that, I'm going to be fairly useless. Luke and his atlas are what I relied upon for navigation. It's a good thing he left this up here, then, Indigo said holding up the battered road atlas Luke had taken from Walmart on the day that seemed so long ago. God, has it really only been two weeks since we left Fort Carter? I asked myself. It seemed like a year. Excellent, Sonny said, and pulled the truck to a stop. He quickly perused the atlas before heading off. We reached the on-ramp in quick time, but to my surprise, Sonny passed it and turned under the freeway at the next cross street, then kept barreling up Highway 140 as fast as he dared push the truck through the icy night. The truck cab was cold given the lack of side windows. I had been prepared for this, of course, having driven like that during the day, but at night it was accentuated by the plunging temperatures. I zipped up the bottom part of my parka hood to cover my lower face and found myself wishing that I had some ski goggles to help keep the wind off my eyes. This road will lead back to the freeway and allow us to avoid the big semicircular loop up by Fitchburg and Leominster, Sonny said. We'll get on the two just past Leominster and take it to 202, which will take us up to Concord, New Hampshire. From there, we can take I-93 north to where we are headed. Looks like you don't need a navigator after all. I was thinking we should dump the truck sometime before we get too close to Drake Mountain, I said. We don't want to make it too easy for the Chinese to track us when they find the truck. Good thinking, he replied. There's a town I remember being about ten miles before Lincoln, where we turn off to head for the ski lodge. Compton or Campton, something like that. We can find a place to hide the truck there. Campton, Indigo said, shining a light on the atlas in her hand and looking at the Interstate 93 corridor through New Hampshire. How long do you think it'll take us to get there? If my memory is right, and we don't run into any more trouble, I think we should get to Campton inside of four hours. I'm not sure how realistic an expectation of not running into trouble is, I said. Concord is a decent-sized town, so we should probably plan on there being a Chinese military presence base there. That means they could be in the area. You're probably right. We probably shouldn't count on getting to Campton until well after daybreak. Damn, it's cold riding up here, he said after a few minutes of silence. I should have told you I was still too weak to drive. It's colder now than it was this morning, I acknowledged. But at least you have gloves. I drove without them today and my fingers are still freezer burned. They aren't turning black or anything, are they? Indigo asked with real concern in her voice. My Uncle Joe got frostbite in his foot a few years back, and they had to cut off three of his toes. No, nothing like that, I said, smiling. Their small talk had managed to put what had just happened with Chen to the back of my mind, and I thanked fate, or karma, or whatever the hell had helped me to find these people. The weather should give us an advantage, though, right? Indigo asked. Being cold and all, China is a warm place, right? So these Chinese soldiers won't be used to the cold. Not really, Sonny told her. China is a big country, and it has all of the same climate bands that the United States does. While soldiers from South China might not be acclimatized to the cold, those coming from Manchuria will find that the weather is very similar to home at this time of year. Oh, Indigo said, her teeth chattering. I shuffled closer to her for warmth unable to work up the courage to put my arm around her. Sonny, I was sure glad to see your girlfriend today. Huion hasn't been my girlfriend for a long time now, Sonny replied. I wasn't all that happy to see her because it meant that she was putting herself at risk for us. If she hadn't showed up when she did, we would have been screwed, I said. 
we still might be screwed. When that decimated patrol is located, the search for us will heat up big time. It was foolish of her to come to our rescue if what she says about her and her group... The Shadow Cloaked Seven, I said, making my voice as ominous as possible. Yes, them, he said, apparently missing the joke. If what she says about them and what they are trying to do is true, then as much as I hate to say it, they are much more important than we are in the scheme of things. We rode on in silence as the headlights, miraculously still working after all the punishment the truck had received, illuminated the tiny snowflakes that began drifting down from the night sky. Twelve. I have to admit, I don't remember much of the drive until we hit the freeway just outside of Leominster. I remember talking to both Sonny and Indigo, but the specifics of our conversations are not as clear as many of my other memories from that period. I was probably in a state of shock. Probably. I was definitely in a state of shock. I vaguely remember Indigo pulling a first aid kit out of the glove box and cleaning the wound on my cheek. Even the sting of the alcohol she used did not seem to cut through the fog in my brain. One thing that did rattle around my brain was the knowledge I had just killed another person with my bare hands, and although I know there had been no choice, it was still something that weighed heavily on me. If things went to plan, we would reach our destination, but it was hard to care when I couldn't get the sounds of Chen choking to death out of my head. My hand shook for a long time afterwards. It was definitely not like the movies, where the hero would by now be cuddled up with the girl of his dreams. Well, the girl of my dreams was beside me, and we were kind of cuddled up, but more through the need to keep warm than anything else. After a while, the shock began to wear off, and I even got a couple of hours of fitful sleep. When I awoke again, Indigo was drowsing, and I found my thoughts drifting hopefully toward the future. The prospect of getting to the safe haven and settling down into some sort of normalcy was exciting for me, and I began to fantasize about how it might go down and what it might be like there. Of course, things could never go back to normal. Normal was gone. Hell on earth was normal now. I guess I had one advantage over the others. My normal had already changed forever before the Chinese released the Pyongyang flu virus. By the time the adults started dying, I had already become accustomed to adapting to new situations. Despite the fact the heater was blazing, the lack of windows made certain the cab of the truck was like a refrigerator. As much as I wanted to keep Indigo snuggled against me, by the time we got to the freeway, I was leaning forward in the passenger seat, my hands cupped around the heating vent on my side. The snow was falling heavier the further north we traveled, and I began fearing it would make us easy to track from the air. It's funny how the same fears which had plagued me while we were walking through the woods after losing Sarah would return to unsettle me as we drove north nearly two weeks later. I thought of Sarah, who'd made sure we all had fun during her last night on Earth. Such a waste. From her, my mind drifted to the others we had lost. Arthur and Karen and those we had left behind, John, Samara, and Mark. The last three were still alive when we left them, and I hoped they were still okay. But regret at leaving them still ate at me even though, before the confrontation with Chen, I thought I had come to grips with that choice. A fresh wave of anger at the Chinese washed over me. Are you all right? Indigo said leaning forward beside me. I guess she had noticed my clenched jaw. You seem down. Is everything okay? Nothing is okay. I snapped, instantly regretting my tone. None of this was her fault. Sorry. It's just that everything sucks, and by everything, I mean everything. Oh, come on now, she replied. When life gives you lemons, what do you do? Throw them away. I had never liked that dumb saying. No, you don't. You make lemonade, she said. If you throw them away, you end up with nothing. At least with the lemonade, you have something. What if life doesn't give you any sugar to make your damn lemonade? 
I said, probably a bit more gruffly than I meant to. Then you're just going to have a glass of sour lemon juice. Wow, said Indigo. I wish Luke was here to say something profound from a video game and make you feel better. He does have a knack for doing that, doesn't he? I said, finally cracking a smile. Hey, you have a Chinese guy here. Words of wisdom can flow from my mouth too, you know. Sonny joined in. Lao Tzu, Confucius, fortune cookies, pick your poison. What's bothering you, Isaac? I took a second to think about it. Sadness over the ones we lost, I guess. And also Samara, Mark, and John. Oh, and not to mention killing someone with my bare hands. That about sums it up, I think. Look, I know it doesn't help, but you said it back at the garage. Chen wasn't going to quit until one of you was dead, and I, for one, am glad you came through. Me too, said Indigo, as her hand found mine. Sonny glanced at us, and I felt myself blush before he quickly looked back to the road. All right, how about this for words of wisdom, then? Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break, Sonny said. We were all watching the road. The headlights lit up the snow as it drifted to the ground, and I was thankful that it wasn't me driving. Luckily, it wasn't too thick on the road, though. Who said that? Confucius or Lao Tzu? Indigo asked. Neither one, Sonny laughed. It's from Shakespeare. It means that you should talk about what's eating you up inside before it consumes you. I told them about Sarah then. Both of them had heard me talk of her before, Indigo more so than Sonny because I had told her of Sarah's death during one of our long conversations. But this time I told the whole story. From the first time Luke and I had seen her, held captive by the looters, until she had been killed by the pack of feral dogs. I didn't know whether it was the stress of what had happened earlier, or whether it was just plain exhaustion. But by the time I had gotten to the dog attack, I was on the verge of tears, and they started to flow as I described our group tending to her in front of the fire. None of it was your fault, Indigo said putting her arm around my shoulder. I know it hurts to lose people, especially those people you feel responsible for. But sometimes, especially now, bad things happen, and it's not your fault. I nodded and took my hand away, and she put hers into her lap. What about Karen? I asked her. I don't just feel responsible for her. Being the leader, I was responsible for her, and yet she's dead as well. I glanced over at Sonny. Because of my decisions, I endangered all of you in the back of the truck, and we're lucky that only one of us was killed by the fire from that roadblock. Everybody in the truck, front and back, knew that we were going to be at risk when we left the academy, Sonny said. Karen more than most, because her boyfriend had just been killed. She told me she didn't think we were going to make it, and sadly, in her case, it turned out to be prophetic. He took his eyes off the road for a moment to look at me. Instead of thinking to yourself that your actions cost Karen her life, you need to understand that those same actions saved the lives of the rest of us. But she trusted me to keep her safe. You all did. No, don't you see? That's where you're wrong, Sonny said. We trusted you to try. Nothing more. We accepted the risk when we loaded up into the truck. We could have stayed at the academy if we chose to, but if we had, we'd be dead now at the hands of the tigers of the Chinese. About that, I said, running my coat sleeve across my cheeks to dry up the tear tracks, which were quickly icing over. When Chen was trying to get into the academy, he said you owed him and honor demanded you uphold your vows to him. You were a tiger once, right? Not really. But when I first moved to Worcester, I befriended a couple of them who were interested in the martial arts. While I was hanging out with them, Chen, as their leader, would sometimes give me gifts, and he seemed to think that because of the gifts, I now belonged to him. The guy was a complete psycho with little grasp of reality. You saw that for yourself. But he was like that even before the flu. I finally had to cut ties with the tigers that I liked, 
because I couldn't stand the guy. Was Jack one of the tigers you used to hang out with? I asked. No. Chen's little brother Jack used to try to get me to teach him kung fu all the time, but I always turned him down. There was something a little off about him. He was too much like his big brother, I think. He just wanted to learn kung fu to be able to hurt people, not for self-defense. It just had to be him I killed when Luke and I rescued Indigo, I said. I felt some guilt for setting off the whole chain of events when I killed Chen's brother. But the alternative, leaving Indigo at their mercy, didn't bear thinking about. Sad, Sonny said, shaking his head. But not very shocking, given his role models. What about him and the people you've had to kill since? Indigo asked me. I guess she was playing counselor. Are their deaths still bothering you too? Little, I admitted. But not as much as I expected them to. Not as much as failing to protect Sarah or Karen. I think I can accept that I've killed for the right reasons, in self-defense or to protect others, and I'm okay with that. It's just that Chen, well, that was different. More personal somehow. As long as it bothers you, at least a little bit, I think you'll be okay, Sonny said. It's when you stop feeling anything about killing that you're in trouble. What he said, Indigo agreed, giving my shoulder a squeeze of encouragement. From my point of view, I'm glad this Jack guy, and his brother for that matter, are no longer in the world. Well, one good thing came out of it. I got to meet you, I said to her managing to crack a true smile for the first time since we'd left the gas station. And that's that, Sonny said. What's what? Indigo and I both asked at the same time, and my smile grew. We just passed the sign that says, Welcome to New Hampshire, Sonny said. We made it out of Massachusetts at last. Well, that's something, I said. Thank God for small victories. I agree, though perhaps we shouldn't be popping open the champagne just yet, Sonny said. But we've made it further than I actually expected us to when we left. If things keep breaking our way, we might just make it to Drake Mountain to see if there really are survivors there. You have champagne? Indigo asked, teasing. <laughs> Sonny said. You're right, there's a long way to go. Not to mention we aren't 100% sure there really is a safe haven waiting for us. We shouldn't get our hopes up, I said. Since I've met him, Captain Grumpy Pants here has shown he is pretty down on the whole notion of hope, Indigo said, motioning toward me with her head. Captain Grumpy Pants? Do you have any wise words that might help him overcome his fear of hope, Sonny? I don't know. Let me see. How about hope is like a road in the country? There was never a road but when many people walk on it, the road comes into existence. That comes from Lin Yu Tang. Who's that? Indigo asked. I've never heard of him. Lin Yu Tang was one of the most influential Chinese writers of the 20th century, Sonny said. Well, Ben Franklin, an influential American, once said, he that lives on hope will die fasting. It doesn't matter how many roads are made if the people making them are never going to get anywhere. I said, still smiling, though. I see that you can make some claim to knowing the profound thoughts of those who have come before as well, Sonny said, with a short laugh. Not so much, I replied. I wrote a report about witticisms from Poor Richard's Almanac in my English class last year, though, so I can pull a handful of those out if I need them, but that's about it as far as my famous quoting goes. Ah, well... Perhaps someday you'll be able to match my profound wisdom, Sonny said, smiling. I'm going to have to slow down. The snow's falling so much harder here. I think there's a rest stop coming up pretty soon now. Do you think we should stop to stretch our legs and let those in the back use the facilities? Not just those in the back, Indigo said. I could use a pit stop myself. Yeah, we'll stop, I said, looking out at the blowing snow. But we can't stay too long. We'll stretch, use the bathrooms, and then get on the road again. Sounds good to me, Sonny replied, moving over into the far right lane so he could exit when it came up. 
No more than five minutes later, he was pulling off. The rest stop had a small gravel parking lot, two cinder block restrooms, and a snow-covered picnic area. There were three picnic tables and a covered brick barbecue. Sonny pulled the truck up in the parking lot close to the restrooms. As soon as he turned the engine off, I opened my door and ran around to the back of the truck before pounding on the door. Where to rest stop? I called. Anybody who has to use the facilities or just wants to stretch is welcome to do so. I unlatched the handle and pushed the rolling door partway up before a hand grabbed it from inside and helped pull it up. The filtered moonlight revealed Ben's smiling face. I thought you'd never ask. 13. A sleepy Luke and I searched the men's bathroom. We kept the crossbow and pistol at the ready and searched every stall with our flashlights, making sure that nobody or nothing was lurking there to endanger those who needed to go. While we were doing that, Allie and Indigo did the same thing in the ladies' block, Indigo armed with the revolver I'd given her, and Allie with one of the Chinese assault rifles we had. Sonny was waiting in the truck, not wanting to risk turning off the engine. He would go when we were done. You know I only have to pee because you woke my ass up, right? Luke said, shining his flashlight into the final stall. Sonny wanted to stop, and I thought it would be a welcome relief to you guys, too. I said, I know there's no heater back there. There are no gigantic wind tunnels caused by missing windows either, Luke said, stepping into the last stall and began to relieve himself. Heat or not, so far my ride back there has been toasty compared to the time I spent in the passenger seat of that truck. I picked a stall and entered, putting my pistol on the square toilet roll dispenser. I looked up at the cobwebbed, semi-open ceiling as I did my business and was nearly through my long-awaited whiz when a yell from outside made me jump and pee over the rim of the toilet. Don't move! It was sunny. Almost immediately a girl screamed but was immediately drowned out by the deep roar of what could only be an animal. Shit. Adrenaline shot through my system as I desperately finished and pulled up my zipper. I snatched up my gun and ran out of the stall. Luke was already ahead of me and disappeared through the door outside. The sight that greeted me was surreal. It was Allie, frozen to the spot just outside the door to the other cinder block building, holding the assault rifle in quivering hands as she raised it and aimed it at the black bear just a few feet in front of her. Now, I know black bears are supposed to be smaller than grizzlies or brown bears, but this one had reared up on its hind legs and looked massive in the small clearing. It was roaring at Allie, and I have to admit, I was glad I had recently relieved myself because that angry bear was terrifying. I aimed my pistol at it and saw Luke do the same with his crossbow. Don't shoot! A desperate voice called from our left. Indigo had crept up behind Allie and now had a calming hand on her upper arm. Don't shoot him. I had no idea if the bear was a him or a her, and I'm not sure if Indigo did either, but the bear stopped its display of aggression and seemed to be weighing up its options now that it was faced with so many of us. Ben and Brooke were near the back of the truck, Brooke staring in fascinated horror at the wild creature. What do you suggest we do if we're not going to shoot it, Indigo? I asked, genuinely hoping for a non-violent solution to our big furry problem. I think we should make a lot of noise all at the same time to scare him away. You should fire your gun in the air. That should do it. It was almost comical, but the bear seemed to be listening to her, its big brown eyes never leaving her. I definitely didn't want to kill it. Him. Okay, after three, make all the noise you can. If it goes bad, run away as fast as you can, and Luke and I will take him down. Okay? Everyone agreed in apprehensive whispers, and I could see Sonny looking at me from where he sat in the truck with the door half open. He nodded in approval. One, two, three, now! Everyone roared, sang, and yelled at the bear. 
Next to me, Luke was doing some crazy American Indian dance and hopping from one foot to the other as he waved his crossbow wildly over his head. In another time and place, I may have burst out laughing, but as if to emphasize the gravity of the situation, the bear again roared, took a step back, and fell to all four paws before swinging his head from the girls, back to us, then to Ben and Brooke. I believe he may have found Luke's overenthusiastic dance particularly threatening, because he turned back to us and bared his teeth. I knew instantly he was going to charge, and I fired my gun over his head at the exact moment Sonny punched the horn of the truck. The next two seconds were the longest of my life. The bear froze where he was, his big eyes now on me. I lowered my gun until it was pointing at his forehead. Time seemed to slow, and I could hear my heartbeat in my ear. I began to squeeze the trigger as the horn continued to blare in the cold night. Then it was over. The bear turned and trotted off into the trees lining the rest stop as if he didn't have a care in the world. Gone. As simple as that. I exhaled slowly, my breath pluming in the frigid night air, and slowly lowered my weapon. Did you see that? Luke asked incredulously as the others walked over to us. Why the hell isn't he hibernating? He is winter walking, said Indigo. They do that sometimes. Thank goodness, said Ben. Well, I don't know if it was the gunshot or your silly dance that got the better of him, but I think we dodged a bullet there. Yeah, I don't think it was the dancing, though. That just seemed to make him madder, said Brooke, and we all laughed as Luke gave an encore. We spent another ten minutes at the stop while everyone had their toilet breaks. Sonny was the last to go as I stood by the driver's door of the idling truck. I snuck a look at the fuel gauge. It was under a half a tank full now, and I hoped it would be enough to get us close to Campton. Ben approached, gazing up at the sky as he walked. Well, with all this snow and the cloud cover, at least we know they won't be tracking us by satellite, hey? He said, joining me while his twin sister was in the bathroom. Might make it easier to track us on the ground, though, you think? If it keeps snowing like this, there's a decent chance that it'll cover our tracks by morning, I replied. God willing, Ben said. Yeah, as if God cares. Are you planning to stay up front? Unless somebody else really has a burning desire to replace me up there, I said. It's cold and miserable, but does have the advantage of having windows to look out of. I plan to keep my place in the back of the truck, Ben said. Brooke mentioned the same. The supplies are secured better this time, and hopefully there will be no careening off military vehicles and barricades in this next portion of the trip. Well, Sonny actually has a driver's license, so there's a better chance of avoiding such things. Better than with me behind the wheel, at least. Don't beat yourself up about it, mate. You were doing the best you could, yeah? And you managed to get most of us out of there alive and in one piece. Thanks, Ben. That means a lot to me, knowing how you all feel. People keep telling me I'm being too hard on myself. You are, but that's part of who you are and what makes you a good leader, he said, clapping me on the shoulder. Brooke emerged from the female toilets and began limping toward us. Ben glanced over his shoulder. I'm going to help Brooke back to the truck. Talk to you later, mate, Ben said, as he walked over and offered her his arm to lean on. I could tell she was still troubled by her twisted ankle, and I worried it might cause some complications later in the night or the next morning when we finally abandoned the truck. It made me conscious of my own injuries, apart from my stinging cheek, which Indigo had put band-aids over, and some general stiffness and sore ribs. I felt surprisingly okay. Sonny returned from his toilet break after a few minutes, and I made sure everybody was back where they belonged and ready to roll. I pulled the roller door down and latched it, Sonny and Indigo were already back in the cab, so I clambered up into the passenger side seat and closed my door. As the truck started and the headlights came on, I thought about the falling snow and how it seemed to bring bad luck to me ever since leaving the Foster's residence. Where would I be if I'd stayed there? Captured by looters? Or the Chinese? Dead? Perhaps. Who could say? Did you get any encouraging words from Luke? Indigo asked as we pulled back out onto the freeway. Not really, I said, chuckling. 
Not with all the excitement. I'm pretty sure he thinks I'm not without hope. Just a cynical pessimist. I can see that, she replied, smiling as she put her arm back around me and leaned in close for warmth. You think I'm a cynical pessimist? I wouldn't like you so much if you were, she replied, snuggling closer to my shoulder. Someone once said there is nothing more pitiful than a young cynic because they have gone from doing nothing to believing in nothing, Sonny said. I knew he was teasing, but his comment stung a little. That saying was from a world much different to the one we now lived in. Well, there's one good thing about my outlook, I said, deciding not to take it to heart. When good things do unexpectedly happen, I get a pleasant surprise. Like the bear? Asked Indigo. Yeah, that was good and definitely unexpected. All jokes aside, said Sonny, you both did really well back there. You two make a good team. Our eyes met, and Indigo smiled before looking back to the road ahead. After a few more miles, the two sides of the freeway merged together and, with no median between them, became more like a four-lane highway. Soon we saw roads and even driveways coming directly off of it. We continued traveling north at a speed of about 30 miles per hour. It was all the speed Sonny dared, given the swirling snow and limited visibility. It took us nearly half an hour to get to the town of Hillsboro, New Hampshire. Here, the highway we were following merged with another and turned east toward Concord. We were mostly quiet during that leg of the trip. Sonny was concentrating on the road ahead and Indigo snuggled against me with her eyes closed. At one point she began to snore, surprisingly loud for such a sweet girl. So I nudged her a little bit, and she squirmed around and continued sleeping, but at least the snoring stopped. About five or seven miles further up the road, we were going to come to another freeway. Do you think we should stay on the highway, or take the freeway in and through Concord? Sonny asked, as we were leaving Hillsboro behind. I think there's good and bad about taking the freeway, I replied. The fact that they have limited access means we have fewer directions danger can approach from. True enough. But on the other hand, that advantage can turn into a disadvantage because if we do meet trouble on the freeway, there are fewer opportunities for escape. Also true. We are taking a freeway out of Concord, no matter what road we take in, aren't we? That's the plan and maybe it would be easier to get on here, assuming this freeway connects to one leading north. That way we won't have to hunt for freeway entrances while we're navigating through the city. We just skirt around it. Sounds like a decent plan, but what if the Chinese have occupied Concord? It seems likely to me that they'd be watching the freeways more closely than the side roads, Sonny said. Risk versus reward, I guess. Every decision we make has to take those aspects into account. By not taking the freeway, we risk running right into a Chinese patrol on one of the streets of the city with nowhere to run. Let's take the freeway. You're really starting to sound like one sometimes, he replied, glancing at me with a small smile. Starting to sound like what? A leader. Less than ten minutes later, we were approaching the on-ramp to the freeway and Sonny pulled the truck to a stop. At first, I didn't realize why. He was staring at the freeway as it stretched into the distance with an incredulous look on his face. What? I began, before it hit me like a slap in the face. We could see the freeway stretching into the distance because the row of streetlights running along it were blazing, the light reflected by the snow. The freeway glowed, a white ribbon in the middle of a dark night. On this section of road, at least, the Chinese had turned the power back on. Indigo stirred between us and opened her eyes. Lights. Yep, I said. Maybe sticking to the side roads and going through the city would be for the best after all. Part 3. Bloody Nose. 14. We continued on Highway 202. 
It followed the freeway close enough that we could see its lights blazing through the trees. This went on for maybe four miles before the freeway veered off to the southeast, and we continued on toward the heart of Concord. Reaching the outskirts of the city, we saw the freeway was not the only place where streetlights were working, although none of the houses or buildings we passed seemed to have any lights on. The snow was still falling, even thicker now, with the large flakes clumping together in the air. Concord was eerie, the streetlights illuminating what was essentially a ghost town. If the electricity is on, I'd bet a hundred bucks that the Chinese have troops here, Indigo said. I'd say so, but there's not much we can do about it if we want to get to Drake Mountain, Sonny said. Maybe you should turn the headlights off, I said. The snow is reflecting enough light from the streetlights that we don't really need it. He followed my suggestion. The road was still plenty visible in the ambient glow of the streetlights, and hopefully we'd now be less noticeable. Should we stop and ask the others their opinions about this new development, or should we just keep pushing on? I asked. I think push on, said Indigo, with a frown creasing her face. Like Sonny said, there isn't much we can do about it, short of scrapping the trip altogether, and do we really have anywhere else we can go? Could we turn back and loop around, avoiding this city? I asked Sonny. Probably, he said. But it would use up a lot of gas to do that. The roundabout way is long, all the way through Vermont and back. I looked at the gas gauge on the dashboard. It now read a little over a third of a tank. Darn it. This thing gets horrible mileage. What do you expect? It's a rental truck, Sonny said lightly. Look, throw in the fact that we don't know if any other way we go is actually going to be safer than this way or not, and I think it's better we stick with this route. He paused at a traffic light which was blinking red. I was thankful we were the only ones that appeared to be out on this cold night. Maybe we could get some gas, Indigo said. If the lights are working, the pumps might be too. We just need to find a gas station. No, Sonny's right, I said, shaking my head. It would be too dangerous to stop and try and get fuel. I guess we stick to the plan unless we come across a real threat. Okay, we push ahead, Sonny agreed, pulling through the intersection and continuing his drive deeper into the city. Street signs indicated that if we continued down the highway, we'd eventually reach Interstate 93, the freeway that should take us north to Lincoln. From there, we could join the road leading to Drake Mountain Resort. According to Indigo, who was examining the Atlas, it was about 30 miles or more to Campton, where we planned to ditch the truck, and another five from there to Lincoln. Sonny said from Lincoln to the ski lodge, where we assumed the safe haven was, was another couple of miles, so it looked like we'd be walking at least seven miles. I desperately hoped it would stop snowing by then. The drive through Concord was eerie, the emptiness only highlighted by the illumination of the streetlights. I couldn't help looking at the rows of darkened houses, wondering how many dead Americans were entombed in the snow-topped buildings. I shuddered. Indigo saw it first. There's a building with lights on up there, she said, pointing ahead. We might want to take a side street and go around. Following her finger, I saw what looked to be a squat building about two blocks up on the right. There was a neon Budweiser sign lighting up the street in front of it. Sonny slowed the speed of the truck and we inched closer. I could see there were four Humvees parked in the small lot. Clearly, the soldiers were inside the bar, probably enjoying some leisure time. Something about Chinese troops sitting around drinking in an American bar while its former owners rotted in their homes all around them stung me badly. Take the next left, I said to Sonny, then a right and pull over. You want to stop? He asked. I want to take a closer look. Maybe we can learn something. I don't know. It's pretty risky. Are you sure? Well, if nothing else, we might be able to find a way to disable their hummers, I said. That could prevent at least this group from chasing us if we're spotted. He regarded me for a moment, 
a curious look on his face. All right, I guess I'd buy that, he said. He took the next left and then turned right onto a parallel road before pulling into a dark alley. Who are you taking with you? Luke, I said, without even thinking. I'd take you, but we can't both go. We're the only drivers. Besides, you're still not 100%. I'm going too, Indigo said. I can't let you and Luke have all the fun all the time. Are you sure? I asked her. It could be dangerous. No kidding, she said, crossing her arms. Don't worry about me. I can pull my weight. I never said you couldn't, but... I said. The next words kind of tumbled out of my mouth without me thinking. It's just that I like you. A lot, actually, and I'd hate if anything happened. My sentence was cut off when she leaned over and put her lips on mine. Excitement shot through me like a bolt of electricity. I like you too, Isaac, she said, as she pulled away, smiling. And I don't want you to get hurt either. But that's not going to stop you from going, is it? I guess not, I said, my face glowing. Suddenly the night didn't seem so cold anymore, and I wondered how Luke would feel when he found out Indigo had stolen a kiss from me. All right, I said. I guess just be careful and I'll try to do the same. Deal. So, let's get Luke and get started. We said our goodbyes to Sonny, who told us he would keep the truck running, but he was going out to stretch after the long drive. We also agreed that if we weren't back in half an hour, he would assume the worst and leave without us. Indigo and I climbed out of the truck and went around to the back. Luke was already crouching by the door, holding his crossbow as I opened it. What's up? He asked, and then I saw his eyes widen as he saw the streetlights. The power's on? I take it this isn't just another whiz stop, then. He jumped down and the others looked on with interest. We're in Concord, I said. The Chinese have occupied it, but we didn't have a choice about going around. Anyway, there's a bunch of Humvees at a bar around the corner, and it looks like they're letting their hair down inside. We're going to go on foot and check it out. All right, who's going? Me, you, and Indigo. Indigo? Yes, Indigo, unless you want to take it up with her. Luke took one look at Indigo's determined face and shook his head. Nope, all good here. Okay. So we'll see if we can scavenge anything they might have out there and maybe learn something about their number and positioning in the city. But our main goal is going to be to disable the Humvees so they can't chase after us when we leave town. Ben jumped out and I could tell by the look on his face he was disappointed he wouldn't be going. Ben, I need you to stay here and guard the truck. If we're not back in 30 minutes, you and Sonny will be continuing without us. Okay, just make sure you're back he said simply. We said our goodbyes and were turning to go when Brooke called out for us to wait. She jumped down and hugged each of us in turn. Luke was last and their hug seemed to linger. He avoided eye contact as we walked to the corner, but his red face and the knowing look Indigo had shared with Brooke said it all. I guess I didn't have to worry about him trying to impress Indigo after all. We stayed in the shadows as much as possible as we made our way around the block to the bar. I gave Luke a whispered account of our trip since the encounter with the bear, only leaving out the part where Indigo had kissed me. The fresh snow was already nearly four inches deep here, and it was resting on a half inch of older, compacted snow beneath it, and our boots made squelching noises as we walked. Reaching the corner of the main road, we could hear the beat of music and laughter even though the bar was still another block away. There didn't appear to be anyone guarding the vehicles in the parking lot. Why would there be? What exactly did they have to guard against? Hopefully, we could take advantage of their complacency. We should cross the street and sneak up along the front of those buildings, Luke said. We don't want to be exposed in the street when we get close to that place. Good idea. I looked both ways to make sure we weren't being observed before ushering Luke and Indigo across the street. We moved carefully in the snow and gathered under the awning of a drugstore on the other side. I'm glad you remembered to look both ways, Indigo said. I wasn't looking for traffic, I started, 
then realized by her cheeky smile that she was ribbing me. Well, Mom always told me, you never can be too careful. Their faces told me immediately that my attempt to continue the banter had fallen flat, and I made a mental note not to mention moms to people who have recently lost theirs. The window of the drugstore was intact, and I could see the shelves were still fairly well stocked. If we'd had more time, we probably could have raided it for supplies. We crept as stealthily as we could towards the bar, in a vain attempt to prevent our boots from making too much noise. The snow was still falling just as hard as before, but now a cold wind had begun to pick up, blowing straight down Main Street. We were close enough to make out the music now. It was country and western. Luke raised a hand, bringing us to a stop. Are they really listening to country music? Are we sure these are Chinese soldiers? Who else would they be? I asked. As silly as it was, even that one little question planted a seed of hope in my mind. Could it be Americans who had switched the power on? Had the flu been stopped before it wiped out the whole country? Well, there's only one way to find out, Indigo said. Let's get closer. We're still half a block away. Luke started forward again and we followed single file, our backs against the front of the buildings that lined this side of the street. We stopped at the corner opposite the bar and watched it from the shadows. The Grand Slam Bar and Grill looked as lively as it had probably been before the flu. Now that we were closer, we could see there were two more Humvees parked back where we couldn't see them from further down the highway. Humvees which clearly displayed the Chinese flag. I swallowed my disappointment, even though deep down I had known it would be the case. Six Humvees. If they were manned like the one at the gas station, we were looking at upwards of 36 soldiers in the bar. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea, Luke said quietly. He had obviously crunched the numbers, too. They're all inside, and the windows of the bar are frosted and painted with baseball logos, I said, knowing we would never get as good a chance again to do some damage to the Chinese. I don't know said Luke, unconvinced. It'll be fine. We'll be okay as long as they don't all come out at once, and from what we can hear, I don't think that'll happen. We have to try and at least cripple the Hummers, Luke. Look, they have machine guns in the ring mounts, just like the one from the gas station. Those things would tear the back of our truck to shreds if they came up behind us on the freeway. Sure, said Indigo. Let's do it. Luke still didn't look keen on the idea, but before he could say anything, we were interrupted by some atrociously off-key singing. The troops had clearly broken out the karaoke machine. We looked at each other and burst into giggling. Okay, I'm in, said Luke, knuckle-bumping us each in turn. I can't let that horrible singing go unpunished. Great, that'll keep them busy and cover any noise we make. Come on. I said and started across the street, moving as fast as I dared in the snow. Indigo and Luke followed closely behind. When we reached the parking lot of the bar, we crouched down by the front fender of the Hummer furthest away from the door. Indigo kept watch on the building while I scanned the streets, and Luke reached up to try the driver's side door. It wasn't locked. He opened it slowly and looked around inside. We could hop in and just drive it away, he whispered. It doesn't even need keys. It has a push-button ignition. Is there anything we can use in there? Not really. Only an extra box of ammo from the machine gun in the back seat. If you wanted to, we could climb in and rip up the other Humvees with the machine gun. That would cripple them for sure. That would make a racket that even drunk singing soldiers couldn't ignore. Crap! Indigo snapped. Get down! We dropped, and Luke quietly closed the Hummer's door as the Chinese soldier Indigo had seen come through the door of the bar came stumbling down the front steps. My heart played a staccato rhythm in my chest as we watched the soldier through the grimy glass of the Hummer's windows. He was obviously drunk and wore a trench coat, which marked him as a conscript. Thankfully, he didn't seem to be paying attention to anything except trying to get his pants unzipped. He didn't even glance our way as he reeled a few steps along the wall on unsteady legs. Just as I thought he was about to fall, he came to a stop and propped himself against the wall and relieved himself. 
after what seemed like the world's longest whiz, he re-zipped his pants and then turned to stumble back to the bar. That was when Indigo dropped the revolver onto the snow-powdered pavement. She snatched it up immediately, looking horrified, but the damage had been done. Unfortunately, her fumble had come right in the break between songs, and the soldier stopped instantly at the sound. We ducked down, and my bruised ribs protested as I flattened to the snow-covered asphalt. I could see his booted feet from that position, and for the longest time, he stood in one spot as I silently encouraged him to go back into the bar. Of course, he didn't. The boots turned our way and began a stumbling walk along the line of vehicles toward the one we were hiding behind. I scrambled to my knees and frantically waved the others to the rear of the Humvee. Hiding behind the Hummer, Luke raised his crossbow to me with a question in his eyes. I shook my head. We couldn't risk the soldier screaming if Luke's shot didn't kill him outright. It was then I realized that our footsteps and scuffs from hiding in the snow would be plainly visible when the soldier rounded the front of the truck. I made a quick decision and looked around frantically. There was a garden a few feet away that bordered the rear of the parking lot and my eyes fell upon a smooth, fist-sized rock. I stooped and ran to it and picked it up before running back to the others. I hefted it in my hand and indicated I was going to run around the truck and come up behind the soldier. Be careful, Indigo mouthed her eyes big and scared. I nodded and darted to the left rear corner of the Hummer just in time to see the soldier pass in front of the vehicle. I ran forward and stopped at the front fender before peeking carefully over the top. The soldier stood on the spot, swaying and looking down at the scuffed snow and prints where we had ducked to the ground. Almost in slow motion, I saw his gaze follow our footprints to the rear of the truck. He reached for his sidearm, and suddenly didn't seem quite so drunk as he took a step towards the rear, where Luke and Indigo were hiding. I made my move. Fifteen. To be honest, I am probably lucky he was drunk. He didn't even twitch as I brought the rock down hard on the back of his neck. Just fell, as though boneless, to the snow-crusted ground. I stood over him, my chest heaving, but he didn't move. Come help me, I whispered. Nice work, Isaac, said Luke as he came around to me. We each grabbed an arm and dragged the soldier to the rock garden and dumped him there. Check the back of the Hummer, too. Maybe there will be something useful in there, I said to Luke, before scanning the street to make sure nobody was coming. Indigo watched the bar door again. We all knew his buddies might come looking for the missing soldier at any moment. Luke rummaged in the back of the Hummer, and a few moments later came back to us, carrying a long, sturdy wooden crate with Chinese characters on the side. With a grunt, he gently set down his heavy load and rushed back to the rear before closing the hatch and returning. This time, he was holding a length of what looked like rubber hose with some sort of pump attached to one end. Pay dirt in a trunk, boss, he whispered. What's that? I asked. Fuel siphon, he said, holding up the hose. We can drain the tanks of these babies dry. They won't be following us any place. How do you know it's for siphoning fuel? It was in a box that said fuel siphon, he said, grinning. Wise ass. How long will that take? I don't have a clue, man, he said. I guess in the neighborhood of five minutes a truck, give or take a few, depending on how much diesel is in the tanks. There are three of us, and I'd guess each Humvee has one of these in the back, so we could probably get all six done in about ten or fifteen minutes if we all pitched in. What's in the box? Indigo asked. Well, I don't read Chinese, but if that's what I think it is, it's going to come in real handy. Like an excited kid on Christmas morning, he pulled a long hunting knife out of the pocket of his ski pants and began to jimmy the top off. Another time and place, I may have asked where he had gotten the knife, but I was on edge, worried that at any moment another soldier might come out looking for their missing comrade. The lid came off with a soft splintering sound, and he brushed away the styrofoam beads to reveal a compact rocket launcher and three shiny rockets. 
Yes, Luke said triumphantly. It's a reusable launcher. He pulled the weapon out of the crate and hefted it before resting it against his shoulder as he flipped the sight open. Pass me a grenade, please, Indigo. Grenade? Yeah, they're not really rockets. They're self-propelled grenades. She handed him the grenade, which just looked like a rocket without the fins to me. Once again, I was amazed at his knowledge of weapons he really should have no clue about. Within a few seconds, he had the launcher loaded and hanging over his shoulder. He handed me and Indigo a spare grenade each. As I looked down on the deadly package in my hand, an idea began to formulate in my head. Screw the siphoning. We don't have time, I said. Besides, I think it's about time to get one back for our country. They both looked at me. Isaac, said Indigo, reading my mind. You can't. It would be murder. As much as I craved her approval, on this one I wasn't going to be swayed. I shook my head. You've seen what they've done to our country, Indigo. To our parents. What about all the kids who have starved? The babies. The babies who died starving in their cots as their parents rotted in the same house. That was murder. I saw a tear run down her cheek, and even though I was confident I was right, I felt like a low bastard for making her cry. She nodded and wiped her tears away with the back of her hands. Fine. You're the leader. It was clear it wasn't fine, though. I resisted the urge to try and justify my stance further. Come on, I said softly. Let's cross to the other side of the road. Luke picked up his crossbow and repocketed the knife before we headed across the main road at a jog. We crouched behind a snow-covered Chevy sedan directly opposite the front of the bar. Luke placed his crossbow on the pavement and reached into his parka pocket again, this time pulling out two small yellow objects, stuffing them in his ears one at a time. Earplugs? I seriously had to find out what else he had in those pockets of his. There was still no movement from the bar, just the muted sounds of country music and off-key singing. Can you get one through the glass of the front window? And will one do it? I said as loudly as I dared. He smiled grimly and nodded. These things are designed to stop tanks, he said, propping the rocket launcher against his right shoulder. One will do it. Put your fingers in your ears. These things are loud. He flipped the sight open. Ready? He asked. I nodded. I took a deep breath and held it. Without warning, the door of the bar opened and spilled light out onto the snow-covered parking lot as the silhouette of another Chinese soldier emerged. Shit. Thankfully, the door closed behind him, and as my eyes adjusted, I saw him looking around and calling out clearly looking for the soldier we had taken down. Still a go? Luke asked me in a calm voice. In answer, I pulled my revolver out and gave a sharp nod. After three. One, two, three. There was a loud clap and whoosh that echoed off the empty buildings. I felt a quick burst of heat behind me, but all my attention was taken by the brief and bright journey of the grenade. Luke's aim was true, whether through luck or skill, I'm not sure, but it hit the window dead center and the windows and doors blew out in a spectacular blast. We ducked as glass fell around us like sharp rain. When it was safe, I looked back over the hood of the Chevy and saw the soldier who had emerged just before the blast staggering to safety behind a Hummer, a pistol in his hand. No one else emerged from the smoking building. I stood up and walked around the rear of the Chevy, and began to cross the road. Luke called to me, but I knew this had to be done. We couldn't have anyone radioing for help. Even in the unlikely scenario, the blast hadn't been heard or seen by any nearby patrols or soldiers. I was protected from his line of sight by the vehicles in the lot, and knew at this point he would be in a state of shock. I didn't think he would be looking to fight. I walked calmly to the first Humvee and crouched, resting my back against it. I heard a door open a few cars along. He's in the Hummer too, across from you, Luke yelled, his voice loud even over the crackling and popping of the burning building. I moved quickly and ran out from my position with my gun in front of me, squeezing shots as soon as I had him in sight. 
He was in the Hummer and had just raised the bike to his mouth. My first shot missed, but the second hit his shoulder, and the next got him in the chest as he slumped forward. The horn started blaring. I stood where I was for a minute. My gun trained on him, but he didn't move again. With my weapon still aimed at him, I walked slowly around to his door and pulled it open. He was dead. I pocketed my gun and used two hands to pull him away from the wheel. The horn cut out into a silence interrupted only by the crackling of the fire. There was a semi-automatic rifle on the floor of the cab under his feet. I grabbed it. I had a feeling we would need all the firepower we could get in the next few hours. I ran back to Indigo and Luke, who were ready to roll, and we headed back to the truck as fast as we could in the icy conditions. The others had obviously heard the explosion. They surrounded us when we got back, their looks of concern turning to relief. All except Sonny. What the hell happened? Sonny asked. A little taken aback by his sharp tone, I brushed past. We need to move, I said. I'll explain when we're on the road. Everybody, back in the truck. Indigo asked Luke if they could swap places so she could go in back. She was withdrawn, and I knew she was upset with me. It was strange to think that just twenty minutes ago she had kissed me on the lips, and now we weren't even talking. I have to admit I was kind of relieved when she got in the back, both because I would have Luke up front, but mainly so I could avoid discussing what had happened with her. In just a couple of minutes, we were moving again. From the corner of my eye, I saw Sonny glaring at me. Well... We just took out a whole platoon with a rocket launcher, Luke blurted, clearly excited at the evening's events. Sounded like it, too, he said bitterly. Haven't you guys ever heard of stealth? We're going to have the whole damn Chinese army hot on our asses now. I was silent for a moment. It was crucial not to get into a fight at this point. We needed to be a cohesive unit. In calm tones, I explained what had happened and also my reasoning to Sonny. Whether he agreed, or whether he just decided to let it go because he didn't want to fight, he left it at that. But I could tell he wasn't a happy camper. We continued along the back roads a few blocks before turning onto the main street again. It would turn into the highway once we left Concord. Sonny drove as fast as he deemed safe in the conditions. We didn't see any other sign of occupation, and I began to think the group of soldiers at the bar may have been the only presence in the small city. A few minutes later, the searchlight of a helicopter piercing the night about two miles to our right disabused me of that idea. It was clearly headed to the scene of our recent show of defiance. Luke and I craned our necks to watch its progress, but it didn't turn in our direction. We breathed a collective sigh of relief. I wish this thing could go faster, Luke said. It could, said Sonny, but we don't want to draw attention to ourselves if we do happen to pass any Chinese vehicles. There was a slight lull in the snowfall as we reached the intersection where the highway joined another major road to turn and follow the river. Sonny took a left, following the sign that pointed the way to Interstate 93. An incident-free half hour later, we were on the freeway headed north. The ease of our passage led to happy optimism, with Luke cracking jokes and telling us what he would eat when we arrived at the safe haven. I hoped fervently that it really did exist. We didn't exactly have a plan B. We didn't see the vehicle that had come up behind us until I saw the headlights in the passenger side mirror, barely a hundred yards back. Crap, I said. We have company. 16. We were only five minutes beyond the outskirts of the city. I felt the buoyant mood in the cab dissipate like smoke. Sonny swore under his breath. What do we do? I asked, scowling into the mirror as I pulled my gun out again. We just keep driving, nice and steady, Sonny said, placing his hand on my gun. You two get down in the footwell. Luke and I awkwardly climbed down onto the floor. I somehow ended up on top of him, my elbow accidentally poking him in the butt as I tried to keep my gun hand free. I didn't know you cared. He cracked, and in my adrenaline-wired state, he almost brought a giggle from me. 
The laugh was choked from me when the car following us moved into the center lane and came up alongside the truck. I watched Sonny from my vantage on the floor. He stayed focused on the road ahead, but when it was clear the occupants of the vehicle had slowed to the pace of the truck, he looked down at them and waved. They didn't pass us, though, and just as I was thinking the game was up, he put a hand to his ear and made a strange face, as though trying to understand something. I heard him make an ah sound, and he reached and flicked the lights on, waving gratefully to the SUV. They tooted their horn and after a few worrying seconds, sped up and passed us before shooting off. They're gone, Sonny said. Luke and I struggled back into our seats. My bad with the headlights. Maybe they would have just passed if I hadn't made the call earlier to switch them off while we were driving, I said. I can't believe they didn't try and pull us over. This truck is pretty damaged, Luke said. I don't know, Sonny said. We got lucky, I guess. Maybe seeing me in the driver's seat allayed any suspicions they might have had about the damage? If I had to guess, I would say that was a government vehicle, not military, and they were probably in a hurry. We still need to be wary of heat from your little escapade back in Concord, though. Yep, we dodged another bullet, said Luke. You played it real cool, Sonny. Well done. I'm worried about the road ahead, though. What if they have some sort of checkpoint or base up I-95? If there is, we're screwed, I said. I think maybe we should take the truck all the way into Lincoln. It's the only disguise we have. If a military vehicle passes us while we're walking along the freeway on foot, you know for sure they'll take us. At least in the truck, we have some chance. I'm still worried it'll make us easier to track if the Chinese find the truck further along our route. But it'll certainly be a safer and warmer trip, said Sonny. Why don't we take it all the way to Drake Mountain? Luke asked. Too risky. If there are refugees there or nearby, we might lead the Chinese right to them, Sonny said. Yeah. We'll have to walk at least a few miles in the snow either way. Worse than that, Sonny said, the road from Lincoln to Drake Mountain Resort is all uphill. This is not going to be fun, said Luke. I could almost hear the groan in his voice. The snow resumed what could reasonably be called dumping down again, and we rode in silence for about fifteen minutes, each lost in our own thoughts. I dared to hope we might make it to our destination without any other encounters with the Chinese. It was not to be, however. We had just passed a sign proclaiming it was five miles until we reached the exit to Lincoln when we saw four sets of headlights speeding from the opposite direction toward Concord. Uh-oh, said Luke. Those are most definitely Hummers, and they're in a real hurry. The word is out. We watched as a line of vehicles sped past. For a second, I thought we were safe, and then I saw one slow and turn onto the snow-covered grass strip that separated us from them. Luke and I craned our necks to watch it. He's definitely coming for us, said Luke unnecessarily. Sonny didn't need any more encouragement and immediately planted his foot. We put some distance between us and them as the Hummer slipped and slid across the grass before finally skidding back onto the tarmac. The truck's engine whined in protest at Sonny's heavy foot and maxed out at 65 mph. The headlights of the Hummer closed the gap quicker than seemed fair, and I found myself leaning forward as if trying to help propel the truck. The wind whistled through the broken windows. My ears were numb and I wished I was wearing a beanie and earmuffs. Miraculously, once it caught up with us, the pursuing vehicle slowed, so it maintained about a 200-foot gap between us. Why aren't they pulling us over? I shouted. I think they called for assistance, Sonny yelled over the howling wind. There's another set of headlights coming up behind the first. That explained it. They were waiting for the second Hummer before they ran us off the road. If their commanders had put two and two together, they would know we were the same truck which had busted up their roadblock and that we had struck again at the bar. I reloaded the empty chambers of my gun, and Luke held his crossbow cocked in his hand. The rocket launcher was at his feet, along with the remaining two grenades. I felt a sinking feeling as the headlights of the second Hummer caught up with the first. 
The first one moved into the left lane and sped up as both vehicles began to close in on us. There's the ramp, Sonny called. I turned back to the highway and was surprised to see we were closing on the off-ramp pretty quickly. Just another two minutes and we would make it. Sonny stomped the accelerator to the floor of the truck and managed to eke out another few miles an hour. It wasn't enough. The Hummer in the left lane drew up beside us and matched our speed. Sonny twisted the wheel sharply, crashing into its front fender. Metal screeched for a few scary seconds, and then the Chinese vehicle braked and slowed as Sonny veered back into his own lane, swerving this way and that to prevent the Hummer coming up on us again. His evasive driving bought us the time we needed, and he waited until the last second before he took the turn onto the off-ramp without slowing. Luke and I gripped the dashboard, but we were still thrown in the air hard enough to bump our heads on the ceiling of the cab. I heard muffled squealing from our people in the back. Sonny sped towards a set of blacked-out traffic lights and slowed only slightly as he took a wide turn into the two-lane road that bisected Lincoln and the freeway. The truck leaned sickeningly but righted itself with a heavy bump. Luke took a quick look back through his broken window. They're still hot on our tails. The good news, though, is their Hummers don't have machine guns on the top, he reported. I was thankful that he hadn't thought of trying to take a pot shot at them with the rocket launcher. We couldn't afford to waste a shot. I was pretty sure we were going to need everything we had very soon. I was thinking furiously. We had to lose these guys or we were screwed. We couldn't continue to outrun them, and pretty soon they'd probably call in air support. I made a quick decision. Sonny, take a right into the next alley you see. Are you sure that's a good idea? We'll be trapped if it's not open at the other end. We have to try something. We can't risk them calling in air support. All right, what do you have in mind? Luke. Make sure your rocket launcher is ready to fire. If we can disable the one in front, it'll block the second from following us. Here, take this one, Sonny. I gestured wildly to the narrow alley coming up fast on our right. The tire screeched as he swung us into it and I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw that it was open at the other end. The truck narrowly squeezed past a large dumpster. Pull up here, I yelled. Luke and I jumped out just as the first Hummer pulled into the alley and he began to bring the rocket launcher up into firing position. Wait. Help me move the dumpster first. We heaved it into the middle of the alley as the second Hummer turned in behind the first. The lead vehicle screeched to a halt about fifty feet away and Chinese soldiers began to pile out as we ducked back behind the dumpster. I took a breath. About to scream fire. I didn't need to. The launcher was already nestled against Luke's shoulder. When the soldiers saw Luke, they stopped in their tracks and turned. One of them managed to squeeze off a burst from their weapons as they retreated. I ducked as bullets whizzed by and thunked into the dumpster. Luke didn't flinch at the hail of bullets and calmly pulled the trigger. The rocket launcher jerked in his arm and the grenade zeroed in on the front grill of the Hummer. There followed an almighty whomp and a burst of heat as the front of the Hummer exploded, the whole vehicle jumping into the air a few feet before crashing back to the pavement. Without exception, all the soldiers who had jumped from the vehicle were cut down by the blast. The twisted, smoking wreckage of the vehicle now blocked the alley. I heard shots being fired from behind the smoking wreck. Quick, back to the truck! I yelled to Luke. He looked a little dazed, so I grabbed his arm, dragging him along as we ran for the truck. As we passed, I could hear voices calling from inside the cargo bay. Stay down flat on the floor until I give you the all clear! I yelled. Luke and I piled back into the truck cabin, and Sonny had it moving before I had even pulled the door shut. He took a sharp left at the end of the alley, causing the truck to lurch treacherously again. Once more, I heard muffled screams in the back and was thankful I wasn't in the cargo bay. Indigo would surely be regretting her decision to ride in back. If we managed to get out of this, they would again be a bruised and sorry group of people. Luke gasped audibly as the truck righted itself. Are you okay? I asked. Luke was a pale guy at the best of times, but his face was the color of ash now. He smiled ruefully at me and pulled his heavy parka open. Honey, I forgot to duck, he said. My heart sunk when I saw the bullet wound. The round had taken him in the abdomen, and blood was seeping steadily from the wound. Sonny took another left and Luke flinched. We were headed back to the main road. I don't think it went through, man. He lifted his parka at the back and turned so I could see. He was right. It hadn't. I felt tears sting my eyes. 
My best friend was shot and we had no way to care for him. Even gut shot. His crooked smile was still in place. Don't worry, Chief. It is going to take more than a little lead to bring me down. Get something on that to staunch the bleeding, Sonny ordered. The first aid kit is in the glove box. We turned right onto the main road and Sonny again floored the accelerator. There was no sign of the second Hummer, but I knew it was only a matter of time before they were tailing us again. I pulled out the kit and sopped up the blood as best I could. His wound didn't seem to be bleeding too badly, thankfully, but I knew an abdomen shot was supposed to be one of the worst. I put two gauze pads against the wound and covered it with an adhesive bandage. Luke didn't crack a joke, which told me how bad it really was. We're almost out of Lincoln, said Sonny. We need to dump the truck. It'll be harder for them to trace us on foot. I argued for driving on, debating it would be too hard on the wounded. But in the end, a pair of headlights in the distance behind us won the argument for him. Again, luck was on our side. One of the last buildings on our side of the street was a three-story office building, and we turned down the side street and then down into its underground parking garage. Sonny pulled up short of the boom gate. Jump out and put it up, Isaac. I don't want to smash through it, as it will lead them a clue if they happen to look down here. I jumped out and pulled up the boom gate, allowing the truck to drive past before easing it back down, then followed the ramp down into the darkened garage. I joined Sonny and Luke at the back of the truck as they pulled the door up. We were greeted by a rush of questions and did our best to answer as we ushered our shaken passengers out. Thankfully, Indigo took my hand when I offered it, but we separated without saying anything once she was on her feet. Luke was surprisingly mobile, considering his wound. He had been shot and was still trooping on. It made me ashamed of the groaning I had done over my bruised ribs. I left the rocket launcher in the truck. Luke said, Sorry, I won't be able to carry it. What's wrong? Asked Brooke, weaving her way to Luke. I got shot, he said, the same way he might have said he'd stubbed his toe. He pulled his parka open. Brooke clapped her hand over her mouth and immediately began fussing over him as the others joined. Don't worry, I, I don't think it hit anything vital, I heard him say as I went to the front of the truck to grab the rocket launcher. Indigo came up to me and we looked at each other awkwardly as I put its carry strap over my shoulder. Are you okay, Isaac? Yeah, I'm good. How about you? Yeah, shaken but not stirred, she said with a small smile before we headed back to the others. My people gathered what we could carry from the truck and then headed to the rear of the small parking garage. My people. I think I had finally come to terms with the fact that I had a new place to belong. Well, not a place exactly, but a family of sorts. It's funny how adversity can bring strangers closer than blood. We talked quickly about heading as fast as we could to the tree line and then made our way up a set of steps into the lane behind the building and began walking. We froze in place just before we emerged from behind the building when we heard the engine of what could only be the second Hummer speeding down the main street. It passed our position speeding along the highway, its occupants assuming correctly that we were headed in that direction, but not realizing we had ditched our transportation. They'll be back before long, said Sonny. Once they work out, they should have caught us up. We continued to follow the road, sticking to the tree line even though the traveling was much harder. We had been trudging for about ten minutes when we heard the rumble of a motor, coming back down the mountain. Quick, everyone down, I yelled. We all managed to get down to our knees in the scrub and behind trees before the same Humvee that had passed us came back towards Lincoln. It was traveling much slower this time the occupants obviously scanning the area as they retraced their path. It seemed to take forever for them to pass, and I didn't realize I had been holding my breath until my lungs began to burn. I counted out two minutes before I waved everyone to their feet and we set off again. There were a few farmhouses along this part of the highway, but they were few and far between and dwindled away as the road got steeper and gave way to light forest. Even with our wounded people and loaded up with what we were carrying, the walk up the mountain was not as bad as I thought it would be. But despite the relative ease, I could see Luke's strength beginning to fade, even as he leant against Brooke. I moved in beside him and ordered him to put his free arm around my shoulder. He looked like he was going to protest, 
but did as I asked. We walked on, and I prayed desperately that the safe haven we had traveled so far for actually existed. There was no backup plan. It had to be there. 17. It had begun snowing lightly when we arrived in Lincoln, and now, as we trudged through the trees, our shoes crunching through about six inches of snow, it began to fall harder. That was when I heard the unmistakable sound of a helicopter coming from the direction of the small city we had left behind. I shook my head in resignation as we all stopped and looked back down the mountain and over Lincoln. Brooke pointed out the searchlight, which was sweeping from left to right as it followed the highway through the small city. Luke reached over, wincing at the movement, and tapped the rocket launcher. You might need this soon, he whispered. I nodded, and we set off again, a little more purpose in our steps. I tried not to look back as the noise of the chopper got closer and closer, but eventually the sound changed slightly, and I realized it was now taking a more direct route, straight up the mountain. We were all puffing hard, both through exertion and fear, when we finally reached a sign that read, Drake Mountain Ski Resort. We left the tree line of the highway and hurried across a long concrete bridge. The chopper sounded even closer now, and when I looked back, I could also see the splash of headlights illuminating the trees from road level. The second hummer. God damn it. We were so close. We rushed across the bridge and around a bend, and there it was. Our supposed safe haven. The ski lodge sat a couple hundred yards away, in a natural depression. Its windows were dark, a lot of them broken. The lodge was clearly abandoned. Brooke began to cry softly, and Luke cursed under his breath. Feeling as hopeless as anyone, I urged them on with Sonny bringing up the rear and shouting words of reassurance. Even if the safe haven didn't exist, we still needed any protection the abandoned lodge would afford us. We had just made it through the open gates in the stone fence of the lodge when the chopper's engine made a high-pitched whine as it picked up speed. They had spotted us. Keep going! I screamed at the others, pushing them ahead as it roared toward us. Luke and I turned to face the enemy. Sonny paused too, but I told him to get the others to shelter. Be careful, Isaac! Indigo called as she passed me. I looked at her, wondering if it was for the last time. Help me get this thing loaded, Luke. We squatted on the ground and I handed Luke the grenade. Even though clearly suffering, he deftly loaded the weapon and pulled out the sight before falling onto his backside, panting. He pointed at the trigger. Don't pull it too soon, and aim a little above the chopper. The trajectory will drop after the initial. I didn't hear the rest of his words. I turned as the chopper closed in. The bright circle of light from the spotlight trailed over the uneven ground, heading right toward us. I placed the rocket launcher against my shoulder. I looked quickly down at Luke in time to see him collapse face down on the ground, a bloom of blood soaking the snow around him. At the sight of my friend, a sob wrenched my throat, and my eyes blurred with tears. I raised the weapon and took aim at the chopper as the distant screech of tires indicated the Hummer had also arrived. I didn't allow my concentration to waver, even as the Hummer's headlights illuminated the entire area. 18. I squeezed the trigger and was promptly knocked to my ass by the concussion of the blast. The weapon fell from my hands and sizzled in the snow beside me as I watched the trajectory of the grenade with my ears ringing. It flew at the chopper and missed it completely. Frustration and anger burned through me as its fiery trail etched a line across the night sky before it arced back to earth and exploded harmlessly in the forest. The chopper pilot had veered needlessly away from the wayward shot, and I was climbing to my feet as he steadied the aircraft. Its spotlight found me. I'd had enough. I was done. I pulled the revolver from my pocket and stalked toward the chopper, firing shot after shot until the firing mechanism clicked on empty chambers. Even then, I continued pulling the trigger. Come on! 
I screamed up at it and waited for hot lead to tear me apart. That's when the world exploded. Again, I found myself on my backside, staring dumbfounded as the helicopter, now in flames, began plummeting to the ground with all the grace of a brick dropped from a ladder. I registered the white-clad figures running in from all directions, even the fact that one of them was carrying a smoking rocket launcher, but I didn't pause to look more closely. I scrambled to my feet and ran back to Luke, falling over him just as the chopper hit the ground a hundred yards from us, throwing up debris and snow. When I felt it was safe... I started to climb off my friend and found myself staring into the muzzle of a machine gun. I looked up, half expecting to see a Chinese face standing over me. It wasn't. It was a middle-aged, American man. The first non-Chinese person over the age of 16. In more than a month. Do not move! He screamed down at me as I looked up at him with wide eyes. Behind him, the enemy hummer screeched to a stop and soldiers began to pile out. The men standing over me didn't even flinch and it became obvious why soon enough. The Chinese soldiers weren't aware of the danger they were in and were cut down mercilessly in a one-sided firefight that lasted all of five seconds. The men in white camouflage immediately secured the area. Throw down your weapons and place your hands on your head! yelled a gruff voice from the direction of the lodge. I looked over. My people were placing their guns on the ground and putting their hands in the air as the men in white closed in on them. Do it! Now! I could see Sonny still held his semi-automatic and I held my breath, not exhaling until he finally bent over and placed it carefully on the snow-crusted grass in front of him. I snuck a closer look at the man standing over me. He was armed with what looked to me like a U.S. military-issue M-16 and also had the telltale haircut of a military man. These guys were U.S. Army. But how could they be? I tried to stop him when he bent over and reached for Luke's throat. He brushed me away. Easy, son. He felt for Luke's pulse and immediately called out. We have a casualty over here. I need a medic and a stretcher. Two men materialized with a fold-up stretcher, and I watched them carefully lift my friend onto it as the man led me over to the rest of my group. As we joined them, still with their hands in the air, the two men carrying Luke jogged past us and through the open door of the lodge. Where are they taking him? Sonny asked. He's in good hands. If he can be saved, the doc will save him, said the gray-haired man who had ordered the others to put down their weapons. His features looked like they were cut from granite, and there was an air of authority about him. We came because we heard the Morse code message on the radio, I called as I was pushed into the huddle. We're looking for sanctuary, not trouble. Looking at the men, I reassessed my initial impression. Not all of these men were soldiers. Not by any stretch. You can't take them in, Randall. They're spies. A man with a long, bushy beard and his gut straining against the material of his white uniform pushed forward. Hell, they led the fuckers right to us. They even brought one of the chinks with them. We should waste them now. Watch your fucking mouth, Leroy, or I'll waste you. Randall snapped. The fat hillbilly was only able to hold the fierce stare of the older man for a few seconds before looking down at his feet. We're going to take them to the professor, Randall addressed all his men, just like we do for anyone who answers the signal. I took a closer look at Randall, impressed by his handling of the loudmouth. He looked fit and hard, although he was by far the oldest man in the group, clearly military or ex-military, and obviously the leader. He looked us over with steel-blue eyes. Each of you stay right where you are. A couple of my men are going to come and search you. If you make any move at all I consider threatening, you'll be shot, no questions asked. Do you understand? We all nodded. I understood the words, of course, but was struggling to understand why this was happening. Had the message been a trap all along? Or were they just being overly cautious? As the men stepped forward to search us, I realized they were a real mix. Some white, some black, at least one of them looked Hispanic. There were no Chinese men among them, not even a vaguely Asian-looking person. There were also no women, for that matter. My brain worked furiously, trying to figure this out. Had these people avoided exposure to the Pyongyang flu? Or were they somehow immune? Could there be some sort of vaccine against it? 
I had hoped we might find safety and answers here at Drake Mountain, but so far we had only found danger and more questions. The men quickly patted us down and checked our bags, confiscating blades and anything else that might be used against them, before collecting our firearms from the floor. Sonny soon had a scattering of knives and shuriken on the floor by his feet. Indigo's revolver was taken away as well. While we were being searched, I noticed another group of men cleaning up the mess left by the firefight. I had to admit, they were quick and efficient. Clearly, they wanted no trace of the firefight remaining if the Chinese came looking for the missing soldiers and helicopter. The search was conducted without any hiccups, and we were directed through the front entrance of the lodge. Overhead lights were switched on, and we shaded our eyes as their leader, Randall, came forward. Zip tie their hands and black bag them, and we'll head out. Surely there's no need for that, Sonny said, taking a half step toward Randall. We're on your side. There was a click-fizz sound, and suddenly Sonny jerked up straight, his arms locked at his sides before falling to the ground and convulsing spasmodically. Brooke screamed, and the humming sound faded, leaving Sonny a twitching heap on the floor. It was Leroy. He had a taser in his hand, the wires running up to small prongs in Sonny's back. Enraged, I took a step forward, only to feel the hand of one of my captors grip my shoulder firmly. The guns of the men around us kept everyone else at bay. I still say we waste them, or at least the chink, began Leroy. He didn't get a chance to finish his thought, because Randall stepped forward and grabbed him by the throat. We don't know he is an enemy, Leroy. Randall grated through gritted teeth. You have to look deeper than a person's skin. Do you understand? Leroy, his face now a distinct purple shade, dropped the taser and tried to pry the fingers of the old man away. Randall squeezed harder and shook him a little. Do you understand? Leroy nodded desperately and patted the back of Randall's hand. The old man released him and he fell to his knees, sucking in deep, sobbing gulps of air. Good. Now get him up and bound. If he doesn't reach the professor in one piece, I'm going to gut you. Randall's words heartened me a little. At least we were being taken to see someone. Maybe this professor guy would be more reasonable, but where was he? And why were they going to black bag us? The men that had searched us went around to us one by one, starting with me. My hands were pulled behind my back and secured with a plastic zip tie, tight enough to hold them, but not tight enough to cut off circulation. All around me, the rest of my group were being similarly treated. I caught Indigo's eyes and nodded reassuringly before a black sack was pulled down over her head. I did the same for as many of the others as I could before my own head was covered and the world went dark. Sightless and surrounded by armed men, of which one at least was dangerous, I was as scared as I ever remembered being in my life. Now, we're going to lead you through some tight places, I heard Randall say from in front of us. And it's going to be a bit of a hike. You'll be fine as long as you stay on the path and don't do anything stupid. A hand grabbed my shoulder and prompted me forward. Let's go, people. Leroy, cut the lights. Part 4 Drake Mountain 19 The black sack over my head rendered me blind and helpless, totally reliant on our unseen captors to ensure I was guided safely to wherever they were taking us. The feeling of helplessness bothered me almost as much as not being able to see. It took five or so minutes to have the confidence to take more than baby steps. During that first phase I could sense that we were still indoors, and I heard doors closing behind us every hundred steps or so, and felt like we were traveling through hallways and passages towards the rear of the lodge. We didn't climb any stairs, so we were definitely still on the ground floor as we made our way slowly on our unseen path. Finally, after what seemed like a black eternity, I heard a warning given in front that we would be walking down a staircase. The hand that had been gently guiding me took my upper arm more firmly, stopping me in my tracks, but not before I bumped into the person in front of me. They felt soft, and I thought it might be one of the girls. Indigo, perhaps? Stop here for a moment, a man's voice said close to my ear. There was a pause of a few seconds, and then he said, Okay, we're going down the stairs now. Just take one step at a time, slowly. 
The mind plays tricks when deprived of sight, and my imagination had my foot waving over a bottomless abyss as I gingerly lowered it. When the drop to the first step was deeper than I expected, I trod heavily and overbalanced before the unseen hand of my guide steadied me. Easy, son. Take your time. I thought I recognized the voice of the soldier who had seized me straight after the helicopter had come down. That man had been competent and not unkind during that whole episode. Thanks, I said. I'm Isaac. What's your name? My name's John. I took a stab in the dark to confirm my suspicions. Thanks for having them see the Luke so quickly. No problem. I hope he makes it. For now, though, you might want to save the conversation and concentrate on what you're doing. It was him. I did as he suggested, satisfied that I had at least made a small connection with him. We reached the bottom of the staircase and I heard a noise like bar locks being pulled and a door opening, followed immediately by a frigid breeze. I was guided through the doorway, I could tell by the drop in temperature, and my feet found the ground suddenly rough and uneven. I won't describe every step of our journey that day. Suffice to say it was the most terrifying and surreal three hours or so of my life. I know better now, but in the absence of sight, my mind convinced me that we were on a narrow mountain trail that clung to the side of a cliff, and that with every step there was a danger that me or one of my group would fall into an abyss. I couldn't help picturing Frodo and his company climbing the precipitous mountain path in the Lord of the Rings movies that I had seen years before. Right then, I didn't feel anywhere near as heroic as I remember the hobbits being. About twenty minutes into the hike, one of the girls squealed somewhere in front. I tensed and waited for a long, fading scream that never came. Whatever the issue, it brought our procession to a standstill for a moment. I don't know if it was Indigo or one of the other girls that had squealed, but my heart was in my throat until the calm, authoritative voice of Colonel Randall got us all moving again. I stumbled many times, thankfully saved each time from a fall to the ground or worse by the steady, ever-present hand of John. After roughly an hour and a half, we were brought to a halt again, and Randall's voice rang out. We are going to rest here. My men are going to free your hands. If any of you do anything stupid, you will be tasered, and I can't guarantee your safety, given that there is a rather steep cliff just a few feet from you. I heard someone coming along our procession, and the intermittent snick of a sharp blade before strong hands gripped mine and cut the plastic tie securing them. I said thank you and rubbed my wrists to get the circulation going again. We were told to sit on the ground, and after I had seated myself on the cold, unyielding rock, I was handed a small paper-wrapped package. Something to eat. A voice, not John this time, said. My first instinct was to be suspicious of the proffered food, but of course, if they were going to kill us, they would have done it back at the lodge. I unwrapped the package and with my probing fingers felt a soft, crumbly square of something. Some sort of baked food. I raised it to my nose and smelt a vague hint of cinnamon and raisins. My mouth immediately began to water, and I bit into it without any further ado. None of us had eaten in a long time, and the biscuit, or whatever it was, was impossibly delicious. After I had scoffed it down, I used my fingers and tongue to ensure that I left no crumb on that paper. I didn't know when we would eat again. I heard someone pause in front of me and a cold metal cup was pressed into my hand with a simple order to drink. This time I thought I recognized the nasal voice of Leroy, the redneck. The canteen contained cool water. It also had been a long time since I had quenched my thirst, so I guzzled it. After about ten minutes, we were directed to stand and our blind trek continued. I had the feeling that it wouldn't have been easy in any circumstances, let alone blind. There were periods of steep climbing, but mainly I got the sense that we were winding our way downwards. It was difficult and rocky, and at no point did I become comfortable. After another torturous hour or so, we were again brought to a halt. I heard the voice of Randall up ahead. I couldn't make out what he was saying, but his tone led me to believe he wasn't talking to anyone in our group. I assumed he must have been on a two-way radio or something similar. Following the brief conversation, I heard a deep humming from the same direction, followed after a few seconds by a loud, metallic clunk. 
At this point, we were told to move forward. As I shuffled forward, the cold wind suddenly died away, and the rough ground flattened out into what was clearly a smooth, man-made floor. I sensed an enclosed space, and then behind me, the hum started up again, followed by the clunk of metal doors closing. The noise of the wind died away. We were in the facility they had spoken of. The safe haven. We had made it. I felt relief, but not the euphoria that I would have expected. The rude welcome we had received meant that I still had a vague, uneasy feeling to temper any sense of achievement at reaching our hard-won goal. We were guided for thirty or so steps, and then I heard another set of doors close behind us. I desperately wanted to see where I was, but had to settle for using my imagination to paint a picture. I imagined a large cavern, carved out of the bedrock of the mountain with a polished concrete floor. We were herded in a straight line for another one hundred feet or so before turning right, and a few minutes after that we were told to stop again. Somewhere in front of us I heard a whispered conversation between our captors before they started us moving again. "'Will you be taking the sack off soon?' I asked John when I felt his hand on me again. "'Soon. Just a little longer, I promise.' He was good to his word. After about another five minutes of walking, we halted, and I heard another door open in front of us before we were guided in. Hand stopped me after a few feet before turning me around. For a minute or two, I didn't hear anything except footsteps and some whispers. You may want to close your eyes, a voice said behind me, making me jump. Without further warning, the black sack was pulled from my head and harsh fluorescent light knifed to my eyes. I closed them quickly, and kept them closed until I felt I had given them enough time to adjust. I opened them again, blinking frequently until my eyes adapted to stark electric light. We were in a hospital ward, or what looked like one. The walls were stark white, which only intensified the brightness of the fluorescent lighting. Through watery eyes, I squinted around the room and saw that there were four beds with medical equipment positioned beside them. I was about to turn and look for my comrades when my gaze was drawn to a large plate-glass window in the wall opposite us. Through it I could see two men in scrubs standing over a bed and instantly recognized the shock of red hair at the head of the bed. Luke! Where the hell is my sister? The angry voice behind me snatched my attention before I could step up to the glass and I turned to see a furious Ben and no one else. No indigo, no brook, no alley, and no sunny. Colonel Randall stood in front of Ben, looking calmly down at the English boy. Flanking him was another armed man that I didn't recognize. This one was in a black uniform, not the white camouflage that our rescuers, or captors, had been wearing. He looked serious and competent. To his right was a balding man in a white coat. Don't worry about the girls, young man. They've been taken to another ward so that the medical staff can tend to them, said Randall. Why can't they be tended to here? asked Ben, bluntly. It's just the way it is. Believe me, you don't need to be concerned. You'll be together with them as soon as you've all been checked over and treated for any injuries. What about Sonny? I asked. The Chinese man? He is receiving treatment, too. He bumped his head when he fell. After he's seen to, he'll be questioned. He's not Chinese. He's as American as you or me, I said, controlling the anger I felt. Randall eyed me for a moment, weighing me up. Then he's got nothing to worry about. You'll all be able to see each other soon enough. But for now, Dr. Radisson here is going to see to your wounds and give you a physical. Then you can shower and have something to eat. Ben looked like he was going to protest, but I cut him off. These guys had all the power, for now. Okay. Thank you. When do we meet this professor person? I asked. When you've all been fed, watered, and settled in. There is no rush. You're safe now. What about Luke? I asked, nodding in his direction. Your friend is a lucky boy, said Dr. Radisson. The bullet missed all of his vital organs, although he lost a lot of blood. They're just stitching him up now. Luckily, he is type O. We have plenty of that in stock, although he made a very decent dent in our supply. We have a compulsory blood donation policy here in the facility. It will be replenished quickly. 
Your friend should be up and about again in a week to ten days. Relief washed over me. Luke's gunshot and subsequent collapse made me realize how close I had become to him. We really were as close as brothers now, our bond forged by adversity and respect. Not only did we have that bond, but I genuinely liked him and had come to rely on his smarts and advice during our long journey. What is this place? Ben asked the doctor. Some sort of government facility? I know you have a lot of questions, Randall interrupted. And they will be answered. But for now, let's get you cleaned up and treated so you can get some food and rest. Even though we hadn't had the big snack long ago, at the mention of food, my stomach began an impressive rumbling. Close behind it in urgency was my need for sleep. I had no idea what time it was or even what day, but my eyes had that dry, stinging feeling they get when sleep is well and truly overdue. I'll leave you with the good doctor. Williams here will see you to the showers after your examination. He nodded to the doctor and left. 20. Okay, to start with, please remove your clothes down to your underwear, said the doctor, as he went to the large window and pulled a curtain across. Before he blocked the view, I saw that the surgery on Luke appeared to be over. One of the surgeons was scrubbing at a basin, and the other was gathering up instruments. I finally let myself relax and felt fatigue eating at me as Ben and I stripped down. We placed our filthy and foul-smelling clothes in a plastic bag that the doctor held open for us. I was aware of Williams watching us, even though he appeared to be daydreaming by the door. The physical exam lasted about forty minutes, and the doctor gave us the all-clear. Apart from bruising and abrasions, neither Ben nor I had any serious injuries. Both of us tried to glean more information from Dr. Radisson, but he managed to fob us off without appearing rude or secretive. That's an impressive scar on your cheek. Lucky you didn't lose an eye, the doctor commented. I nodded, thinking it was a miracle I hadn't lost a lot more than an eye. The last thing the doctor did was check our stiff, grimy hair for lice. For the first time, I felt self-conscious about our general state of uncleanliness. Well, you boys have been through the ringer, said Dr. Radisson. But I'm happy to report that you have no major health concerns. Officer Williams here will take you through to the showers now and supply you with fresh clothes. Remove your underpants and put these on, please. Radisson handed us two green hospital gowns and opened the plastic bag to accept our unmentionably disgusting underpants. I wasn't quite sure which way the gown went on and followed Ben's lead so that the opening was at the back. I had only just managed to tie the string of the round collar behind my neck before Williams ordered us through the door. I skipped after Ben with one hand behind my back trying to hold the flaps together. While the hike from the ski lodge to the facility had made me feel vulnerable and unsure of myself, our bare-assed walk through a handful of corridors felt almost as bad. It got a lot worse when we arrived at what Williams referred to as the square. It was a large, open corridor that skirted a cafeteria, rec room, and a large quiet area, and apparently was the communal area of the facility. Unfortunately for Ben and I, the cafeteria was full when we passed by its large glass windows. We were of obvious interest to the few people, all women, in the room, and I felt my cheeks, the ones on my face, that is, burn in embarrassment as they looked up from their plates and observed us. I kept my red-faced gaze straight ahead, positive that the cool air on my butt was not the only attention it was receiving. Williams led us around a few more turns, and at last opened a door into a long bathroom lined with mirrors and basins on one side, and shower stalls on the other. Okay, guys, you can shower here. Take as long as you want. You look like you need it. There are towels and other items for you to use there on the basin. You'll find two sets of clothes in the lockers there. I'll be outside the door if you need me. Well, that was bloody embarrassing, Ben blurted, as soon as Williams had closed the door. You're telling me. What do you make of all this? It's definitely some sort of government facility. I don't think it's military, though. It sounds as though it's run by this professor person. 
I lowered my voice a little. I noticed that the insignia on William's uniform says Federal Protective Services, and I'm pretty sure those guys are Homeland Security. Right. Well, then, I say we keep our cards close to our chest until we find out exactly where we are. Yeah, definitely. Ben went to the basin and grabbed one of the towels. A toothbrush, plastic shaver, and tube of toothpaste spilled out of the folded linen. Ben snatched up the toothbrush and thrust it into the air as if it was Thor's mighty hammer, his bare ass on full display. Yes! Do you know how long it's been since I brushed my teeth, Isaac? All thoughts of Homeland Security, secret government facilities, and our predicament were forgotten as we became happily lost in the simple, long, absent routine of brushing our teeth. It was so refreshing that I repeated the process. After I had brushed my teeth a second time, I picked up the can of shaving cream that sat on the shelf between us and squirted a blob of cream into my hand. Suddenly overcome with a sense of mischief, instead of lathering it onto my face, I stepped up to Ben, who was just spitting out his toothpaste, and slapped the side of his head with a wet plop. You bastard! He guffawed and snatched the can from me. I evaded him for a few seconds, our silly hospital gowns flapping around our legs as we dodged and weaved in the confined space. He finally had his revenge, smacking a large handful of the foam into my face. We laughed like we hadn't laughed in a long time, and then got on with the serious business of bathing. Shaving my scant and patchy teenage beard with a disposable razor was almost as refreshing as cleaning my teeth had been, but the best was yet to come. To have a fresh mouth and a smooth face was amazing, but I can honestly say that nothing compared to the incredible feeling of steaming hot water coursing over my skin for the first time in months, especially after doubting I would ever feel it again. Both Ben and I stayed under the water for at least half an hour. We didn't say a word to each other, just reveled in the small luxury that we had taken for granted not so long ago. I scrubbed the grit, grime, and blood of our journey off my skin, then washed my hair three times. When I finally shut off the water and stepped out of the stall, the steam in the bathroom was like a heavy fog. Our guard Williams hadn't yet made an appearance, and I imagined that he knew how much we needed this time. You remember that old saying, like a new man? Well, right then, I looked and felt like one. I padded naked to the lockers as Ben finished drying himself off and found a neatly folded white T-shirt and a pair of black pants. Under those were a fresh pair of briefs, some socks, and a pair of soft-soled canvas shoes. I feel fantastic, said Ben, joining me at the locker. I know, me too. I will never ever take electricity or toothpaste or soap for granted again. The feel of new, clean clothes took my breath away. Yet another thing that I wouldn't have thought a luxury just a short time back. I finished tying my shoelaces and went back to the basin to look at myself in the mirror. With all the grime washed away and freshly shaved, I could now see the differences between the old Isaac and this new version. If I had to sum it up, I would say that I looked harder. My face was thinner and tanned, even though we had been traveling in the dead of winter. While I had never been fat, any traces of the softness of a well-fed fifteen-year-old were gone. My cheekbones were more prominent, and the livid scar on the right one gave me an edgier look that I was not expecting. My hair was longer, too. It had grown almost down to my shoulder and fell in a long, dark sweep across my brow. I guess I looked like someone who had done some tough living in a short time. Ben joined me at the basin and tried to pat his clean, blonde hair back into place. It had fluffed up after being washed, and he cursed softly. Wasn't sure I'd ever have to worry about my bloody, girly hair again, but here we are. At that point, the door opened and William stepped in. Good stuff. You two look like new men. Follow me, please. The kitchen has a meal ready for you. I smiled at Ben and clapped him on the shoulder. I knew it was just the buzz of being clean and the promise of food, but I suddenly felt amazingly alive and positive, more positive than I had felt since before my parents had died. He grinned back at me, and we followed Williams out of the bathroom. 21. 
Five minutes later, we were in the clean, sterile-looking cafeteria that we had passed earlier. It was now empty besides us, but whether this was by design or just that the meal time was over, I wasn't sure. Regardless, I was somewhat relieved that I wouldn't have to face the strangers who had seen my backside not so long ago. Ben and I stepped up to the counter. A heavy-set and stony-faced man in an apron stood behind it. Without greeting us, he picked up two plates and put them down besides the bain marie before starting to slop food on them. I'm Ben, this is Luke, said Ben pleasantly, as the man dipped his ladle into the second container. He glanced quickly at Williams, who had stationed himself by the door before looking back at us. Theo, he said, with a finality that indicated he wasn't inclined to talk. I slotted their little interaction away and watched Theo add to the peas already on the plate. He dished out roast potatoes, carrots, and what I thought might be roast beef followed by a generous ladle of gravy. The smell of the food was amazing, even if it looked like it had been sitting there a while, and my mouth was watering as I thanked him and took my plate, barely able to resist dipping into the meal with my fingers. I grabbed a bread roll and knife and fork and headed to the nearest table. About halfway through the meal, I paused and called to Williams, asking him when we would be reunited with the girls and Sonny. Soon. Girls or no girls, Ben and I wolfed our food down as if it was the last meal we would ever have. Ben had returned to the counter for seconds, and I was just mopping up the last of the gravy on my plate with the bread roll when the door slid open. A guard in the same uniform as Williams entered. Behind them were Brooke, Indigo, and Allie. All three girls looked clean, radiant, and happy. They broke into smiles when they saw us. Brooke made a beeline for her brother who had just put his tray down and turned to her as she swooped into his arms. Indigo was either outrun or let Allie reach me first and I stumbled, only just managing to keep my feet as she jumped into my arms. Hi, Allie, I said, and she pulled away slightly. Where is Sonny? She frowned. He's fine. They are monitoring him because he hit his head when they zapped him. Well, they shouldn't have zapped him. He was just trying to talk to them. I know. We'll talk to them about that. How are you feeling? I'm great, of course. Everything is great now. We found the safe haven. Hearing the words, I felt a mild pang of sadness for the ones we had lost and the ones we had left behind. We might have been able to save John and Mark after all. The facility's medical resources were obviously top class. And of course, if we had brought them, Samara would have been here too. I pushed the guilt down as Allie moved to the side and allowed In to go through. Hi, she said simply. She looked beautiful. Her clean hair fell in soft blonde waves over her shoulders and her skin was glowing. Under the fluorescent lights, I noticed for the first time that she had a spattering of pale freckles on her nose. They didn't subtract from her beauty. If anything, they enhanced it. I didn't say anything. Just reached out, and we hugged, and held each other for a few seconds before Ben and Brooke joined us at the table. Well, you two scrub up all right, don't you? Ben said to Allie and Indigo as he hugged them. I returned an enthusiastic embrace from Brooke. Do we know how Luke is? She asked as we separated. He's fine. I'll tell you more in a second, but you should get some food first. I followed them to the counter and got seconds. Back at the table, we talked quietly as we ate our fill. The girls had a similar experience to us. They had been examined by a doctor after their blindfolds were removed. Brooke was the only one who had required any sort of treatment. The doctor confirmed she had a sprained ankle and had strapped it after her shower the shower. They all spent a good few minutes discussing how good it had been to bathe, clean their teeth, and dress in fresh clothes. When we had exhausted that subject, we got down to more serious topics. I told them how we had seen Luke being treated and that the doctor had assured us he would fully recover. The girls were as happy about that as Ben and I. Again, I was reminded what an integral part of our group he was. So what do you think of this place, Isaac? asked Indigo after we had eaten our fill. Hard to say until we know more and meet this professor. It seems he is in charge of the whole place, even though there's a military presence and homeland security. I gestured to our two escorts. 
I wish Luke was up and about so I could pick his brains. He knows lots more about government and military stuff than me. One thing I'm pretty sure of is that it's top secret. I've heard about the government having secret bases where they research new weapons or hide the president or joint chiefs if we come under attack. Cheyenne Mountain is the name of one. Oh my God, do you think the president is here? Allie asked excitedly. No, I don't think so. I agree, said Ben. I think if the president or anyone important was here, we wouldn't have been rescued from the Chinese. They wouldn't risk discovery. Maybe, but don't they usually have a secret name for the president, like the package or eagle? Brooke asked. Maybe President Riley's code name is Professor? You've been watching too many movies, sis. She's right, I have heard that too. I think President Clinton was eagle. Anyway, I don't think President Riley is here. The virus moved pretty quick, and the last I'd heard, he was in the air. If he's not dead, he probably went somewhere safe, like Australia or England, I said. Maybe they're planning a counterattack? Allie chimed in. Let's worry about here and now. They told me we can meet the professor after we eat and rest. We should be able to get some answers to our questions then. As if on cue, the two Homeland Security officers came over to our table. My eyes went to the holstered guns on their belts as Williams addressed us. Okay, kids, all fed and happy? It was probably churlish, but I bristled at being called kids after all that we'd been through. I didn't let my annoyance show. We sure are, sir, thank you. It was amazing. Good stuff. Okay, it's time for you to get some sleep. He looked at his watch. We'll be taking you to top level now. You'll be quarantined from the rest of the facility's population for a few days so we can debrief you and make certain there are no underlying health issues. It's just a precaution. The doc has given you the all clear, but the professor thinks it best. Follow me, please. Top level? I asked as we walked. Yeah, it's the research and development level. It's where all the labs are and the professor's office. Also where my men and I are stationed. Oh, so you're not stationed with the army guys? No, he said, without offering any further explanation. How many levels are there? I asked. Three. This is mid-level. It's where the civilian living areas are, along with the hospital. Under this level is bottom. It houses the military, storage, and greenhouses. Williams wouldn't answer any more questions as he led us through the white corridors of the mid-level, promising all our questions would be answered in due course. After a few turns, we came upon a glass-walled lobby. He led us through the doors, which were guarded by two more Homeland Security officers. The large, high-ceilinged room was quite opulent and reminded me of the lobby of a five-star hotel my family and I had stayed in once. I felt a little stab of sadness in my chest. Funny how... Even after all I'd been through and all that had happened since, thinking of them could still affect me. Like the rest of the facility, it was painted a stark white, but instead of being plain, it was richly furnished and decorated. There were paintings on the walls, and instead of the polished concrete floor of the rest of the facility, the lobby had rich, dark brown carpet. The expensive-looking furniture, sofas, low tables, and chairs, were placed strategically around the cavernous space. Opposite the doors through which we had entered was another set of timber double doors. To the left of that was an expansive reception desk, with no one behind it. We were led past the desk to an elevator at the far left of the lobby. It wasn't guarded, but the two Homeland Security guards with automatic weapons patrolling the lobby made me wonder what, or who, they were guarding against. I saw Allie looking around in wonder and tried to put away my natural suspicion. It was time to switch off. Despite the rude way in which we were brought in, we had been rescued. I could relax now. It was time to let go of the constant state of wariness and be a kid again. Even as I thought it, I felt the tension drain out of me. When we stepped into the lift, I maneuvered around everyone so that I was next to Indigo. I felt goosebumps break out on my skin as our arms bumped against each other. When she looked at me and smiled, I felt a warm glow of happiness and a long-buried hope. 22. The top level looked much as mid-level had. 
It was all white, glass and metal, and looked even more sterile. We were led past several heavy-looking doors with small viewing windows, and even though I didn't have time to stop and look closely, I could glimpse enough through the small windows to see that they were fully equipped labs. Eventually, the corridor we were following came to an end at a glass wall that sealed the entire passage. It had a large airlock in its center, beside which two homeland guards stood sentry. They both carried automatic weapons. Only about five feet behind that wall was another. It was glass, too, and I wondered briefly what sort of research would warrant such heavy-duty precautions. Trying not to be too obvious, I peered through the glass. Further on, the sealed corridor looked similar to what we'd seen already, except there was a glass wall down one side, and behind it I thought I could make out rooms or cells. For observation, perhaps? My thoughts were interrupted when I felt Indigo's warm hand find mine. I looked down into her clear blue eyes. Relax, Isaac. We're safe now. She said, as we followed Williams around the corner and away from the mysterious sealed area. Indigo gave my hand the final squeeze and let go. I closed my hand, savoring the recently lost warmth of her. The turn led us deeper into a wing that contained living quarters and a breakout area with sofas and a pinball machine along with some other stuff. We saw more of the homeland guards down here, some in uniform, but most in regular clothes as they relaxed and socialized. A short distance further on, Williams paused and swiped a security card, unlocking a door and leading us into a large room with ten single cots, a couple of sofas, and a table and chairs. Okay, here we are, he said. Home sweet home for the next few days. I'll have some games and reading material brought in for you shortly. Unfortunately, you'll be required to stay in the dormitory until the professor gives you the all clear. He pointed to the far end of the room. There's a small bathroom with a shower. The sink has a second tap which is filtered drinking water, and there's a receptacle with paper cups beside it. Your meals will be brought to you. Anyway, you look beat. I suggest you all get some sleep. He turned and left the room, the door closing behind him with a click. I walked to it after he left, and even though I knew it would be locked, I tried it anyway. The handle didn't budge. Like the shock of our unfriendly rescue, capture, being locked in a room wasn't quite how I had envisaged being treated when we reached our safe haven. It's locked? asked Ben. Yeah. I walked back to where they were busily claiming their cots and sat on the first one I came to. I gazed at the wall mural that lined the long wall opposite our cots. It was a photograph of a beach with golden sands, palm trees, and sea, and happy people laughing and enjoying the sun. I knew the life-size image was designed to make up for the lack of windows and natural scenery in the facility, but it only struck me as sad, a bleak reminder of the world that we had lost. Well, it's fair enough, said Indigo, perhaps sensing my disquiet as she unfolded a blanket and fluffed the pillow on the end of the cot she had claimed. It was too down from the one I was sitting on. After all, they don't know us. It would be strange if they weren't taking precautions. Yes, agreed Brooke. It makes sense. I don't think we should take it personally. Ben dived onto one of the cots and turned on his side, with a hand cocked under his head, grinning at me. I'm sure it's just another one of their rules. It is government, after all. I know. You're right. I'm just tired. Why don't we get some rest? I don't remember the last time I slept on a mattress. I guess we can finally relax, now that we're here. Allie yawned and fell into the cot next to mine. That was slightly annoying, I had thought. Well, I don't know what I had thought, really, but I felt strangely disappointed that I hadn't been quick enough to claim the cot next to Indigo. Ben and Brooke had already disappeared beneath their blankets, as had a yawning Allie. I slipped my shoes off and laid down. I couldn't stay mad at her for long and smiled when I heard her soft snoring. Even though it was not the most comfortable bed I had ever laid down upon, Right then, it felt like resting on a cloud, and I too fell asleep within seconds of my head hitting the pillow. 
What followed were three of the best days I could remember having since, well, since my parents and sister had died in the fire. They would have been complete if Sonny and Luke had been with us, although, of course, the dynamics may have changed if Sonny had been there, him being a grown-up and all. As it was, we were five kids, and we acted like it. Now safe and well-fed, we got back to the business of being kids and having fun, something that had been missing from our lives for months and months. We played games, not only the board games that were supplied to us, but silly games we made up. We spent hours one day just playing a variation of hide-and-seek, which involved one of us taking a Monopoly piece and hiding it while the others looked away. Another day we spent hours acting out scenes from movies we loved. Best of all, though, we talked and told stories and got to know each other as we hadn't been able to do when we were running, hiding, and fighting for our lives. Even though I already felt like I knew her well, I got even closer to Indigo during that happy time. Watching her interact with the others, the way she took Allie under her wing and shared her happiness, I only felt my love for her grow stronger. Yeah, I said it. Love. Although I might have denied it back then if you'd asked me. Of course, I hid it well. I was a teenage boy, after all. Did she know? No doubt. Even though I wasn't overt, I guess there was no way she could fail to notice my occasional doe-eyed stare and the goofy way I responded when she was in close proximity. I'm pretty sure she was emotionally mature enough to understand that I was smitten with her. I think by the end of the three days in the dorm, I had finally let go of the constant wariness that had been an integral part of my nature since the Pyongyang flu had ravaged our country. I now had other things to think about, not the least of which was the beautiful girl I had fallen in love with. 23. Apart from our meals, we were visited by the doctor every day for a few minutes. He seemed satisfied with what he saw each time, and on the fourth day after breakfast, instead of him showing, Williams came back. Okay, medical has given the all clear for you to be released into the general population. Today, you'll be debriefed individually by Colonel Randall. He's been set up in an office down the corridor. Something in his tone told me he didn't approve of this. Whether it was us being interviewed by Randall or the fact that he was on top level, I don't know. We were taken out one by one, starting with Allie. I wasn't able to talk to her before she was let out, but I quickly told the others that no one should mention Huion and her group or Sonny's link to her. I didn't want his situation to get any worse than it may already be. We had a break for a lunch of sandwiches and cheese, amazed and curious as to where they were getting the variety of fresh food we had been enjoying. Ben had his interview after that. He was gone for an hour, and I was just beginning to worry when he was brought back in, and I was let out. Thankfully, Allie had told me when she had come back that she hadn't even thought about Huion during the interview, and so hadn't mentioned her. She seemed a little put out that I was asking her. I wouldn't have said anything anyway, Isaac. I'm not stupid. Indigo stepped in and reassured her that no one thought she was stupid, that we were just being cautious. By the time my turn came around, I knew what to expect. The girl said that Randall had been nice and had really just wanted to know how they had fared since the attack, how we had all met, and how we had found the facility. Williams was silent and unapproachable as he led me to the interview room. I took the hint and didn't try to make conversation. He knocked on the door and stood aside as we waited a few seconds before Randall opened the door. Isaac, come in. The older man stood aside as I entered and shook my hand with a strong grit. The last time I had seen him, Colonel Randall had been wearing his white camouflage. In his crisply pressed officer's uniform and his short silver hair slicked back, he really did look like authority personified. I looked around, taking in the shelves of cleaning chemicals and implements. It was a storage room. Forgive the decor, will you? The professor wasn't overly generous when he gave me this office space. I didn't detect any bitterness, only wry amusement. He walked behind a blue plastic drum and sat down on an office chair. Please, sit. He waved me to a chair opposite his 
and put on a pair of reading glasses before picking up a clipboard and pen. Firstly, I want to say I'm sorry if you feel that the way we brought you in was a little heavy-handed. We have a duty of care to the people of the facility, so any newcomers are treated with suspicion, especially ones with half the Chinese army chasing them into the mountains. Sure, I understand. I didn't mention the unnecessary attack on Sonny, which I most definitely didn't understand. So, uh, you seem to have a bit of a fan club amongst your group, he said, smiling and gazing at me over the top of his glasses. Sorry? Your group. They look up to you. I shrugged. I don't know, sir. Well, I know. Based on what they've been telling me, you've gained the respect and trust of your people. All of them. I've heard enough to know that it was hard-earned and deserved. Well done on getting them here safely. Well, it wasn't only me, sir. I felt my cheeks grow warm in embarrassment. We wouldn't have made it without Sonny or Luke, either. That may be the case, but you seem to be the glue that bound them together when things got rough. I shrugged. By the way, no one has been able to tell us how Luke is. Or Sonny, for that matter. Your friend Luke is recovering nicely. I spoke to him this morning before I began the interviews up here. I imagine he'll be released from medical in a few days. He asked about you all, too. As for Sonny, the professor has yet to interview him. He'll need to remain isolated. A precaution, you understand. Until that happens. I started to protest, but he held up his hands. Not my call, son. The professor is in charge of this facility. I'm sure your friend will be back with you soon. Okay, but just so you know, I couldn't have done it without them. It was a team effort. I know that, son, although you may be underestimating yourself. I think you still might have managed to get them here if things had been different. That's what leaders do. Anyway, we're here to debrief. I think I have most of the story anyway, but I want to hear from you about how it went down after the infection, after the flu had been released. Let's start with where you were living. I spent the next hour telling him my story. He was a considerate listener and asked questions only to clarify a point or get more details about certain incidents. I found myself recalling my story enthusiastically. It felt strangely cathartic to tell my story, and I became so lost in it that I almost mentioned Tweon by accident when I got to the part about the gas station. It was only with some swift thinking and talking that I managed to brush over that. Randall was particularly interested in the last part of our journey and commended me on the attack on the bar. It's funny, but now that we were safe, well-fed and rested, I had begun to second-guess what I had done. I said as much to the colonel. No, you did the right thing at the right time, Isaac. The enemy isn't just at the gates. He screwed our wife and is now in the living room with his feet up drinking our beer. You gave him a bloody nose and something to think about. Aren't you worried that they'll track us back to the lodge? No. Even if they do, the chances of them working out that it's a front for the facility is minimal, and even in the scenario that they did, this place has all been impregnable. It was designed to take everything but a direct nuclear strike. The colonel wasn't as forthcoming when I asked about the facility. He told me that I would learn more tonight, when I met the professor. After our interview, he saw me to the door. After you're settled into your permanent quarters, I'll be having a conversation with each of you about what you want to do while you're here. The professor will tell you more about that tonight. But I want you to consider joining our ranks. We have a vacancy we need filled. A vacancy? Yes, he said, looking thoughtful, perhaps weighing up how much he could say to me. We lost one of our men on patrol last week, and the professor has approved recruiting a replacement. If you want, I will put your name forward, even though we wouldn't normally recruit anyone younger than 18. Anyway, don't answer now. Just hear him out tonight and have a think about it. Williams took me back to the dorm, and before he left, addressed all of us. It's just after 1300. You'll be joining the professor for dinner at 1900 hours... And after that, you'll be taken to your permanent dormitories. Make sure you have your gear packed by 1900. It will be moved for you while you're at dinner. That shouldn't be a problem, Officer Williams. We don't have a lot to pack. Even though Ben's tone was friendly and not in the least sarcastic, 
William shot him a dirty look before he left us, the door clicking locked behind him. 24. The rest of that day dragged. We talked about the interviews, of course, but it was clear that generally we had all been asked the same questions and none of us had been able to milk any information of real value from Colonel Randall. We were all looking forward to meeting the professor. Not only to have all of our questions answered, but I wanted Sonny released and I was going to push for it to happen as soon as possible. It wasn't fair for him to be locked up and kept from us just because of his heritage and genetic makeup. I was sure the professor would be reasonable about it. As Ben had told Williams, packing didn't take long at all. Our belongings consisted only of what we had been given since we arrived. The backpacks the soldiers had confiscated from us when we were taken into custody at the lodge had not been given back to us. In any event, they had only contained a few items of clothing, some small weapons, and a few scraps of food. When Williams arrived with another homeland guard to escort us back to mid-level, we carried a small bag each that we had been given to stow our toiletries and a change of clothes. That was it, the sum of our existence right then. We followed Williams back to the elevators, all a little excited to be doing something different. As much fun as the past few days together had been, by the last day we were all a little stir-crazy. Ben and Brooke had even had a spat over something really trivial while we had been waiting for Williams, the first time I had ever seen them argue. The elevator was so silent it was eerie, even the doors didn't make a sound when they opened and closed. We didn't talk on the way down, the presence of the armed men putting a dampener on our mood. I, for one, began to feel a little apprehensive about meeting the professor. The elevator doors opened onto the lobby, and Williams ushered us out. I took more notice of it this time. The reception desk was still empty. I imagine there wasn't much need for a receptionist these days. Williams led us past the desk to the large double doors. This time, there were two armed guards at the large doors as well as another patrolling the corridor just outside of the main door of the lobby. All of the guards wore homeland uniforms. I wondered briefly why there were no military personnel. Perhaps they didn't do simple guard work? The presence of the guards and the lavish surroundings made the whole thing feel a bit surreal, almost like we were being admitted to the Oval Office to meet the President. The two unsmiling guards looked us over carefully before pulling open the heavy doors. They opened silently onto a smaller but still large room dominated by a long oak table, covered by an expansive white tablecloth and set for a meal. It was a boardroom that had been converted to a dining room. At the head of the table sat a handsome man with salt and pepper hair. He was engaged in a quiet conversation with a smaller man to his left. The smaller man was neat and compact-looking and wore wire-framed glasses. He was wearing a gray suit and blue bow tie. Given his nerdy appearance and poor dress sense, I immediately picked him as the professor. The two men looked up at me, the handsome man smiling and the professor regarding me expressionlessly. I was walking towards him to introduce myself when the handsome man got up from his seat and held out his hand. He was tall and well-built, with a square jaw. "'You must be Isaac,' he said. "'I'm Professor Leahy.' I tried not to let my surprise show as I shook his hand. "'Nice to meet you, sir. I'm Isaac Race.' His hand gripped mine and I had to work hard not to wince as he crushed my hand in his, twisting it so that his palm was facing down as we shook. I knew about this particular approach. My grandfather had told me it was a way that executives and politicians tried to assert their dominance when meeting someone new. A handshake is normally supposed to be a welcoming gesture between people. But allowing your palm to face upward while the other guy's is facing downward is basically allowing them to have the upper hand. Literally. I was having none of it. Without being obvious about it, I planted my left foot as we continued to shake, slowly twisted my own hand back until it was level with his. His brown eyes regarded me determinedly as he attempted to regain his dominant position, and I looked right back at him, just as determined not to allow it. In the end, his greater strength won out, 
just, and after shaking for what seemed like a ridiculously long time, he finally pulled out of our handshake and stepped past me to Ben, introducing himself and also shaking his hand. The man I had initially mistook for the professor was watching me, but didn't get up to greet us. Please be seated, said the professor, after he had greeted and introduced himself to the girls. He went back to his seat as we took ours, but didn't bother introducing the other man. A woman carrying a basket of bread rolls came in as we got settled and began placing one at each of our settings. The professor waited until the woman finished and had left the room before addressing us. Thank you all for coming. I didn't expect that we'd see any more new arrivals, so it's a real privilege to have you here. In fact, the night you were brought in was the last night the retrieval team was going to be deployed. If you'd arrived a day later, I'm afraid that the Chinese would have captured you, or worse. How many responded to the signal? I asked. Not as many as we had hoped. You were the fifth group, and the last. I can't risk the retrieval team now that the Chinese have come as close as they have. In the first weeks after the flu and invasion, we had teams scouting Lincoln and rescuing children from homes there. In addition to your group, we saved over a hundred souls. We still have teams going out to scout for food and supplies, but generally they are smaller and move quickly. The doors opened and the woman who had served us the bread rolls returned with a pretty girl of about sixteen. Both women were dressed in white shirts and black, like us. Thinking back, I did notice the girl had a slight pot belly, but at the time I thought nothing of it. The older woman was wheeling a trolley with dishes of delicious-smelling soup. I tried to catch her eye and say thank you as she served me, but she kept her eyes deliberately lowered, as did the girl. I apologize for the meagerness of our meal, said Professor Leahy, looking at me. Giving our limited capacity to produce food and the extra miles, we have to ration quite carefully, although I did give special permission for a hearty lunch for your group after all of your hardship. It appeared we would only be having one course this evening, and I couldn't help feeling a little let down. At least the chicken soup looked as hearty as it smelled, loaded with chunks of chicken and vegetables. I inwardly chastised myself for being so ungrateful and was about to say something when Brooke beat me to it. Believe me, sir, we are grateful for anything. Was that a flash of annoyance I saw across his face as he turned to her? If so, it was gone as quickly as it came, replaced by a charitable smile. You're welcome, young lady. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, the food situation. I greet all of the new groups like this with a meal and friendship. Here in the facility we welcome all, but we do ask that everyone contributes to our little society in some way. Does that seem fair to you all? While it was a question for all of us, he was looking right at me. Obviously he had been told, probably by Colonel Randall, that I was the leader of our group. The yes, sir, that sounds perfectly reasonable. The others all nodded or said yes, and he clapped his hands together before sweeping his hand around the table. Good. Please eat before it gets cold. We'll continue our discussion as we enjoy our meal. He looked at the two women who had just finished filling his bowl and that of his nerdy friend. Thank you, ladies. That will be all. Dismissed, the two serving women left the room and the doors were closed behind them. Was that their contribution? To wait table for the professor and his cronies? I let go of the uncomfortable feeling. After all, I didn't know enough of anything to be making judgments. Not yet, anyway. Is it... Only children who have been arriving, Professor? Or have there been other adults? I asked as everyone began eating. Alas, only children, young Isaac. The virus engineered by the Chinese was very effective. Almost 100% effective, in fact. Every adult you see in this complex was here before the attack. We had a regular population of 178, from janitorial and clerical staff right up to military and scientific personnel. I mulled this over as we began eating. The soup was delicious, as was the fresh bread roll, and the big helping meant that it would do just fine as a main meal. Again, my mind returned to the young girl and the woman who had served us. 
I wondered if the woman had been employed as catering staff prior to the attack. I assume she must have been, but the girl was definitely too young and must have been one of the hundred or so saved souls that the professor had mentioned. Had she volunteered or been forced to take up the role? I gave myself another mental kick for being so negative and looking for motives behind everything that I saw. It was hard to let go of my natural cynicism. Of course, we were all full of questions and didn't really hold back during our meal with the professor. Allie was first to raise the subject of the president. We heard that President Riley might be here? Even though the professor laughed good-naturedly, it was a fair enough question. The news reports near the end had been vague and contradictory. Several had said that the president and his family had been evacuated on Air Force One. Communications from the White House had ceased the day after Christmas, and press, or what was left of the press, had only been able to speculate whether he was formulating a response to the Chinese attack. No, he's not here. One of the last communications we had was that President Riley was airborne, but of course communication shut down when the Pentagon was attacked. Attacked? I asked. Yes, you probably didn't hear, because by that time, the flu had decimated the population and the media was all but gone. The Chinese launched several strategic nuclear strikes. One of them was against Washington. I imagine the enemy was ensuring that any remaining organized resistance was destroyed. Since then, we've been unable to contact any other arms of the U.S. government. While there is always a chance the president survived and found refuge overseas, we have to assume the worst, and that this facility is possibly the last remnant of the United States government in mainland America. We were all silent as we digested this information. While Luke and I had assumed the worst, having it confirmed as true was almost like a kick in the guts. So we didn't even have a chance to fight back? Asked Ben. I was interested in the English boy's use of the term we. I guess he meant we as in the good side rather than just the United States. Well, one of Randall's men heard some chatter before we went dark. It appears the Chinese didn't have it all their own way. Two Pacific aircraft carrier strike groups and another out of Virginia engaged the enemy naval forces and inflicted much damage before they were finally subdued. There were also reports that the USS George Washington had launched a nuclear strike against selected Chinese targets from its base in Japan before it was also destroyed. We weren't able to confirm that before communications went down, though. I hope they gave it to the Bostons, said Ben. I had the feeling that if Luke was here, he would have echoed Ben's sentiment and let out a yee-haw at the possibility that we had been able to strike back at the Chinese in such a devastating way. Perhaps I would have, too, but I was mindful of Indigo and her feelings after our own attack on the unsuspecting soldiers in the bar. If anything, celebrating the fact that thousands, perhaps millions of innocent civilians may have died as punishment for their government's actions would upset her even more. It didn't seem like something worth celebrating anyway. How many aircraft carriers do we have? There are more than four, right? I asked. Yes, there are, uh, were, ten that are active. We assume all of the others were destroyed by strategic strikes while in port. If any were at sea or had managed to elude the Chinese, we wouldn't have heard. It's possible they sailed to Australia or Europe once it became clear that things were hopeless. How did the facility survive the infection? Asked Indigo, changing the subject slightly. Good question, said the professor. Because of the nature of the research we were conducting here, the Drake Mountain facility has a very sophisticated filtration system and quarantining protocols. Weren't you afraid of infection when you started letting people in, though? Or sending your own people out? I saw the professor reluctantly impressed by the veracity of her questions. No, I had already studied the pathogen and knew it had a built-in obsolescence, a use-by date, if you like. Luckily, we were able to map the genetics of the virus before it degraded, something I bet they weren't counting on. I heard an unmistakable tone of satisfaction in his voice. Why would they build in a use-by date? Ben asked. It was probably twofold. 
insurance that when their invasion began, there would be no question of the virus killing any of their own people of mixed heritage. But more importantly, I imagine that they were ensuring that our American scientists would not be able to study the virus. Now, I'm sure they knew from their North Korean experiment that there would be no time for a vaccine to come into play, but there are other things they would have been concerned about. We asked more questions about the virus, about how it spread. Well, it moved very quickly, in two waves. It's quite unique, really. Not only was it able to be dispersed into the air and carried on the winds, it is, or was, also extremely virulent. Based on the figures we were getting from the CDC, the rate of infection was around 97%. Those that weren't infected directly by the deployment were soon infected by other victims. Was that admiration I detected in his voice? We asked more questions, but the professor seemed unwilling to discuss it any further, and I almost got the feeling he perhaps felt he had said too much already. On the subject of the Chinese occupation, he was more forthcoming. We know that they began their ground invasion within 48 hours, the virus being deployed. Once the flu had done its work, they didn't even have to mount a full-scale invasion. They just picked strategic cities along both seaboards and overran them with almost no resistance. Those members of the police, National Guard, and armed forces that weren't dead were already very sick. There was silence at the table while we ate and digested all we had heard. I took the opportunity to ask something that had been bugging me a little since we had walked into the room. Professor, I was wondering why Colonel Randall didn't join us for dinner. I was hoping to thank him again. I prefer the military contingent eat with their own. That was the protocol before the attack, and I want that discipline maintained. They didn't all seem that disciplined, if you don't mind me saying, Ben said. What do you mean? asked Professor Leahy his eyes narrowing. There was one, Leroy, I believe his name was, who insisted that Sonny be shot on sight. Not exactly the welcome that we were expecting, especially the use of excessive force to subdue Sonny when he hadn't threatened anyone. And speaking of Sonny, we haven't seen him since we were brought in. Ben's English accent became very clipped and proper, as his cool indignation was made clear. I couldn't help but think that he must have been an effective debater at school. I was glad to have someone else asking the hard questions, too. I apologize for that. One of the things we've had to do is bolster our security with recruitment from within the facility. Leroy was actually one of the janitorial staff before he was drafted into the Homeland Security Force. He doesn't answer to Colonel Randall, but you can trust that Mr. Rag here will make sure that he is disciplined properly. As to your friend Sonny... I hope you'll understand that I have a responsibility to every man, woman, and child under my care to ensure that they are safe. Your friend will be released into the general population after Mr. Rag and I have had a chance to question him. The smaller man had been so quiet and unobtrusive that I had almost forgotten he was there. But at the mention of his name, I saw Mr. Rag's spoon pause for a millisecond before it found his mouth. What was he? Some sort of security advisor? Even while eating, he watched us without expression, and his intense regard made me feel a little uneasy. Despite his harmless appearance, there was something vaguely sinister about him, and I got the impression he was silently memorizing every word we said. Is this all because Sonny is of Chinese descent? Asked Indigo, not letting the professor off the hook too easily. Yes. It was a simple and honest reply that I couldn't really argue with. I remembered my own reaction upon meeting Sonny. I was sure that after Leahy spoke to Sonny, he would see him in the same light we all saw him, a loyal American and an honest good guy. Would you mind if one of us was present? I asked, hoping to be there to support Sonny. I am afraid that won't be possible, Isaac. The security of this facility is paramount. I can assure you that I'm not going to torture your friend or anything like that, laughed the professor. It's not you I'm worried about, I thought to myself as I stared into the cold, strangely empty gray eyes of Mr. Rag. When will that be, sir? We would all like to see Sonny. He's been locked up for days. 
All my friends nodded enthusiastically. I saw another flash of annoyance in his eyes, but his face was still fixed in a smile. Well, he's not locked up exactly. He's just isolated, and I can assure you he's being well looked after. We were going to do it in a few days, but I can see how much he means to you. So as a gesture of good faith, I will conduct the interview tomorrow morning. All right? That's marvelous, said Brooke. Yes, thank you, Professor, Allie added. If you don't mind, I'd like to see Luke tomorrow, too, if he's well enough, that is. I'll have the doctor give you an update and leave it up to him. If he thinks your friend is well enough for visitors, I'm sure it won't be a problem. I'm sure he had already been briefed, but as we finished our meal, the professor began asking us questions. While they seemed harmless, the questions were pointed, and he skillfully formed a picture of where we had all come from and how we had ended up coming together as a group. Just in case Randall had missed anything? Maybe. Naturally, he seemed most interested in Sonny and his origins and how he and his students had saved me, Luke, Ben, and Brooke from the Chinese. I had no intention of mentioning Quion and her underground group helping us elude the enemy, and I was ready to pounce if any of the others looked like they might mention it accidentally. About thirty minutes after we finished the main meal, I was surprised when dessert was brought in by the woman that had served us earlier. It was a huge apple pie, with homemade ice cream. The professor explained that the facility had a large hydroponic garden and that apples were the one fruit in abundant supply. He also took the opportunity to explain that farming was one of the ways one could contribute to the facility. He called them disciplines. Farming, cleaning, security, and mining. He focused on the girls when he was speaking about the farming and cleaning, and Ben and I when he discussed mining and security. I thought it was outrageously sexist, but I bit my tongue. I was surprised that Indigo didn't speak up. Apparently something more important was on Allie's mind than sexism. Wait, where did the ice cream come from? Don't you need milk or cream? Good question, said the professor, clapping his hands together. Another thing we have in abundance is powdered milk and other staples. This facility was designed to survive in the event of a worst-case scenario, that being nuclear attack. Consequently, we have an almost endless store of such things, and in the days after the virus had dissipated, I sent missions to gather more. I estimate with our current population, we have about three years' worth of food. That's without our fruit and vegetables, although for obvious reasons I consider them a vital part of our dietary needs. What about the meat and chicken? asked Ben. The beef is frozen, and we have a small battery of live hens for eggs, and more in frozen stock for eating. Of course, those frozen supplies will run out, but our scouting party should be able to keep us supplied with sufficient stock of fresh meat— and possibly fish, at least until we find a solution to the Chinese problem, that is. What do you mean by that? Ben asked. Oh, nothing. Just a figure of speech. I basically mean waiting until they are occupied elsewhere. Your spectacular arrival has them crawling over the surrounding countryside like ants before a storm. The rest of the meal passed quickly, and the professor thanked us for joining him. He told us that while he couldn't guarantee our preferences, someone would be talking to us about which disciplines we would like to volunteer for. He looked at his watch as he saw us to the door with the peculiar Mr. Rag by his side. It's 7.30 p.m. now. Curfew is at 9.30. Reveille is at 6 a.m. Williams here will see you to the square if you like, and you can spend some time in the recreation room, or you can head back to your new quarters for rest. Good night. What's Reveille? Allie asked me quietly as we stepped through the door. It's a French word for a wake-up call. They do it in the army to wake everyone up at the same time, usually with a trumpet. Okay. Well, let's go to the rec room. I'm not ready for bed yet. Williams was again waiting in the lobby for us when we emerged. I tried to take more notice of the turns and distinguishing features of our route this time. After two turns, we emerged into a larger passageway. We were back in the square. He took us to the open quiet area where there were a few people lounging about, reading a book or chatting quietly. Okay, as you know, this is the square. You can spend some time here in the quiet area or inside the rec room before curfew if you want. 
The cafeteria was nearly full and it made me happy to see so many healthy adults enjoying their evening meal. There were a lot of teenagers scattered about and a big table near the back containing smaller children with an elderly woman at the head of the table. They were the first really young children I had seen for a long time and I wondered how long they had been at the facility. Our interested stares were reciprocated and we returned several enthusiastic waves. The taciturn Williams observed the reception we received. You're the first newcomers in over a month. At the last meeting, the professor said he didn't expect any more arrivals given how bad the winter was and the fact that the Chinese were overrunning the state. We got lucky, I said. We only just made it and lost a lot of good people along the way. We wouldn't have made it without Isaac. I looked at Ben and he shrugged as if to say, It's true. Well, that's not exactly right, I said. We all were a team and helped each other. If I'd been on my own, there's no way I'd be here. Williams didn't seem interested in our story. He gestured that we should go, and we all started for the rec room. Wait, he called, pulling us up. This is where the girls say goodbye, he said. The rec room is only for males. You girls have your own in the north wing. Only the cafeteria is mixed. My good mood suddenly dissipated. You're separating us? I asked. Those are the rules, he said. Male and female sleeping and living quarters are kept separate. Believe me, it avoids a lot of problems. I saw his eyes linger on indigo for a second too long and I felt a flash of protectiveness. I stepped between them. Well, rules are rules, I guess, I smiled. Where is the North Wing? He looked at me with an unreadable expression and then opened the door to the rec room for Ben and me. It's in the north, he said, putting his hand on my shoulder in a mock-friendly way. You'll be sleeping in the west wing. Don't worry, I'm sure you'll see them around. What did he mean by that? I shook off his hand and grabbed Ben, who I could see was about to protest. See you tomorrow. I said to the girls and gave Indigo and the others a thumbs up. I saw Brookmouth, it's okay, to Ben, and he relaxed as Williams led them off, but not before glancing back once with a smirk. I'll be back for you boys soon. I decided right then that I didn't like him. 25. Ben and I entered the rec room. It was a large open space with a pool table dominating one section. There was also a small area containing gym equipment and another smaller anteroom with a sofa and some chairs. It wasn't terribly crowded. There were a couple of men, soldiers based on their haircuts, using the exercise equipment and three boys playing pool with another man I took to be a soldier. We gravitated towards that group. We didn't play, but we did chat briefly to them mainly the boys who asked how we had come to arrive at the facility. The three boys had been the first to arrive about three weeks after the flu had run its course. The soldier, who introduced himself as Daniel Bowman, didn't say too much. He was concentrating on the game and didn't seem to be a part of the group. While the boys were friendly enough, we had run out of things to talk about by the time Williams returned, and Ben and I were both happy to be escorted back to our room. For whatever reason, I hadn't slept well the night before and thought it would be good to get an early night. Williams led us out into the corridor and we followed it around into the west wing, which was basically one long hallway lined with doors on either side. He stopped three doors along and swiped his card before ushering us through the door. Ben and I found ourselves in a long, rectangular room. It was basically a dormitory and, except for the fact that there were no windows, reminded me of the army barracks I had seen in movies. There were four double bunks set against one of the longer walls. Williams had told us we could use the ones closest to the door and pointed out the bathroom at the opposite end of the room before leaving. Once we were alone, I had to snoop around. Although there was no one in the room at the time, based on the toiletries and other items on the small bedside shelves, it appeared that nearly all of the other bunks were being used. I assumed it would be people like us, refugees from the flu, rather than soldiers, who I assumed would all be housed on the lower level. 
Dib's the top bunk, said Ben, shooting up the rungs of the ladder and falling back on his mattress. I smiled. It was good to see him still so carefree after the hardship of our flight to the safe haven and the strangeness of our new situation. Well, that dinner was interesting, said Ben, looking down at me. What do you think of the professor and his strange friend? Do you think they might be bum chums? Huh? I looked at him dumbly, unfamiliar with the term. You know, boyfriends, he laughed. The comment surprised me, given all that had happened and the fact that about 150 million people had been wiped off the face of the earth. Human traits like intolerance had really been put into perspective for me. I didn't give the remark any oxygen. Ben was just a teenage kid like me, and I knew that he was trying to be funny, not mean. But it felt just a bit pre-end of the world to me. What did it matter now if you were gay or straight, old or young, black, white, or orange with blue polka dots? What did it matter before? The virus didn't discriminate. I don't think so. But there is something a little off about that rag guy. I don't think it matters if he likes men or women. He looks like the kind of guy who would pull wings off bugs for fun. Yeah, he is a bit strange, he agreed. Well, it all seems very well run, though, don't you think? Curfews and disciplines and whatnot? Hmm, I guess, I said, unwilling to comment too much. I was suddenly paranoid that the room might be bugged. It was a military facility, after all. I pretty much shut down the conversation, complaining that I was tired. I didn't want us to risk saying too much in case it could compromise Sonny's situation. Of course, I didn't get to sleep for a while, and found myself replaying the conversation with the professor in my mind. A few things bothered me, niggling little worries that I couldn't quite pin down. I guess in the end it was a general feeling of uneasiness. I left it alone eventually, but made a mental note to follow up first thing about Sonny. I was not going to let that slide, and of course I wanted to see Luke as well. It was strange. After our few days of rest and recuperation, I had been glad to relax and let the mantle of leadership slip from my shoulders, to blend into the crowd and try and make a go of this new situation. Now, after our meal with the professor, I found myself again worrying and feeling responsible for the whole group. Did I want that? Maybe I should just look after number one. Let things fall as they may and let people look after themselves. After all, we were safe, warm, and fed, and that was just what we had been searching for. I decided right then that I would let it go. Decided to just accept that we were safe, that we were in our new home, and that the doubt I was feeling was just a hangover from the harrowing experiences we'd had since the invasion. Calmed by my decision to let go of the responsibility of leadership, and lulled by the soft snoring of Ben coming from above me, I finally fell asleep. I'm not sure how long I slept. It was a deep, dreamless sleep, and I woke slowly to the sound of shuffling feet and whispers. I opened my eyes. There were three strange boys standing at the foot of our bunk bed. They stopped talking when I sat up and looked at them. Hey, said one of them. The speaker had soft brown hair and a sprinkling of freckles on his face. Behind the thick glasses he wore, his eyes shone with a lively intelligence. He and the second of the boys, a wiry lad with messy hair and a big nose, looked about thirteen. The third, a big strapping boy with short black hair and pale skin, looked about my age. They were all dressed in the white t-shirts and black pants, and I wondered briefly if those clothes would start to feel like prison garb after a while. Hey, I said. I'm Isaac. I pointed to the bunk above my head. That's Ben. I'm Paul. This is Bo and Toby. I weighed them up. They all seemed like normal sort of kids, and even though the big one, Toby, was as big as a full-grown man, he didn't seem particularly threatening. I climbed off the mattress and shook hands with each of them. I noticed their hands were calloused and tough, and I asked Paul what discipline they did. We're miners. I meant to ask the professor about that. What exactly are you mining? Well, it's not mining exactly. That's just what they call it. It's tunneling. Tunneling? Yeah, we're digging a tunnel through Drake Mountain. 
The council wants a second way out in case the Chinese discover the lodge and work out we're in the mountain. Personally, I think it's just a way of keeping us worker bees all busy, because even if they find the lodge, it isn't likely they'll work out that the facility is inside the mountain. I think they might know all about the lodge now. I told them the story of our flight from Lincoln with the Chinese hot on our tails, and I was surprised at how greedily they listened to every word, guffawing and asking questions about anything that wasn't quite clear. No way, yelled Bo, when I told him that I had emptied my pistol into the chopper. That's ballsy, man. Not really, I said, secretly pleased at his endorsement. I thought I was as good as dead and was hoping to take a few of them with me. It was probably pretty stupid, actually. I finished the rest of the story and couldn't fail to notice how they all looked at each other when I told them about the intervention of the facility's soldiers. Did it happen like that for you, too? Kind of, although we didn't have an army chasing us. We were taken in by two soldiers from the facility when they were on patrol. We flagged them down, but we still ended up with guns in our faces. It was pretty freaky. You were together? Yeah, there were the three of us and my sister Ava as well. Oh, right. Where is she? Again, they looked at each other, but instead of answering, Bo asked quickly, So how many were with you all together? I left it alone, but I made a mental note to ask Paul in private about his sister. Clearly none of them wanted to discuss it, either because they were frightened or because it made them uncomfortable. Of course, I also wanted to know how they had fared since the invasion, how they had survived before being picked up and brought to the facility. I told them our story, even touching upon the ones we had lost. I was pretty tired by the end, but telling my story to kids my age seemed somehow more therapeutic than talking it out with Colonel Randall. Not sure why, but it did. So you said the council wants the tunnel. I thought the professor was in charge. The three boys looked at each other. Well, he is, really, Paul continued. But the council was formed after some of the workers demanded to have a say in running the place. I think he gave in as a way of keeping the natives from getting restless. They have no real power. Bo now gave Paul a pointed look, almost as if he thought the boy in the glasses was talking too much. While I didn't think they were keeping things from me, I got the feeling they were holding a little back, which was probably fair enough, considering they'd only just met me. I better wake Ben. He'll want to meet you, too. I couldn't believe he had slept through my whole conversation with the three boys, and for a second I was worried for him. He was dead still, just a shape under the covers and had a pillow resting over his eyes. I shook his arm vigorously and was rewarded when he sat bolt upright and yelled, Wah! I couldn't help laughing. Sorry, old chap. I have some people who want to meet you. Squinting at me in the sudden light, his blonde hair a mess, he fixed me with a stare. Did you just call me old chap? I see your knowledge of the English vernacular was learned from old black and white movies, buddy. The other boys laughed at our banter but could see that Ben was not totally amused at having his sleep disturbed. Wearing a half smile, Ben climbed down and went to the bathroom. We chatted for another hour or so after that, but it was obvious the boys were tired after a long day's work. So we went to bed without the conversation becoming any deeper than swapping a few survival stories. 26. I was lashing out at Chen, but he was too fast for me. He dodged my blows and laughed at me. The scornful sound enraged me, and while I was scared, I kept pursuing him, knowing that if I didn't kill him, he would kill me. Why didn't he strike back? We both knew he could beat me. He was bigger, stronger, faster. What was he waiting for? I ran at him with one last supreme effort to punch his hateful face. Again, he eluded me. Stand and fight! I yelled, bent over with my hands on my thighs, trying to catch my breath. He stood still, grinning at me demonically and opened his mouth to speak. Beep, beep, beep. The impossibly shrill beeping emanating from his throat terrified me, and I awoke with a start, my heart thumping hard in my chest. 
The electronic beeping ceased after the sixth beep, and I sat up, swinging my legs over the side of the bed as I tried to calm my breathing. I rubbed my eyes. I didn't feel as refreshed as I should have, probably thanks to the late-night talk with Paul and the others. I could tell by the groans above me that Ben was in the same predicament, and I felt a pang of guilt for waking him up to meet the boys. It wouldn't have hurt to leave it until morning. I got up and rushed to the bathroom as I saw our new dorm mate starting to rouse. I didn't want to line up for the jaw in the way my bladder felt. I wouldn't be able to hang on longer than a few seconds. We said our good mornings to Paul and the other two boys. Paul gave us a brief rundown on the day's schedule. When the door was unlocked, we would go to the showers and then on to breakfast before the boys headed off to the mine. He wasn't quite sure what would happen with us as we hadn't been allocated a discipline yet. At 1 p.m., there would be a 45-minute lunch period for the miners. He told us that the lunches were staggered between the disciplines from 12.15 onwards. He didn't get to tell us the rest because the door was opened by a guard we didn't recognize, and we were marched off to the showers. Guards. Curfews. Work gangs. It struck me as we followed the guard that, if anything, our safe haven was much more like a prison than a military or scientific facility, and that while a part of me understood that it might have to be that way, it left me uncomfortable and almost certain that there was another way it could be. But really, what was I complaining about? Better here than in a Chinese prison camp or cleanup gang, or dead. The showers were already heavy with steam and other bodies when we got there. I had to line up for several minutes before I took my turn. It looked like there were about 40 other boys in our shift, with only 10 shower stalls to share. Everyone dressed in clean blue coveralls that were in a pile by the door and slowly filed out as they finished dressing. Paul and I again dressed in the uniform of white t-shirt and black pants. As I put my canvas shoes back on, I noticed that everyone had the same shoes, albeit in various states of disrepair. I asked Paul why they didn't have boots. Surely they would have been better for the work he was doing. They don't have enough boots in supply, only these useless canvas sneakers. One boy's foot was crushed last week, so it pays to be real careful. We were escorted to the cafeteria where we lined up and were served a tray of sausages, scrambled eggs, and toast. I scanned the room as I walked to a table with Ben and my roommates. There were about thirty men and boys all in the blue coveralls. I assumed they were all on the mining shift. Did that mean that Ben and I would also be joining the mining crew, or was it just that we were housed with other miners for the moment? No one had told us any different yet. Breaking rocks and digging in an enclosed space didn't exactly sound inviting to me, and I hoped the professor would keep his word about letting us nominate which discipline we preferred. Breakfast looked a lot better than it tasted. It was clear that the eggs were made from the powdered eggs that the professor had mentioned, but more disappointing were the sausages. They were vegetarian sausages and had a distinct nutty flavor. Ben and I gave each other a look of distaste while the other boys wolfed them down as if it was the last supper. Paul caught our look and grinned. You'll get used to it. I don't think so, retorted Ben. Regardless, we ate everything on our plate and chatted quietly to the boys. Most of the people around us seemed focused on their plates. I avoided the subject of Paul's sister for the moment. I still wanted to ask him about that privately. It turned out that their group was from a suburb of Lincoln. After the Pyongyang flu had killed all of the adults, Bo and Toby had sought out their friend Paul and holed up with him and his sister Ava. They had been doing their best to survive. There had been no sign of the Chinese army back then, and after food in the house had run out, they had been able to forage and scavenge enough from Lincoln to keep them relatively well fed. They had seen other kids, some alone and some in groups, but Paul had thought it wise to keep their group small. As he talked, I found my respect for him growing. Unlike us, they didn't come to the facility because of the signal. One day while foraging, they had actually caught sight of one of the patrols the professor had sent out. After the initial shock of seeing adults, American soldiers to boot, they hid and observed the patrol rounding up another group of kids. Ava had wanted to flag them down straight away, but the cautious Paul had insisted they watch and wait. 
He wanted to make sure that these were friendlies and weigh up a lot of possibilities before they made contact. Of course, I could see that they were American, but that didn't necessarily mean they were friendlies. In the end, the food situation and weather had forced their hand, and they decided to turn themselves over to one of the patrols. It took nearly a week and a half for another patrol to come through, and by then, things had become quite desperate for the four kids. We were pretty much the last to be picked up by a patrol. They basically only send them out on night missions for food and supplies now. As we finished our breakfast, two men came through the door. One was John, the army guy who had brought me in, and the other wore a Homeland Security uniform. The Homeland guy blew a whistle and yelled, Grub's over. Time to get to work, ladies. Asshole. Paul whispered under his breath as they stood from the table and started filing out with everybody else. I shrugged to Ben and we both stood as John approached us, weaving his way through the crowd of blue coveralls. Hello, boys, the soldier said with a friendly smile. You're looking a little less disheveled than the last time I saw you. Thanks, I said. It was great to finally have a shower. He eyed Ben and I critically. You could both do with a haircut, though. I self-consciously ran a hand through my hair. Follow me, please. You're coming down to the bottom level for the morning. The colonel wants to interview you again. I wasn't sure if he meant interview both Ben and I, but apparently we were both going down. See you tonight, I called to Paul, as they filed to the left and we went to the right. He turned briefly and gave me a thumbs up. I liked Paul, and while I was interested in finding out whatever was going on with his sister, now that we were safe, I wanted to get back to the business of being a kid and making friends. Paul was easy to like and also seemed open to making friends outside of his group. It's strange, but before the infection, making friends hadn't been really that important to me. In fact, after my family had perished, I had actively avoided it, determined to never be close to anyone ever again. The Pyongyang flu and invasion had changed all of that. It was possibly the only positive I could draw from the whole experience, but I intended to run with it. I had seen firsthand that life was too short to waste alone. 27. Ben and I followed John back to the lobby where we had been taken to dinner with the professor. He didn't acknowledge the Homeland Guard patrolling the lobby, but nodded to the one by the elevator doors as he summoned the lift. We took the elevator down one floor, and upon exiting found ourselves in a more spartan part of the facility. No paintings or carpet here. It was all polished concrete and bare metal. As opposed to the middle or living level, I didn't see any Homeland Security personnel down here. It was all Army even though the soldiers I did see looked relaxed and weren't patrolling like the homeland guys seemed to be. We were led from the main corridor past a desk manned by an older soldier with a gray buzz cut. Boys, he nodded in a friendly way. I looked over his shoulder into a door opening onto some sort of supply room, and I could see weaponry and ammunition stacked on metal shelves. It looked to be a whole lot more than a small contingent in a scientific facility should carry, but I didn't have a chance to ask a question about it before we turned the corner and entered a long hallway. We stopped at the first door we came to. The brass plate read Colonel Randall, and I could see another door a little further along marked Situation Room. John gave the door in front of us a business-like knock. Come in. John opened the door and stood aside to let us in. Randall was seated behind a small desk, surrounded by stacks of paper. He was wearing a regular camouflage uniform and a cap and smiled warmly as we entered. Isaac, Ben, have a seat, please. From my seat, I could just make out a framed photograph on the desk. It was a woman about Randall's age and two younger women who resembled her closely. I assumed it was his wife and daughters, and I suddenly felt empathy for him. It was easy to forget sometimes that everyone in the facility had lost people they loved. I wondered briefly, but uncharitably, about Mr. Rag's family, surprised that he'd made such a negative impression on me in such a brief meeting. Thank you, John. Dismissed, John saluted the colonel and promptly departed. Okay, talk to me, said Randall. How are you lads settling in? All right, I guess, sir, said Ben. Good. 
And what about you, Isaac? Pretty good. Glad to be out of the cold and eating regularly. So are we here about the discipline we want to pick? Straight to the point, huh? I like that. Randall chuckled. Well, this is where you give me your preferences. I take them to the council and give my recommendation, so no guarantees. If you don't have a preference, you'll be slotted into the mining crew by default. What about the girls? A look I couldn't quite work out crossed Randall's face at my question, and he seemed to measure his words before he answered. The girls are under the jurisdiction of the professor and his security people. Their role will be decided independently of yours. Why? I'd like to talk to Brooke before I decide what job I take. We might like to work together, said Ben. I'm afraid that won't be possible. In the main, the females are kept separate to males here at the facility. It was one of the first things the professor decided when we went dark. Ben looked at me, then back at Randall. Kept separate? What the hell does that mean? Now, son, said Randall, holding up his hand. I don't like it any more than you, but that's what he has ordered. Honestly, I don't think it's anything to worry about. Some of the professor's methods are a bit quirky, but he does have the best interests of us all at heart. Randall didn't seem quite as convinced by his own words as he should, but I didn't press it. Ben did. How can it be good? Separating family? When will I get to see her? I immediately thought of Paul's sister Ava, and understanding dawned on me. They had been separated when they arrived in the facility. But was that why he hadn't wanted to talk about her? My impression was that it was something more serious than that, even if forced separation was serious enough. That's hard to say, son. I saw Ben's face turn crimson as he stood up and leaned over Randall's desk, his rage quite impressive to behold. Don't son me. I'm not your son. You're a, what are you, a colonel? You outrank everyone here. Just order him to let me see her. I want to know what's going on. Randall didn't answer for a moment. When he did, his voice was calm and measured. Unfortunately, I don't outrank him. He has absolute authority in this facility, and the Homeland Security Unit ensures it stays that way. You, like me and the rest of my men, must learn to live with that. It won't do your sister any good for you to end up in lockup on half rations. The women are kept separated for their own protection. As far as I can tell, they are treated well. Again, he didn't sound convinced, and it was only my confidence that Indigo could handle herself and look after the other two that allowed me to keep my own counsel and put a calming hand on Ben's shoulder. He looked at me, and I looked right back into his eyes. Sit down, Ben. We'll look into it later. Let's get this done so we can go and see Luke. Ben gave one last defiant look at the colonel before taking his seat. Okay. Good. Thank you, said Randall. I'll make this as quick and painless as possible. We don't need any more hands in the custodial or farming roles. We could always do with more miners, and I have one place left in security. I'll take security, said Ben immediately. No offense, son. Ben, but you strike me as a bit of a hothead. I need someone with an even temper and good judgment. Isaac, would you be interested? Ben suddenly looked regretful and shrugged when I looked at him. Fair enough point, he conceded. Yes, okay. By security, do you mean with Homeland or your guys? Army. The professor allowed us to augment our force so we can continue to send out scouting parties and keep a standing force here in case of trouble. So I'll be going out and scouting? No, not yet at least. You'll undergo basic training and initially you'll be in the facility only, security details and the like. I nodded. Good. You'll start tomorrow morning. I'll have John collect you from the dormitory at 0600 hours, and you can bring your gear down to the barracks. Damn. I hadn't realized it would mean being separated from Ben and also Luke when he was released from the hospital. Don't worry. You'll have plenty of downtime to visit your friends, Colonel Randall said, reading the look on my face. We have nothing down here but time. Okay. So that leaves me with mining, then. 
said Ben. Yes. Are you okay with that? Asked Randall. Don't have much choice, do I? 28. Ten minutes later, we had been brought up from the lower level and into the hospital wing. I had finally started to get some idea of the layout of the facility. If you had been looking down on it with X-ray vision, it would be shaped like a large, three-dimensional cross with three layers or levels. Top level, the one where my group was initially housed, was the science and research level where the professor and also the Homeland Security Detachment resided. The general population was housed in the mid-level, along with the hospital and the lobby. Lower level housed the army contingent, greenhouses, storehouses, and all of the machinery that kept the place operating with fresh air, water, and power. Each arm of the cross was referred to as a wing, north, south, east, and west, and of course, depending on which level one was on, I imagined each had a different function. The hospital was in the south wing, on mid-level. The soldier who escorted us, who I vaguely recognized from the night we were first brought in, waited outside in the corridor after Dr. Radisson had answered the buzzer and led us into a small office. Hello, boys. You're looking a little healthier than when I last saw you. How is Luke doing? I asked. Well, why don't you just wash your hands at the basin and I'll take you through to see for yourself. I felt a buzz of happiness. I had not been confident that we would be allowed to see Luke, even though Professor Leahy had told us it would be all right. We scrubbed our hands and Dr. Radisson opened the door. The office opened onto the same room where they had first taken the black bags off our heads. Now Luke occupied one of the beds, hooked up to an IV drip. He appeared to be sleeping peacefully. The doctor told us quietly that he would leave us alone and gave us a gentle warning not to get the patient too excited. As we stepped up to the bed, I noticed that Luke looked different, younger and more vulnerable. He had also been cleaned up. They had shaved off his scraggy beard, adding to his more youthful appearance, and his hair had been washed. It had dried into an impossibly fluffy ginger afro. Smiling, I stepped up beside the bed, and as if sensing we were present, his eyes opened, and he grinned. Who the hell are you two clean-cut dudes? What have you done with Isaac and Ben? Smiling, my eyes filled with tears, as I remembered the last time I had seen him. I had been absolutely convinced that he was going to die. I wiped my embarrassing tears away quickly and grabbed his proffered hand, leaning over gently and putting my shoulder into his. Good to see you awake, Luke, I said. You were pretty banged up. Yeah, still am from the feel of it. He winced as he tried to pull himself up in bed a little. I stepped out of the way so Ben could also get close and shake Luke's hand. Well, for a moment then, I thought the doctor had taken us to the wrong room. I didn't realize Ronald McDonald had found his way into the safe haven too. Fries, anyone? Luke laughed patted down his hair self-consciously as we pulled up chairs beside the bed. Over the next fifteen minutes, we filled him in on what had happened since we had arrived in the facility. He was also suspicious of the professor segregating the women and girls from everyone else. You know, he might be some sort of weird pervert. Maybe he wants it to be his own personal harem. A similar thought had crossed my mind, but I had dismissed it. I don't think so. He doesn't appear to be the type. It seems more like some misguided attempt to keep things on an even keel down here, maybe to avoid conflict or other issues. I could see Luke's mind ticking over. Maybe he wants them as brood mares? What? I asked blankly. Brood mares, you know, breeding stock. Maybe he sees this place as some kind of Eden you know, to start the United States over, maybe with a super race. Man, you really do read too many comics, I said, laughing. Refusing to admit his comment made me a little uneasy. He changed the subject. So what the hell happened after I handed you the RPG? I don't remember a thing. You took the chopper down, right? I shook my head. No, 
I missed it completely. No way, he yelled, then winced and settled back onto the mattress. Dude, you missed it. I looked sheepish and regretted his quick words flashed across his face. He patted my shoulder. Don't beat yourself up. It would have been a difficult shot even for an experienced soldier. Or me. No, you're right. I was our last hope and I missed. I screwed it up bad and could have got us all killed or captured. Well, we weren't killed or captured, right, Ben? Of course we weren't. Besides, we wouldn't have gotten to that point without you, Isaac. Yeah, I do seem to remember someone carrying me up the mountain, which probably saved my life, so I don't think missing the shot at the end there is that big a deal. Their words did make me feel better, kind of put things in perspective for me. I shrugged off my self-recrimination. I only half carried you, I joked. Anyway, the Drake Mountain soldiers came out of nowhere. The Chinese had no clue they were there, and it was over pretty quick after that. Damn, I wish I could have seen them kick that Chinese ass. Hey, so when do we get to see Sonny? Don't know. He should be interviewed sometime today, I hope. That's what the professor promised anyway. We should be able to see him not long after that. How long will you be cooped up in here? The doc said he'll get me up and moving tomorrow. It will only be light walking on the treadmill, but he's happy with how the wound is looking. Almost on cue, the doctor came back into the room and told us that our time was up. We said our goodbyes. Say, Doc, Luke said as we were heading out, Isaac and Ben told me that the girls have been segregated to another wing and aren't allowed to mix. What's that all about? Dr. Radisson paused and looked at us. The professor deemed it necessary to separate the females from the male population. I don't really know more than that, except that he seems to think it's better for the safety and security of all involved. He was singing the same song that everyone else was, and I couldn't help the feeling that he also wasn't letting on all he knew. I couldn't wait to talk to Paul that night. I knew I'd at least get a straight answer from him, even if he didn't know a lot. Luke looked as dissatisfied as me at the answer, but held his tongue. You concentrate on getting better. I said, pointedly. We'll keep you updated about what's happening. What now? I asked the soldier as he led us back towards the square. You have the rest of the day to yourselves. I'll take you to the rec rooms. You can play pool or pinball or whatever you want, I guess. As we walked, I wondered when I would run into the redneck Leroy again. I was sure he would be quite talkative, given that he didn't seem too bright. I couldn't believe that he'd been given a position in Homeland Security. My first impression was that he didn't seem like the kind of man who should hold any position of authority. I was curious to know what sort of discipline the mysterious Mr. Rag might have dished out and exactly what his position in the facility hierarchy was. Okay, here you are, said the soldier as we arrived in the square. Have fun. Will do. What was your name, by the way? I asked. Tony Gould. Okay, Tony, thanks. What now? Ben asked as we stood outside the quiet room. How about the rec room? I wouldn't mind a bit of a workout in the gym or maybe a game of pool. Okay, sounds good, although I'm not much of a gym junkie. You know, weights and dumbbells and all. I laughed. Dumbbells. I hadn't heard that word for a long time. And not for the first time it struck me that Ben would have been right at home in one of Enid Blyton's famous five novels. He looked a little indignant at my laughter. Sorry, it's just that no one uses the term dumbbell anymore, and it always struck me as a funny word. Maybe you can just ride the exercise bike or treadmill. You're obviously fit. We all are, given how much walking and running we've done. Appeased, he said. That sounds fine. We entered the main rec room. It was empty besides us, and we were approaching the pool table when the door opened behind us. It was Williams. The professor wants to see you now. Oh, okay, I said, and both Ben and I turned to follow him. Not you, he said to Ben. Just Isaac. Oh. Back soon, I said to Ben, 
who looked a little out of sorts at being snubbed. William set off at a brisk pace and I had to run to catch up. Is this about Sonny? Don't know. I'm sure you'll find out in a few minutes, he said, without turning to look at me. Rude prick, I thought to myself. He didn't say a word to me as we rode the elevator to the top level, and I didn't bother trying to make conversation with him either. 29. A few minutes later, he had led me into a part of the top level I hadn't seen while we were housed there. As far as I could tell, it was in the south wing, directly above the hospital on the middle level. We came to a door that was guarded by an armed homeland officer, and Williams rapped on it sharply without acknowledging the officer. Come in. Williams opened the door and put his hand on the small of my back, guiding me in before pulling the door closed. It was the professor's office. Bookcases lined the walls, and the man himself sat behind a large, impressive desk. He looked relaxed and had a welcoming smile on his face. The man standing beside him, Rag, didn't appear quite so welcoming. His intense gaze was already creeping me out a little. Young Isaac, come in, come in, please, sit. I ignored Rag and said thanks to the professor as I sat down. How was your first night on the mid-level? Uh, good, thank you, sir. Excellent. Did you have any questions? I had a ton, of course, most specifically about why the women were being segregated. For the moment, though, I didn't say anything that might cause a problem or prevent me seeing Sonny, assuming that's why I had been summoned, of course. No, sir. All righty, then. As I promised, I'm pleased to inform you that Mr. Rag and I interviewed your friend Sonny this morning and that it went very well. Would you like to see him? Yes, please. That would be great. Will he be moving to mid-level with the others now? He paused and seemed to weigh his words very carefully before answering. I got a sinking feeling. Alas, no. Not yet, anyway. He will remain on the science level with us for the time being. He stilled my protest with a raised hand. It's for his own protection, you understand. I know that you think of Sonny as an American, but unfortunately all that the general population will see is one of the enemy. I don't think it would end well if one of the rasher inhabitants got a silly notion into their head. He is an American. It's not just what I see. It's what he is, and we have rights. Can't you issue a directive letting them know he's not one of the enemy? Well, that's not quite correct, he said, the smile slowly fading. We're not Americans anymore. We're survivors, and our rights have been taken away from us by a ruthless enemy. It has fallen to me to ensure the safety of one and all in this facility, and it's not a responsibility I take lightly. Your friend will remain in custody. Protective custody, you understand, until I work out how to integrate him into the general population. Okay? I could see he was not going to be swayed and decided not to argue the point any further. Choose your battles wisely. I remember my father saying to me years ago, this wasn't a battle I could win right now. Okay, I said quietly. Professor Leahy's oily smile returned in an instant. Excellent. I'll have Mr. Rag escort you to see him now. You can visit for twenty minutes or so. Thanks, I said. Will we be able to come visit while he's locked up here? The others would like to see him too, especially Allie. I will work something out, he said, looking vaguely annoyed, probably at my choice of words. Enjoy your visit. Apparently that was conversation closed, and he turned to his computer screen without another word. It could have been my imagination, but Mr. Rag seemed to deliberately invade my personal space as he walked by me and opened the door. The compact man didn't say a word as he led me back down the corridor of the south wing. I took the chance to examine the forward-facing rag a little more closely than I had before. Beneath the fabric of his gray suit, I could see a hardness to his shoulders and torso. He wasn't overly muscled, but from what I could see, 
He was tough and toned. We took a left at what I supposed was the equivalent of the square on the floor below us. On this level, it was a large open area with sofas and tables and a sink and coffee-making facilities. Two off-duty homeland officers were playing cards and talking. They clammed up when we passed. Whether it was my presence or Rags that prompted their sudden silence, I'm not sure. For his part, Rag ignored them and took us left down the same corridor Williams had taken us on our first day. This time, instead of turning when we came to the glass wall, Rag stopped in front of it. The two guards stepped aside as Rag opened the airlock and let us through, waiting for the first door to close before opening the second. I felt the air pressure change and swallowed to unblock my ears. Why is he being kept in here? He's not contagious, you know. Rag kept walking, and for a moment I thought he wasn't going to answer me. When he did, he didn't bother looking at me. The professor thought it best, in case word leaked out that we had a, had someone who might be mistaken for the enemy here. It's the most easily defended area in the complex. Something about the explanation didn't quite ring true, but I chose not to question it. On our left we passed what I could only describe as cells. I'm sure they probably called them observation rooms or something harmless, but the square, sparsely furnished rooms with glass walls on the side facing the corridor seemed to have a dual purpose to me. The whole area, corridor and rooms included, was topped with a low glass ceiling a few feet below the actual concrete ceiling. To our right was the occasional door, and through the tiny reinforced windows I could see that they were also labs. The third and final cell contained Sonny. He was laying on a cot reading what looked like a paperback novel. He looked up when he saw me, his face creasing into a smile. The Kung Fu expert sat up, clearly happy to see a familiar face. Unfortunately, the smile only highlighted the large, fading bruise on his cheek. My own smile faded a little. I was pretty sure that bruise hadn't been inflicted when he had been zapped back at the lodge. Rag stepped up to the lock and swiped the card, pulling the door outward and allowing me through. I saw Sonny eye him, but couldn't read his expression. Twenty minutes, said Rag evenly before swinging the door closed and stepping back to stand in the middle of the corridor, staring at us through the glass. I couldn't help but feeling like a bug in a specimen jar. Sonny's eyes left Rag after a moment and looked back to me. Isaac! he said, stepping up and grabbing me in a bear hug which I returned wholeheartedly. Hey, Sonny, I said as he clapped me on the back. How are you? I'm fine, he said, and grasped my waist, leading me to his cot. We sat side by side and he nodded surreptitiously to a camera positioned in the top corner of the room. Tell me, how are the others, Ben and Brooke, Allie, Indigo? They're all fine. Worried about you, of course. How have they been treating you? I asked him earnestly. He glanced at Rag, who was still watching us, his reptilian eyes barely blinking. Well, it's been okay for the last few days. I did actually have a run-in with our friend there on the second day, but the professor called him off. He leaned in close to me and gestured to the bruise on his cheek. You need to watch that one. He's dangerous and efficient. My uneasy feeling about Rag was confirmed. I didn't know the circumstances, of course, but unless Sonny had been restrained, the fact that Rag had managed to mark his face meant that he was clearly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It wasn't his potential prowess that bothered me so much, though. It was his whole demeanor. What about you? What happened to you guys after we were brought in? Sonny asked. I spent the next ten minutes telling Sonny as much as I could remember about what had happened. He didn't say too much, but I could tell he was as bothered by the segregation of the girls as I was. It doesn't really ring true, this whole for-their-own-safety thing, he said. Unless the bulk of the male population is a pack of women-hungry rapists, I'm pretty sure that the mixing would be healthy and normal. It's not as if they lack personnel to keep things under control. I think you're right. It stinks. 
It was nice to have my point of view validated by someone I respected, and I promised that once Luke was back, we would do a little more sniffing around and try to get to the bottom of it. While a little guarded with what he said, I could see that he approved of my acceptance of the role in the military detail. It was clear he knew I could perhaps use it to my advantage down the track. I did ask Sonny what had happened since he had been separated from us, but he was unwilling to go into details. He did say that the professor had seemed reasonable to him during the questioning that morning and the few other times that he had met with him. If you can, you should keep your lines of communication open with him. Just watch it, though. I couldn't quite get a handle on a certain person's role. His eyes briefly went to Rag, and I nodded. What do you think of this whole protective custody thing? I asked. I jumped at a loud rapping on the glass behind me. Rag was holding up one hand with five fingers splayed. I turned and nodded back to Sonny. Jumpy? He asked. I guess. Good. Don't get too complacent until we have this place worked out. Okay. With those few words, Sonny had dashed my idea of letting go of my leadership role and getting back to being a kid. Somehow, I didn't mind. I had already started to feel that responsibility upon me again anyway. About being kept out of the general population for my own protection, it seems to make sense. Although if the professor has as much control over the place as I think he does, there are probably other ways it could be handled. That's what I think. I... He put a hand on my shoulder. Don't worry about it, Isaac. I'll be fine. He can't keep me up here for too much longer, surely. I'll do my best to make sure I'm so annoying he'll be glad to send me down. He smiled and stood up. Looks like time is up. We gave each other a hug, and I turned to the door as Rag swiped his card and pulled it open. Look after everyone, Sonny said, and then more quietly, any means. I will. I nodded seriously and stepped out. I raised my hand to my friend as the door swung shut with a hiss. I never saw Sonny again. The End of Book Two, On the Run, written by Scott Medbury and narrated by Adam Barr. Copyright 2018 by Anscott Publishing Proprietary Limited.